Um, ok, Tanse, bojo, buenos días a todos y todas. Uh, good morning and thank you for joining us today for the first annual graduate student-led Rethinking Latin American Studies from the South Working Group uh, Symposium. Um, please ensure that your microphone is turned off. You can keep your camera on or off, whatever you're most comfortable with. We will be recording today's symposium and pausing the recording during the opening prayer with Elder Evelyn Goodstriker, as well as during the question and answer periods and any informal uh, virtual break. The recording of the keynote address and all of the presentations will be made available on the Calgary Institute for the Humanities or CIH YouTube channel um, to engage public audiences who were not able to make it to the entirety of the symposium today. And that link will also be made available on our, our last website as well. Um, to view the program as well as our abstract book for today. I've included both of those links in the chat and I will be continuing to post them um, through in the chat throughout the, the day's event as well. Um, so my name is Chelsea Klinka uh, or Nobera Etika Idiom Limon and I've had the honor of working alongside um, fellow University of Calgary graduate students Danilo Borja and Anna Watson to organize this event entitled Latin American Knowledge Production and Mobilization. Uh, and as international scholars, uh, we, all three of us, we acknowledge how privileged and grateful we are to be living in Mokinsis, uh, colonially known as Calgary. And Mokinsis is the Blackfoot term for the confluence of the Bow and the Elbow River, um, and where our symposium is virtually situated today, as well as joined by uh, many individuals around, around the world, actually. Um, and so home to the Blackfoot Confederacy, uh, including the Siksika Pikani and Kainai nations, as well as the Sutsina nation and Stony Nakoda nation, um, comprising of the Bears, Paul Wesley and Chiniki bands, Mokinsis is also home to Métis uh, Nation of Alberta Region 3. So if you are joining us from outside of Treaty 7, I do please encourage you to um, write in the chat which traditional lands you are privileged to be on. Um, and I have Elder Goodstriker right here. Hello, Elder Goodstriker. Okay, no worries. We'll just have you on the phone again, if that's okay. Oh, okay, wonderful. I'm about to actually introduce you right now, and then um, we'll, we'll go ahead. No worries. Okay. Um, so we are very grateful to begin our symposium in a good way with Elder Evelyn Goodstriker, um, who will lead us in a prayer. And uh, Elder Goodstriker is Lakota Dakota from Standing Buffalo First Nation in Saskatchewan and Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota. Um, you can learn more about her and her journey in the program link included in the chat if you kind of scroll down to page seven of the program. Um, now, if we were having this symposium in person, uh, we would be following the cultural protocols of gifting uh, tobacco, as well as a small gift to Elder Good Striker in person. So I do so virtually now in the spirit of, um, of, of honoring her time and energy here with us today. I'm now going to pause the recording as um, Elder Good Striker leads us in a good way. Great. Um, so now we are joined by Dr. Noreen Humble, a professor of classics at the University of Calgary and acting director of the Calgary Institute for the Humanities to lead us in our welcoming remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Chelsea, and thank you for inviting me to give a few opening remarks. Uh, welcome, everyone. The Calgary Institute for the Humanities is the oldest humanities institute in Canada with a long history of civic engagement and of hosting events which bring groundbreaking scholars and scholarship into conversation with the broader community. In everything that we do, we seek to contribute to the public good by promoting the core values of the humanities. Though over the years, the CIH has informally supported many research networks, in 2015, we formalized this practice by instituting interdisciplinary working groups. These have grown in number from three in the first year to 10 currently. And the aim is to encourage faculty and graduate students from different disciplines to explore common research interests and engage in collaborative research projects. 
The researching Latin American studies from the South interdisciplinary working group is an outstanding example of what can be accomplished by such collaborations. In prioritizing providing a space for horizontal dialogue, both within academia and without, they are providing an enviable model for inclusivity and participatory action-oriented scholarship. Today's symposium, so beautifully organized by the group's dynamic and engaged graduate students, Chelsea, Danilo, and Anna, illustrates well this core principle of engaging in horizontal dialogue. Speakers today represent no less than 15 countries around the world, over half of whom bring their vision and expertise from the Caribbean and Latin America. This disciplinary and linguistic reach is broad and the topics of the talks today promise a passionate commitment to issues of social justice on many fronts. So I know we're in for a series of engaging important discussions today about Latin American knowledge production and mobilization and I'm sure you're all going to enjoy it as much as I am. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Noreen Humble. Um, we would also like to extend our deepest gratitude to Sean Lindsay of the CIH uh, as well, who has been instrumental in the logistics and planning and just supporting our working group uh, this entire year, as well as our, our last affiliates, um, Veronica Briseño Castrillon and Ricardo Barbosa, who uh, will help moderate sessions today. We also have Ecuador-based experiential educator and graphic artist Maria del Carmen, um, who will be joining us to record a graphic rendition uh, of our keynote address. And this, uh, this poster graphic will be made available on our website upon her completion. So do keep an eye out in the coming weeks for both the YouTube channel uh, recording as well as the graphic. Um, furthermore, through Conservamos por Naturaleza, the symposium has adopted a tree per presentation, so 26 trees in total, to support Peruvian families and communities in the upper Amazon forest. And these families, which do not receive much government funding, um, dedicate their lands to conservation and engage in activities uh, such as patrolling and maintaining trails, legal fees, etc. Um, so if you would like to learn more about Conservamos por Naturaleza, please see the links I'm providing in the chat right now. And that again is to say uh, thank you so much to all of the pre presenters and those involved um, today in the symposium. Uh, finally, this event would not have been made possible without our, our last working group conveners, Dr. Ben McKay, Dr. Pablo Polisar, and Dr. Gabriela Alonso Yanez, um, who will now provide the, fi the final welcoming remarks. Gabriela. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, welcome, everyone. Really excited to, to be here and to finally um, have the chance to meet everyone. This has been an event organized for a long time now, so we are really excited to have the opportunity to be with you today. Um, I really want to uh, congratulate and, and I, um, you know, congratulate and give thanks to Danilo, Anna, and Chelsea for their work, and also to acknowledge the collaboration of Veronica and Ricardo. So this is. This is a student-led, graduate student-led event, and, and I'm very impressed. We are all very impressed. So on behalf of the conveners, my collaborators in the working group, Pablo and Ben, we want to welcome you to this event and um, yeah, hope that these encourage really interesting conversations throughout today. Should I introduce the keynote speaker now, Chelsea? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, so um, I am particularly excited and honored to introduce Antheris Birthright. Dr. Antheris um, is an amazing, powerful researcher. I had the pleasure to meet her since 2016, and it's always um, exciting to have opportunities or excuses to keep collaborating with her. So I'm going to take some time to introduce her and share with you her expertise and background, professional background. 
Dr. Anthony's birthright is a research consultant and 2020 Specialty Coffee Association, RICO, which means Regarding Coffee Group, fellow. She holds a PhD in geography with experience in rural livelihood, food security, and climate change ad adaptation. Dr. Birthright research program focuses on action-oriented research where solutions are developed to reduce vulnerability, shape policy, and encourage sustainable livelihoods. Throughout her academic tenure at the University of West Indies, she has worked on various local and regional multidisciplinary projects centered on reducing risk to food security and improve livelihoods of rural communities. Anter is, is one of the recipients of the 2017 Prime Minister Youth Award for Excellence in International Achievement and currently as a national consultant, Dr. Dr. Birthright is working with the Tropical Agricultural Research and Higher Education Center, CATIE, to develop Jamaica's climate change research agenda. She's an active and productive scholar. Uh, I won't go over the long list of publications that she has out there. You can Google her and find her publications. But I do want to read a few of the titles of her work which I believe are illustrative of the kind of research committed to social justice, justice that she conducts. Liquid gold or poverty in a cup, the vulnerability of Blue Mountain and How Mountain coffee farmers in Jamaica to the effects of climate change. Double exposure and coffee farming, a case study of the vulnerability and livelihood experiences among small farmers in Frankfield, Jamaica and voices from the new food movement. So it is my pleasure to invite now Dr. Birthright to start her presentation. Uh, hi, Gabriela. Thank you so much for that introduction. <laughs> um, it's wonderful to be here. And thank you so much for inviting me to participate. Honestly, it is. Um, an honor to be among such you know, brilliant scholars um, and to share my work. So I'm very appreciative and grateful for the opportunity. Um, I'll just go ahead and share my screen at this time. Yeah. Okay, everyone seen the screen? Yes, just be sure to put it in um, presentation mode, please. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Beautiful. Okay, wonderful. Ooh. Okay, so um, let's begin. Um, my research interest, really, particularly rural studies, um, it really stems from a genuine concern to improve the lives of the vulnerable and marginalized. And I'm really a strong advocate for research that is relevant, right? And development oriented, uh, really providing the answers to problems that we're facing as societies and economies in the South. Now, I believe the role of research, um, it extends beyond the contribution of new knowledge to the scientific literature. It also is responsible for influencing um, societal change. Now, even the idea of uh, the Latin American and Caribbean region, you know, yes, both have undergone historical challenges. However, I think it's critical to explore those unique differences uh, that define the Latin American region and the island states of the Caribbean region, right? So the knowledge and experiences gained separately uh, from these areas should then foster collaboration and partnership to be leveraged for development. Now, for the Caribbean, um, small econ economies within this region, they really bear the debilitating remnants of past colonial rule and the deep-seated scars of prescribed economic reforms and restructuring, well, restructuring programs. Now, these experiences have further um, been compounded by the small size of our island states, 
and their susceptibility to natural disasters, you know, further retarding, uh, you know, development. So basically these natural disasters and economic shocks, um, small island states and Caribbean economies, they've basically been held hostage and further crippling, you know, rural livelihoods and hindering economic growth. Now, even though Jamaica is classified by the World Bank as an upper middle income country, you know, it still continues to struggle due to low growth and exposure to external shocks. Now, the majority of my work um, and experience, um, as Gabriela noted in the introduction, is really focused on rural livelihoods, uh, specifically examining the realities of smallholder coffee farming livelihoods within the area of global change. Now, when I had just started, um, I realized that there was a narrow focus on coffee farming livelihoods and landscapes in the region of Latin America, Asia, and the African continent. And of course, this was somewhat understandable um, as Jamaica produces only 0.1% of the world's coffee, right? So we know the current top producers, Brazil, Vietnam, Colombia, all of that, right? Uh, we also know that there is an unequal trading environment where transnational corporations, whether, you know, roasters, retailers, traders um, in consuming countries, they have become so dominant that they possess major bargaining power at the expense of developing producer nations. Um, however, it, is, it was very important to examine the coffee sector within the Jamaican context. All right, so it was important to understand the operation of the specialty coffee industry and its challenges, um, especially within a post-colonial era shaped by unequal neoliberal capitalist system and climate change. And we find that the sector, the Jamaican sec coffee sector and economy um, as a whole really succumbed to neoliberal policies, which resulted in declining support to coffee landscapes and livelihoods. The socioeconomic impact of this was felt by the majority of smallholder farmers as throughout the process of deregulation, divestment, and privatization, key support services and resources were removed or had become greatly constrained. Now, smallholder coffee farmers, basically they are now resigned to navigating the challenges and pressures of a deregulated and privatized industry on their own. So because in essence, the political economic ideology of neoliberalism, right? It really celebrates individual freedom and responsibility with regards to, you know, whether persons succeed or they fail within the global marketplace. And also, you know, market mechanisms, they are given a pedestal role where markets are epitomized as the ideal social structures which require no interventions due to their ability to self-regulate. So they're really markets, they're considered, you know, as a solution to development and economic problems. But as this ideology dominated the fragile economy within developing nations, it contributed to the widening of inequality within and between countries you know, promulgating uneven distribution of wealth and power, as well as deteriorating socioeconomic conditions. So currently, the island's coffee industry is shaped by a small cluster of private enterprises, which control the majority of the export markets for Jamaican coffee. Now, the state's role has been reduced to acts of bailouts and had up interventions whenever crises occur, you know, such as during the 2008 recession, you know, when we have hurricane impacts, drought conditions, um, pest and disease outbreaks, that's when, um, you know, the state might intervene. 
Now, <clears throat> from a climate perspective, right, there are farmers, coffee farmers, really battling, you know, changes in seasonal patterns, um, intense hurricanes, intense temperatures or increasing temperatures, um, variable rainfall, drought conditions, changes in crop calendar, um, outbreaks of the coffee leaf that I've mentioned before, um, outbreaks of the coffee berry borer, decreased yield. So it is a myriad of um, challenges and issues from a climate perspective, you know, that's affecting our local coffee farmers. And really I was surprised to even find that even though Jamaica caters to the niche market of specialty coffee, you know, the industry and the livelihoods that operate in that space, um, they face similar challenges to regions that produce commodity coffee, right? So coffee producing landscapes in Latin America have um, experienced a weakening of support services for farmers, you know, unemployment, seasonal hunger, and so on. Now, originally it was presumed that deregulation and a free operating market would improve prices for small coffee farmers and other actors throughout the global um, coffee value chain, as well as improve the overall performance of the industry. Right. However, significant imbalances have occurred uh, at the expense of the livelihoods of millions of coffee growers and workers, really sentencing many into poverty, you know, including the widening of income inequalities and the loss of permanent and seasonal employment. Now there's something we find called the coffee, the specialized coffee paradox, um, which is something that I just kind of came up with that title. Um, one would think that being a part of the specialty coffee market, you know, farmers, <clears throat> sorry, farmers would be somewhat sheltered, you know, within such a high value niche market compared to the commodity market, right? But even though comparatively, Jamaica's coffee farmers receive higher prices for their coffee, and they operate in a risky environment of, of being highly susceptible to natural disasters, um, expensive farm inputs, high capital investment, and high um, <clears throat> maintenance costs, and as well as the absence of risk alleviating schemes, right? So when we take into consideration um, the climatic and socioeconomic challenge, the farm gate prices for Jamaica's specialty coffee farmers are indeed considered low. So we can say that farmers, um, our coffee farmers, they're producing a luxury crop but have not been experiencing luxury livelihood, right? So higher prices are really seldom reflected in the incomes of smallholder farmers within the coffee value chain. <clears throat> Now, another part in understanding farmers' uh, reality really was to examine their relation to other industry actors, right? Which includes power dynamics. Uh, understanding the power relations is crucial as it often determines whose framing takes precedence, you know, thereby affecting the positionality of actors and whether their voices are heard or silenced. Now, for example, the state regulatory authority, it exercises power in the area of quality control, um, industrial regulation and brand protection. While coffee, I'm sorry, those are my dogs in here. <laughs> um, while, yes, where was I? Mm -hmm. um, while they, so they, they in charge of brand protection, um, you know, industrial regulation, while the coffee processors, right, within the private sector, um, have power to control the commercial activities within the industry. Uh, the power of coffee processors also, where their position, or through their position of capital, um, market knowledge and 
their capacity to extend their reach into value added production, they also can determine the fortune of smallholder coffee farmers, right? So within this system, um, you find that smallholder specialty coffee farmers, they remain subordinated to these larger capitalist enterprises. Um, likewise, their dependence on these enterprises is further fueled by the eroding role of the state uh, within the industry. Now, we see some quotes on the screen here. Um, according to one coffee farmer, he's a Blue Mountain organic coffee farmer, where she says, the coffee processor is the one who has the control and it is structured that way. And uh, there are so many do not bullied upon the small farmer. And we also find that there are also invisible forms of power, right? Where it is discovered through an internalization of powerlessness. Uh, so oftentimes farmers are forced to accept the conditions offered to them, leaving them with little power to negotiate. According to a, another Blue Mountain farmer, coffee farmer, where he says they, meaning the regulator, you know, those who operate in the private sector, they hold the handle while we small farmers hold the blade. So we can't resist too much because we have no control. But I found that even with this feeling of powerlessness, the industry is a microcosm of not only how agency is operationalized, but also how it may be perceived as a form of resistance, right? While resistance in the countryside may be narrowed to violent struggle or revolt, there are also subtler everyday, everyday forms of resistance. Um, for example, farmers, um, farmers' adoption of various climate change um, adaptation strategies, right? Uh, is not only the operation of their agency, but also the implementation of everyday forms of resistance against instituted rules and norms. And even though this means, this means of resistance have been autonomously executed at the local scale, it also influences national scale operations. So for example, one of these adaptive responses or forms of resistance um, is farmers increased use of more robust coffee varieties. And you know, that might sound a bit ironic, like what, what would be the contention with farmers using more robust coffee varieties? And that really brings us to that really brings us to the politics of adaptation, right? Um, generally the island's coffee farmers and you know, the industry as a whole have always been dependent on consistent and predictable climatic conditions, especially for the cultivation of Arabica typical coffee variety. Now this has allowed the industry and its stakeholders to really maintain a level of security within the specialty coffee market. Um, however, changing climatic conditions have impacted the ability of smallholder farmers to maintain this variety of the Arabica typical. So farmers have now had a growing preference for more robust coffee varieties where, you know, they are more drought tolerant and disease resistant. And considering the various production costs required to maintain the Arabica typical, you know, costs which have been further compounded by its susceptibility to climate um, change, some farmers have turned to these more robust coffee varieties, which are resistant to the coffee leaf rust and they still have a high productivity, you know, even, has, even as temperatures increase or become warmer. However, industry stakeholders you know, such as local private coffee processors and the state regulator, they have acknowledged the market's preference for the Arabica typical variety, regardless if it's comparatively more susceptible to the coffee leaf rust and difficult to maintain. 
right? So this coffee variety, we find that this coffee variety, which secures the market for large capitalists and the state, it has become an insecurity for the livelihoods of smallholder farmers. And you have a couple quotes on screen here where um, a coffee processor said, you know, farmers have a preference for the geisha variety since it is more resistant and more productive. This preference goes against the ideology of the CIB and the CIB is the coffee industry board, which does the regulate, is basically oversees the industry. They have now renamed to JACA. Jamaica Agricultural Commodity Regulatory Authority, right? Another coffee processor said, um, some processors believe that the geisha has a different taste profile and regardless of it being resistant, farmers should shy away from planting this variety. A, co a cooperative manager, um, which I had interviewed mentioned, varieties such as the geisha can withstand the coffee leaf rust. However, farmers are not encouraged to plant these because the market doesn't desire these varieties. They, the farmers, can't model the market with non-Arabica typical varieties, yet no assistance is given with managing the coffee leaf rust impacted typical variety. So those are just some of the views um, from actors within the coffee industry. So this really sheds light on how politics and power are embedded within the deployment of adaptive responses. You know, we also see where uh, the politics of adaptation is displayed, where there is tension surrounding whose framing of adaptive response is preferred. Right, so research for development. Right, so we know that um, livelihood assets and strategies and outcomes, uh, they continue to either be enabled or inhibited by broader structural forces and unequal social relations, you know, thus hindering progress. But after the research, you know, there's a question of what, what's next and generating research for development um, I, believe, I believe offers a holistic approach to providing solutions uh, to the complexities of societal problems, especially since the propagation of neoliberal thinking continues to inform local, regional, um, and national strategies that promote unjust outcomes. Now, for example, when we even consider the commodification of nature by the neoliberal capitalist economy, right? It has given rise to the production and reproduction of ecological crises. Um, the prioritization of profit, often at the expense of environmental degradation, has resulted in ecological crises such as climate change, you know, pollution of water resources uh, from toxic waste a species extinction through loss of habitats and so on. So this influence of the neoliberal, the neoliberal capitalist economy on society, and societal organization not only generates um, exploitive relationships, uneven incomes and poor relations, but also nurtures environmental injustices. So in trying to tackle common problems facing territories within the Latin American region, within the Caribbean region, you know, neoliberal policies and programs have frequently marketed the build resilience slogan. And I'm sure a lot of persons have heard that, the build resilience, we need to build resilience, right? To encourage um, self-empowerment and self-sustenance um, and all of that. But there is still the maintenance of the broader um, structures and systems that reinforces the status quo, right? So of course, um, as mentioned before, the notion of agency is, um, it plays an important role in negotiating insecurity, which is often articulated through creativity and ingenuity and all of that. However, 
it is important to, to acknowledge that even though individuals are encouraged to become resilient and capable of taking responsibility for their own survival, you know, it is impossible to build resilience without first addressing and transforming, you know, the fundamental social and political economic construct and po um, power relations which govern vulnerable spaces and livelihoods. Because in remaining untransformed, um, you know, latent features may continuously perpetuate structural and systemic vulnerabilities, which in effect hinder meaningful change. So there is a need for transdisciplinary research to disrupt the status quo, right? And for it to be translated into, the, into a development agenda to effectively engender change and empower the marginalized. Now, I'll just share some example of um, transdisciplinary projects that I've been on and share my experience. Um, for example, there was a, a coffee leafers project that I was on where um, it came about because of you know, the challenges that farmers were facing with the coffee leaf rust, the outbreak of coffee leaf, leaf rust. And it was transdisciplinary um, as it involved a broad range of actors, you know, from the grassroots level to academia, to the regulatory level. It was also both research-based and application-based, right? So it led to the implementation of a climate forecasting system to better prepare farmers for coffee leaf rust infestation, um, such as adjusting their agricultural practices to reduce the impact of the disease, right? But looking at the industry on a broader scale, the systems and structures which continue to make farmers vulnerable, you know, they're still in place, even with this project, because when you're asking project um, farmers to prepare, you know, for coffee leaf rust disease or outbreak, they still have to deal with um, the high prices of farm inputs, the high prices of chemicals and fertilizers, you know, the lack of consistent support within the industry, you know, even with, even with this project. Um, but the project also highlighted how important it was to recognize the nuances um, around how data is collected, right, for the research process. Uh, usually on these projects, the re researchers or consultants from the North um, who would carry out projects in other countries within the global South. And we know that not every developing country operates the same, right? So it is important to understand that, you know, understand the culture of the area. Um, you know, if a particular research method is used within a particular area, it may not be applicable to another area. So definitely um, having that cultural competence and respect um, is important, uh, which is why it is so crucial to have the involvement of a wide range of actors throughout um, the research process. Uh, another project I would um, like to highlight is another example of operationalizing research was the Irrigation Farmer Field School project, uh, which was funded by the Barilla Center for Food and Nutrition. Um, this was also research and application based and involved researchers, farmers, the state agency and political representatives within the communities. And it's really about integrating local traditional knowledge with technical know-how and low-cost uh, technologies to increase farmers' adaptive capacity in localities susceptible to decreasing water availability and extreme drought events. Now, the use of local knowledge is integral, right? With the impact of climate change on the rural landscape, um, it is important to capture the indigenous knowledge of farmers. And even though, of course, you must, you know, understand that their participation is necessary, 
you know, not just to capture their knowledge, because oftentimes research, you know, extracts without replenishing. For example, research is done within an area, the data and information, you know, are siphoned and the community is left, you know, to offer their knowledge once again to another researcher. Um, and then it's a cycle that constantly repeats. So that's something to move away from, right? So that is why um, the involvement of actors at various levels is important. And even integrating that knowledge where appropriate in the blueprint of adaptation strategies, especially since local knowledge varies spatially, uh, where different actors such as, um, you know, cultural factors such as cultural conditions um, determine the type of knowledge and that is presented and practiced in various farming communities. Now, local knowledge has been instrumental in the adaptation of many water stress farming communities. Uh, for example, farmers in Southern St. Elizabeth who contribute significantly to you know, the domestic food market in Jamaica are uh, producing short-term fruit crops such as fruit and vegetable crops, such as melon, tomatoes, sweet peppers, carrots, cucumbers, all of that. Um, these farmers have somewhat adjusted to the area's characteristically drier conditions, right? Through the use of um, a certain type of grass as mulch for their crops, uh, where the mulch is placed on the root of crops and also you know, permanently covers any exposed soil on the farm. You know, thus increasing soil moisture retention while reducing erosion. However, you know, even with this knowledge, local knowledge, um, the new challenges associated with climate change and variability, it really signals a call to mobilize scientific knowledge throughout rural agricultural communities. Um, the complementarity of local knowledge with scientific um, know-how has been widely supported as a significant measure to effectively adapt to climate change. Um, it, open, it opens avenues to explore novel approaches which have been practiced by farmers over the years. And really the combined achievements of local and scientific knowledge are greater when they um, you know, operate together than operate in silos. However, you know, as an obstacle, which I find in knowledge transfer is literacy and language exchange, right? It is often difficult to translate the terminologies uh, used in the climate change discourse. And if left un unaltered, uh, the terminologies and concepts of climate change discussion can leave local communities and certain groups within societies such as the rural poor and ethnic minorities barred from a full understanding of you know, the knowledge being shared. So to ensure effective knowledge transfer, information should preferably be translated in the dialect of the recipient. Uh, so to avoid defeating the adaptation agenda, and really alienating the most vulnerable. And, you know, contextualizing the language used is critical for knowledge transfer and the sharing process. So for this research project, project the Irrigation Farmer Feed School Project, you know, the participa participatory approach, you know, in assisting farmers really to become expert decision makers on how to analyze and improve their production systems and be a part of their own solution through the contribution of their knowledge, right? Um, and expertise in the field. So it's really about collectively engaging multi-level actors that will act as an engine of change to transform, um, empower and strengthen the resilience of these smallholders and build their adaptive capacity to safeguard their resources. Now we realize that due to the involvement of actors uh, with power, 
right, such as the state agency, um, the state agency, which is RADA, they were actually able to continue the work, you know, through larger funding investments by the FAO. Um, so really this research, which was implemented by myself and another colleague, um, you know, as two women researchers, it was a small project, but it has really spurred across the island and has been sustainable, you know, meaning that the knowledge and the capacity built did not end with our involvement or the involvement of the initial beneficiaries. So another aspect of operationalizing research is to ensure, uh, you know, its sustainability. And of course, this requires, you know, that appropriate financing mechanisms are in place to achieve this. And that's one of the challenges that often um, hinders the sustainability and the mobilization and the transfer of knowledge and technology. Um, there must be decisive financial investments, you know, targeting research for development. Because with research and development, oftentimes investments are made in the development part uh, without the research aspect or we may copy and paste, you know, from somewhere without taking into account the local context. Uh, so even with our coffee industry, there has been a lack of uh, research or empirical data, you know, even on the women who operate within that landscape. Um, knowledge on the role of women and their unique challenges in participating in the coffee chain has been limited. And it has been acknowledged that, you know, women perform the majority of the work on coffee farms where they have been especially integral in carrying out activities that directly impact quality and yield. Um, yet their contribution to the operation and the economics and the function of the coffee chain has gone largely unnoticed. Um, according to UNDP 2019 Human uh, Development Report, coffee growing countries possess gender gaps, which are among the greatest in the world. And in Jamaica, the coffee industry, it is a male dominated industry. And that's why JAWIC, Jamaica Women in Coffee, it's about recognizing the contribution of women in the industry and really using our collective strengths and evidence-based research to disrupt the status quo. So we are back again at disrupting the status quo and to catalyze um, positive change within the coffee industry. And for JAWIC, you know, it's also about providing a foundation of that evidence-based research to allow us to pursue appropriate um, and practical solutions to address the pressing issues or um, you know, concerns facing our women in coffee. So in um, wrapping up and summarizing, we find um, four major takeaways that I would say uh, for this, from this presentation, um, research must be action oriented uh, to make an impact, uh, especially considering that livelihoods are positioned within the global neoliberal capitalist system, which is often rife with you know, competition, crises, unequal social relations, and asymmetrical power structures. Two, um, the integration of local knowledge, uh, perspectives, and experiences into research and development plans. Um, these are very integral and very critical. Three, Research must be transdisciplinary to also make an impact. And four, effective financing mechanisms must be in place for the impact to be equitable and sustainable. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for your attention. Um, I hope I touched on a little bit of, um, you know, the various concepts and topics that will shape uh, this symposium going forward. Uh, thank you so much.
Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Birthright. Um, it was extremely riveting learning more about the challenges faced and resistance dynamics of small scale, small scale yeah. coffee uh, producers in, in the specialty coffee paradox. Yeah. Um, so again, here's your uh, certificate for participation and the tree that you have adopted. Um, now I'll pause the recording and open up for any questions. Um, and I invite you please to- Now, so welcome everybody. Um, my name is Ben McKay and I'm an assistant professor of development and sustainability um, at the University of Calgary. And I'll be moderating this, this, uh, moderating this first panel. Um, uh, of the day on a very important theme, particularly in Latin America, on extractivism and development. So this panel features uh, five speakers. Uh, the, we'll go in order, that's the order that's in the abstract booklet and on the program, sorry. Um, starting with Pedro Alarcón from Flaxo, Ecuador, followed by Paul Cisneros from El Instituto de Altos Estudios Nacionales in Ecuador, um, Carolina Godoy from the Technical University of Munich, Anna uh, Heikinen from the University of Helsinki, and finally Quincy, Quincy Stemmler from La Pontificia Universidad Católica de Peru and the University of Gießen in Germany. So each speaker will have a maximum of 10 minutes. And after all the presentations are completed, we will then open for questions and comments. And as you can see from the program, we do have a jam-packed day, um, many exciting speakers to get through and presentations. So we will be very, very strict with the time. Um, I will be giving each speaker a three minute warning followed by a one minute warning. And accept my, please do accept my apologies in advance, but Microsoft microphones will be muted um, at the 10 minute mark so we can stay on schedule. And for the audience, please uh, feel free to use the chat for any questions or comments throughout the entire session. And we'll try to discuss most, if not all of those questions and comments at the very end of the session. Okay, so um, I don't have much of an introduction left to give and I think we'll just jump right into um, the, the panels. Um, to, to take advantage of our time. So I'll hand it over to you, Pedro, to start off. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Ben. Good afternoon there in Ecuador and Peru, and good evening there in Germany and Finland. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, straight away, there is a connection, or some might say a disconnection between natural resource abundance and development in the global south. The picture you see corresponds to a report of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. The countries in color are categorized as commodity dependent. That is countries that have more than the threshold of 60% of natural resources in their exports. Most of the countries in color are in the global south. All South American countries, with the exception of the French Guiana, are color. Several Central American countries are color too. So the problem of extractivism and development is more valid than ever. And might be included in a bigger and older academic debate, namely, natural resource abundance is a blessing or a curse. In other words, does natural resource abundance trigger or hinder development in the global south? What I would like to do in this symposium is trying to understand this problem from a Latin American perspective. Therefore, I propose first a historical structural approach. A historical structural approach focuses not only on the internal circumstance of individual Latin American states, but also on the ongoing stages of global capitalism they are facing. Historically, 
natural resource dependence linked Latin American countries to a certain position in the hierarchy of the international division of labor. In this regard, Fernando Coronil in his classic, The Magical State, argued that since natural resources provide the material foundation of the international division of labor, it might be spoken of an international division of nature. Following this logic, Latin American states traditionally understood the concept of development as an imperative to break dependence on natural resources. Oh, sorry. The second component of this proposed Latin American perspective, I argue, is a political ecology approach. As in political economy, political ecology focuses on the interactions between the local and the global. A central debate in contemporary political ecology links development or underdevelopment with natural resources. Another contribution of contemporary political ecology is the understanding that discourse is prior to reality and hence nature is discursively produced. At a local level, a Latin American approach implies addressing the role of the state in the appropriation and further allocation of natural resources rent. At a global level, it implies addressing the state's embracement or appropriation of different environmental discourses. So the problem of extractivism and development, or the problem if natural resources abundance is a blessing or a curse in the global south, might be reformulated as follows. How is locally constructed nature holding sway in the understanding of development in natural resources rich peripheral states? I try to address this question in my dissertation on Ecuadorian recent economic history. By the way, my dissertation was published in January in Germany. You can see there the cover page of the book. But why Ecuador? Or why is Ecuador relevant for Latin American studies or even global South studies? First, Ecuador traditionally mirrored processes of insertion of the global South into capitalism through natural resources. Second, Ecuador displayed representative regional socio-political processes during the last half century, such as Latin American desarrollismo and Latin American populism. Third, during its ongoing oil era, which began in 1972, Ecuador attests to an evolution of the meanings of nature and development. In my study, I found three well-defined periods of time with characteristic developmental discourses and prevalent meanings of nature. The first Ecuadorian oil boom began with a massive oil extraction from the Ecuadorian Amazonia and benefited from the incredible upsurge in international oil prices triggered by the global oil shocks of the 1970s. During that period, the dominant developmental discourse was industrialization to break dependence on natural resources, specifically import substitution industrialization. Thereby, nature or the environmental factor was totally absent of the discussions on development. Nature was regarded rather as natural resources rent to be captured by the national state in order to serve the national modernization project. The next period is shaped by the height of the enforcement of neoliberal policies. During the Washington consensus, as Latin American states drew back from economic planning, multilateral organizations such as the 
World Trade Organization and the United Nations gained momentum. The environmental discourse of sustainable development became the dominant developmental discourse and put forward the oxymoron of environmental management, which consists in natural resource extractivism and environmental protection. Pedro, you have about three minutes left, okay? Thank you. During the second Ecuadorian oil boom, despite the influential socio-ecological dimension of Buen Vivir, which is founded on the imperative of a harmonious relationship between society and nature of, or Pachamama, the preferred developmental strategy was Latin American neostructivism. In a nutshell, neostructivism displays first the changes regarding the scale and intensity of natural resources extraction and second, a modification of the state's role in natural resource governance. The end, what comes next? The end of the 21st century commodities boom opens the gaze for further discussion. Arcel, Hogebon, and Pellegrini have argued that the extractive imperative needs to continue and expand regardless of prevailing circumstances. Thereby, we can anticipate the continuation of the semiotic struggle between antagonistic meanings of nature. Then, constructed development will highly depend on the prevalent view of nature. I jump then to the conclusions because of the time. It is necessary to revisit Latin American contributions to development thinking, particularly those those contributions to dependency theory and world system theory. Different, even antagonistic meanings of nature increasingly hold sway in the construction of the concept of development itself. But this, despite the discursive embracement of indigenous or post neoliberal alternatives, the role of the Latin American national states in the process of development has been functional to the ongoing stages of capitalism. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Pedro, for uh, sticking with the time. And uh, it looks like a some very interesting work you've done. I hope we can um, are able to download your your thesis. Is it is it published in in what language is it published in? It is in English, and uh, there are still some free copies. Uh, I can uh, copy the, uh, the link in the chat yeah, right now. Great. Yeah, thank you very much. OK, um, we will move on to our next speaker, uh, Paul Cisneros. Um, Paul, can you, can, are you able to share your screen if you need to? Or? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Just let me know when, when it's on, please. Can you see it now? Yes, we can. All right. Great. So right. we will, again, uh, jump right into this. And you have uh, 10 minutes. So go ahead. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And thank you for everyone who organized this symposium. It's really great to be able to share some ongoing research with you. Uh, actually, this is a very early stage of a project that I'm working on and intended to be a manuscript on pretty much the same title you're looking at right now, Mining Conflicts and Policy Integration in Latin America. And the main question is, do things get better after high courts get involved? Um, I'm working right now based in Ecuador where I'm an um, associate professor at the Instituto de Altos Estudios Nacionales. I teach public policy and that's the angle from which I will be speaking today. Um, okay, so um, the presentation outline is this. We'll touch very briefly on uh, some issues of democratization, judicial politics, uh, to later go on to speaking about mining conflicts and policy integration. I will present two of the cases I'm working on and some preliminary takeaways. So as, um, as you all know, uh, with the third wave of democratization in the, in the region, some institutional changes were introduced towards um, securing the protection of rights of people, different types of rights, environmental rights, collective rights, and so on. Uh, but these systemic ch changes have not stopped. Actually, we have 
some continuation in the current process of elaborating a new constitution in Chile and also talks about a new constitution in Peru um, and other countries as well. So it's still an ongoing process of change. Uh, and it is, I think, time to, to ask some questions about what the contribution of, these, of this new paradigm or, or approach um, has done for democracy, what the contribution has been for democracy. Um, and particularly, uh, the judiciary has, during this transition, enjoyed some increase in the number of protections the judges have from political intervention and also their autonomy has been greatly increased. Uh, judges have more tools to intervene policy making and that's basically the main, the main issue that I'm studying. Um, how do they intervene policy making into what outcomes? Some people, as you see in this cartoon, think that uh, greater judicial intervention is a good thing, while others think it's not such a good thing. But I guess it also depends on, on which side you agree with, as the cartoon says. Um, judicial intervention, especially constitutional reviews, have increased in the, in the region in the past 20 years. And um, these have been used by activists across many different policy sectors to advance their agendas or their campaigns in certain issues, in particular related to conflicts, um, conflict related uh, to natural resource extraction. Um, so there is a, an increasing number of policy disputes about, about mining and they entail a policy integration aspect. And so what is policy integration? Basically is the creation of new objectives or structures that bring together different sectors towards a common end. So usually in a mining conflict, we have the mining sector from which the regulations on mining companies should come or uh, in some cases are actually present. We also have uh, the environmental sector, which is supposed to regulate the mining practices, but sometimes that doesn't happen. And we usually also have some form of social participation regulations uh, in this mix. And these all three converge um, with more or less intensity in different countries and in different conflicts. The idea of policy integration is to bring these three, uh, at least these three sectors together in, in a more productive way, right? So constitutional reviews often, after mining conflicts, often mandate different forms of policy integration. And these mandates have to be adopted by the government agencies, usually at different um, levels of government and also throughout different sectors and with different timeframes. So the main question is what is actually happening after uh, these constitutional reviews take place? As I said, um, some of the questions I'm working on are what are the means by which this integration is promoted by, by judges? Uh, in other words, what are the policy designs they have in mind when they decide to bring together different sectors to, to manage environmental conflicts? Um, is policy integration being achieved in these in this conflicts? What are the consequences for, for existing policy disputes? Is anything really changing with these interventions or not? Uh, and the two later questions we'll, we will probably not touch upon very much today, but uh, those are what factors make mandates for policy integration work? Um, and I'm doing this because in, in my university, we work with public servants, including judges, uh, or a lot of individuals working in the judiciary branch. And um, there is this idea that constitutional reviews are contributing greatly to the democratization of society, but we actually don't have any data on this. Uh, so um, a lot of my students are um, related to problems um, that touch upon environmental conflicts. So I think uh, it, it will probably serve as a, as a way to expand the, the collective knowledge we have about this issue by doing this research. Uh, today, I will be only speaking about two, two cases from Colombia, actually. Uh, those two cases uh, occurred a few years ago. The first one is related to this um, US-based company, Drummond, uh, where the constitutional court mandated the government to elaborate a new uh, air and water quality policy after the company was sued by individuals from a community in the in the Caribbean coast because of their crops being um, effect, adversely affected by the extraction of coal in the region where they live and also their health uh, being affected by, by these operations. 
The second case relates to the, um, a court case started by a group of um, political activists who sued the law that approved the development plan of 2014 in which the government basically introduced um, a mandate for the local governments to not uh, create areas where uh, mining would be excluded. So the government was trying to actually um, stop the local governments, especially departments and municipalities from creating air, new protected areas um, that would make mining more difficult to advance in their jurisdictions. So what happened in the last three and a half minutes that I have, I'm not necessarily comparing these two cases because the structure is very different. The, the object of the conflict itself is very different. So uh, I don't think a comparison per se is warranted in this case, but I think we can learn some things from this. Um, and as I said, though, this is a very early stage of my project where I'm basically trying to do a very in-depth, uh, take, take a very in-depth look on the cases. Um, so, um, in both, in both cases, the Drummond and the, and the protection of Paramos, which basically ended up being the, uh, the way this, this second conflict was talked about by most of the actors. Um, in both cases, the integration outputs didn't exist. What does that mean? That means that um, there was no new institutions created after the courts intervened in both conflicts. Basically, the courts mandated some, some actions to be taken by different actors but uh, basically the same agencies in charge of certain responsibilities remained with those responsibilities. Nothing was reshuffled um, or, or changed basically in the institutional aspect of the conflict. Then uh, there were some positive integration outcomes in the Paramos conflict um, or the development plan conflict where um, different levels of government had to collaborate, although not very willingly, in a methodology to delimitate the paramos, to be able to protect them from mining operations. So this is still a process that's going on. That's why it's positive and negative because um, although there is some cooperation between different levels of governments and different sectors, uh, param the delimitation of paramos is still um, something that has not been reached. So the exclusion of mining from Paramos is still uh, a desire by the communities, but not really an, uh, a reality. Uh, the, third, the third characteristic of these conflicts is that um, in the first one, the courts designed a follow-up mechanism, uh, but the follow-up was supposed to be done by the comptroller's office and the ombudsman office. This really, um, didn't happen very consistently in the first case. The controller's office uh, did write a report on how the court's decision had not been upheld by the, by the parties involved, uh, but that was done maybe a year or two years after the, the court intervened, and that was in 2013, but, uh, and so far nothing else has happened. And lastly, uh, one thing that we see is that the, the structure of the conflicts here is very different. In the first case, there's local communities affected directly by the mining company uh, taking action within the constitutional, the constitutional court. In the second case, it's local governments and political activists taking uh, actions with the support of the constitutional court. In the first case, um, nothing really has changed in the past in the past nine to ten years but in the second case it has and i argue that the reason why it has happened is because those actors were more powerful and had more access to different venues of decision making and uh, were uh, able to exert more pressure so one of my conclusions that i will share with you is that although the most vulnerable have more more access to tools uh, or have more tools at their disposal to challenge mining projects actually those tools are failing to revert power differentials in their, in their jurisdiction. So the outcome of the conflict is still the same. I will leave it at, at that and thank you very much for your attention. Great, Pao, thank you for sticking with the time there and I'm sure we can come back uh, to that discussion in, in the question and answer period and, and all the best with this ongoing research. Um, so now we'll jump into the next presentation by, uh, Carolina Godoy. Yeah, hi. hi. I am trying to share my screen, but I don't know if it's success, successes. 
I don't know. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes. And if you'd like to put it in presentation mode. Um, yeah, of course, I can do it. OK, yeah. OK. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. So my name is Carolina Godoy. I am Ecuadorian. I am uh, working at the Chair of Renewable and Sustainable Energy Systems at the Technical University of Munich here in Germany. And today I am going to share with you part of my work, which I call the Ecuadorian Power Sector Planning from a Multi-Criteria Analysis. So to starting, I would like to say, what is energy modeling? Well, energy modeling in simple words is just the process to building computer models of the energy systems uh, in order to analyze. Such models employ different scenarios to investigate the um, different assumptions in the technical and economical way. And at the very end, the purpose of this model is optimize a system by cost or by CO2 emissions. Okay, so this classical or this common way that the energy modeling is doing uh, has affected or support destructivism, at least in our region. And it happens because it's cheaper to invest in fossil fuels in order to uh, generate electricity instead of invest in nuclear technologies. And we all know which are the problems of extractivism in our region, right? So in order to avoid that, our project uh, uh, is looking to introduce two strong concepts into the energy model, energy governance and energy democracy. So energy governance to establish functional relations between different actors, which actors, the state, the civil society, and the private sector. In the whole process to decide, execute, and evaluate decisions in the energy field. So this concept link with energy democracy to call for unjustified integrations of policies linking social justice and economic equity with renewable energy transition. But how am I, am I going to introduce this in the energy model? So as I said, the purpose of energy modeling is optimize the system, okay? But to do that, we need some inputs. From the demand side, for example, we need to know which are the electricity consumption by residential, industrial, commercial, and transport sector. We also need to know the electricity transactions. In the Ecuadorian case specifically, we need to know about the electricity that is uh, buy or sell from Colombia and Peru. And we also need to know the supply from renewable and non-renewable potential that we have in the country. All of these input plus assumptions, uh, e we introduce in an optimization model. Okay, so this is how it's working now, but I am proposing or our work to get rid of uh, the non-renewable potential as much as we can. And instead of this, just use the renewable potential. But in here, we are going to introduce a multi-criteria analysis. So this multi-criteria analysis is a tool that is used to solve problems characterized by multiple actors, multiple criteria, and multiple objectives, and has some steps. The first one is definition of criteria that we are going to analyze. Though the second one is selection of actors who are going to weight this criteria. The third step is weighting the criteria. For this one, we use the analytic, analytical hierarchy process. So the fourth step is selection of alternatives, which are the projects that can be built in the country. These projects could be from hydro, solar, wind, geothermal, and so on. The fifth step is evaluation of alternatives. In this case, we are going to recollect all the information that we need for uh, what that we need uh, for the selection, uh, the alternatives that we selected according to the criteria that we defined. And finally, we are going to ranking all the alternatives. For this, we, we are going to use a specific software. So after doing the research and looking the problems that were already caused in Ecuador by power plants, we found nine criteria to be analyzed. And these criteria are, are involved in three uh, big clusters, the social, the environmental, and the technical one. And the actors who are going to, are going to weight these criteria are uh, government and academic institutions represented by uh, experts in the energy field, also local communities represented by people who used to live or are living around the power plants, also environmental activists and the private sector represented by construction firms. So the next step is selection of alternatives. In this part, I want to be very clear that, very clear that all the alternatives that we are going to analyze are possible uh, projects that can be built in the country. Those projects are not built yet because the multi-criteria analysis is made uh, for the process that, for the projects that can be built, okay? So 
uh, in the master electricity plan, for example, the Ecuadorian government already have a portfolio of hydropower plants of 85 projects with a capacity higher on, of 6,000 megawatts. They also have five projects for geothermal uh, resource with a capacity higher than 900 megawatts. And in our work, we define nine projects for wind potential with a capacity higher than 500 megawatts. And for, and for solar potential, we have uh, we identified 32 projects with a capacity higher than 75,000 megawatts peak. In total, we have uh, uh, 132 projects that can be that are going to be analyzed with a capacity higher of 83.4 gigawatts that can be installed in the country. Okay, so as I said in this graphic, you are going to see this. In this, you see you are seeing the uh, weights assigned to every criteria for all of the actors. And as you can see here, the criteria, uh, the most important criteria to be considered before to build a power plant is the deforestation. So it means if uh, it's very important to taking into account if to build a power plant, you need to deforest it an area, okay? So the second criteria is the risk for fauna for the same project. So the third criteria is population transfer and so on. The accessibility and distance to the grid, which are technical criteria are the less important, if we can say, uh, for the actors. Here in this graphic, you can see a lot of bars. Every bar represents one uh, project. Uh, because of the time, I can't say the name of all the projects. But the important parts that here belong to the zero access, those are the projects that satisfy the preferences of the actors according to the criteria that we chose at the beginning. And as you can see here, the first 11 projects are hydropower plants with a capacity less than 10 megawatts each. The other project, for example, that satisfy the criteria is the PV. That means that the roof, the uh, power uh, photovoltaics that we can install in the rooftops. And here, for example, uh, you can see the projects that are not satisfy the criteria. For example, hydro uh, hydropower plants with a capacity higher than 2,000 megawatts could be the worst project that could be installed in the country. So here you can see all the capacity that we have. But according to the multi-criteria analysis, just 68.6 gigawatts can be installed because they satisfy the um, criteria of the actors. Finally, I would like to say that this model uh, provides to decision makers with a more inclusive model for the Ecuadorian that includes not just technical and economical aspects, but also the uh, social and environmental ones. And of course, include not just the, uh, the government in order to decision making, but also the population. So we are looking for a just energy transition in the country. We also are thinking one step forward, the classic extractivism model in the country, and this model can be adapted to every country necessities. Because for example, the criteria that we analyze in Ecuador could or could not be the same criteria that has to be analyzed in Peru or Colombia, et cetera. And one of the most important parts is that we learn from the mistakes, okay? So during the power sector planning, for example, we design a model that considers the conflicts created around the projects, the past projects, in order to avoid the same uh, conflicts in the future and not once the power plants are built. So thank you very much with this. If you have any questions or something, uh, here is my contact. Um, thank you very much. Great, thank you, Carolina, mm -hmm. um, for that very uh, interesting proposal and presentation. Uh, I think all of these, I think this is a great panel because they are kind of different angles on, on this issue and um, different, uh, different perspectives. So it should be a good discussion at the end. So we will move on to um, the next presenter uh, from the University of Helsinki, Anna Heikinen. Hi, Anna. Hello. Um, I'm trying to share my screen here. Let me see if you can see it. Um, not yet. OK. Uh, let's see. There we go. Yep. OK, great. So um, 
Good morning or good evening from Finland. My name is uh, Anna Heikkinen and I am a doctoral candidate at the University of Helsinki. And uh, in this presentation, I will be talking about my recent paper on climate change, power and differential vulnerabilities in the Peruvian ANS. Uh, this paper is currently under review in a um, journal called uh, Regional Environmental Change. And uh, I am, of course, hoping it to be accepted by the reviewers. So to begin with, uh, the so-called big question behind this research paper was uh, to explore what actually makes people vulnerable under climate change. Uh, it is increasingly acknowledged that um, the impacts of climate change will not affect everyone equally and um, that marginalized rural populations are at particular risk. Um, however, um, a growing number of scholars are problematizing the conventional vulnerability approach wherein uh, vulnerabilities are seen only as a product of uh, climate impacts instead of asking why the risks of climate change are unequally distributed between different groups of people. So the aim of my research was to analyze in the context of uh, Peru, um, what are the actual root causes of uh, the vulnerabilities of Peruvian highland smallholder farmers and whether Peru's climate adaptation policies uh, have been sufficient to protect the, the vulnerable farmers. So just a few words about the climate vulnerability scenario in the Peruvian highlands. Um, first of all, global warming and warming and climate change are already transforming the fragile uh, Andean ecosystems. Um, the Andean highlands are, for instance, home for the largest part of the tropical glaciers in the world. And since the 1970s, these glaciers have been melting in an accelerated pace, which is expected to have um, severe consequences for the water access and supply of the region. And the climate studies have also reported um, increased weather extremes such as droughts, frosts, intense uh, rains in the region. And uh, these climatic transformations are particularly um, challenging or posing a threat for smallholder farmers because uh, their livelihoods and ways of, of living are closely tied to their surrounding uh, nature. However, as I will later on discuss, um, the climatic changes are not the only reason behind their vulnerabilities, but there are also um, structural uh, issues at stake. And the theoretical um, approach of my research was um, a political ecology approach to vulnerability, which um, sees vulnerability as a product of multiscalar um, political, economic and, and social um, processes and the power relations within them, which determine people's access to, to resources, markets and political decision making. And uh, my research was based on a six month ethnographic oriented field study in the Mantara River Valley in the central highlands of uh, Peru in 2019. And uh, here you can see a more detailed map um, of the location of my study region and um, also my um, case study sites. So the valley is located more or less at the, the central point of, of Peru. So then, um, Going to the results, uh, the main climatic concerns of the smallholder farmers of uh, the case study area were the yield damage and losses, uh, mainly due to frosts, droughts and unexpected um, rains, and uh, also uh, plagues and different kind of plant diseases have, had been increasing. 
and there was also an incre increasing shortage of irrigation water, especially during the dry season. Uh, however, the governmental support for the farmers had been um, quite weak, for example, in the case of yield losses and the climate adaptation projects such as uh, construction of, of new water res reservoirs had, had been lagging in, in many parts of, of the case study region. Um, and also besides the climatic changes, um, the smallholder farmers were facing increasing pressure from, um, from the agricultural markets, which in Peru mostly uh, favor large scale production. And this had made many farmers to abandon their traditional farming methods to receive more, more uh, frequent and, and bigger yields. Uh, and this intensified use of land had in turn uh, made the, the crops less resilient to climate risks and, and plagues. Um, in comparison, the traditional rotation farming systems in the ants uh, and more diversified farming practices had um, helped the farmers to, to anticipate um, and to cope with crop losses or environmental risks. Um, I also um, analyzed the, the, how climate vulnerabilities are tackled in, in Peru at diverse policy levels by analyzing um, climate policy documents and also conducting interviews with governmental officials at different uh, levels. And um, Peru's national climate adaptation, adaptation strategy um, has listed protection of uh, vulnerable Amazonian and highland, highland smallholder and indigenous communities as one of its uh, priorities, which is um, very promising. But um, however, a closer analysis of um, the implementation, both formulation and implementation of the policies showed uh, several discrepancies. Uh, first of all, the smallholder farmers were not uh, at all present in, in formulation of the national climate adaptation strategy. Uh, most of the actors who participated consisted of uh, national or international powerful organizations or institutions. And uh, secondly, um, the means of adaptation uh, presented in the climate policies uh, mostly include uh, top-down technocratic instruments such as uh, modern and efficient uh, farming um, or irrigation systems, which um, at the moment are not affordable for um, highland smallholder farmers and are um, more targeted for agribusinesses or large-scale companies that uh, have the possibilities to invest in such um, systems. Um, and also the climate policies from national to local levels um, kind of uh, repeat uh, notions of uh, capacitation and awareness rising need for smallholder farmers in climate change issues, um, uh, which is a bit problematic because these kind of discourses are undermining small scale farmers own agency in climate adaptation solutions, something that um, Anne Therese also addressed in her in her keynote speech earlier. So uh, besides um, the uneven power relations in, in climate policies in their formulations and formulation and implementation. The highland, highland farmers' vulnerabilities in Peru um, are also amplified through uneven even power dynamics in, in other fields uh, of policy. And moreover, uh, these power imbalances were extended in, in the um, in the highland uh, communities, the farmers were uh, seeking for um, powerful alliances to, to help them with adaptation efforts um, um, in front of uh, increased competition and, and 
from the markets and and the climate uh, threats, which in turn had led to segregation and, and conflicts um, between the communities and had not led to any sustainable uh, climate adaptation solutions, but mer merely um, vice versa. But I think I'm out of time, so I will stop here. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward for the uh, discussion later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you also for sticking with the time. Um, and I will just say that at the University of Helsinki, there's a very vibrant network on themes related to extractivism and development called EXALT uh, that I'm sure Anna is part of. And I will just put the link in there because I also um, am part of that network. So we will move on to the last uh, presenter. We've been very good with time. Um, so uh, uh, Quincy Stemler um, will be next. Quincy, do you have, do you need to share your screen? Do you have access to that? Yes, let me try sharing my screen. Do you see it? Yes, perfect. Thank you. Perfect. And you can begin. Okay, so thank you, Ben. Thanks to the RLS for providing this platform. Today, I will present you my research, which is based on my dissertation project. The title of my presentation and working title of my thesis is Conflictive Extractivism, Mining Institutions and Social Conflict in Peru and Colombia. If we talk about extractivism, and Petra has already elaborated on this, uh, we usually ask, are natural resources a blessing or a curse? And well, uh, various researchers, researchers have linked a dependence on natural resources to um, slower growth levels, political corruption, and heightened social conflicts, among others. But also recently, the debate has shifted more towards the question aren't bad institutions the real curse? Uh, I think Canada might be one of the best examples. It has almost 50% primary goods exports, but there's no curse. Of course, there are a lot of serious problems there too, but not in the, the sense of this hypothesis. So I believe that we need to take a closer look into the institutional structure and power relations of a country, and also how you can see on this picture, the international power relationships to really understand the dynamics of this curse. I did a qualitative country case study of Peru and Colombia, both countries with a high level of violent social conflict in the context of extractive activities. These social conflicts can take on different forms. In Peru, regular deaths occur in clashes between protesters, protesters and security forces in mining conflicts. In Colombia, it's more the systemic assassination of environmental activists. But given the limited scale of this presentation, I want to focus more on the, on the similarities and leave those differences aside. In general, both countries share an array of similar structural features. They are not only the geographical neighbors, but also both rely on primary goods exports. They strictly follow orthodox neoliberal economic policies. They both have a past of internal armed conflict and their GDP per capita is comparable. In my research, I will focus on the mining sector. Let me first present my approach and research question before I will elaborate on my research results that are based on a historical comparative analysis and an actor analysis. So when we talk about institutions, what do we mean? In new institutionalist approaches, institutions are defined not only are defined as the rules that shape the behavior of social actors. But those rules aren't only formal rules like, like laws, for example, but also informal rules like common practices or social norms. Institutions are not static. They change and evolve over time. Neither are they neutral. They shape and are themselves shaped by power dynamics. So to understand how extractivisms can cause social conflict, I first want to ask, in which context did this institutional system evolve? Secondly, I want to know how do these institutions shape the behavior of social actors and how does this lead to social conflictivity, conflictividad in Spanish? In my analysis, 
I broke down the institutional system of the mining sector down into three dimensions. First, what I call the political participatory dimension, where I analyze the political processes behind its regulation and design. Second, the political economic dimension that encompasses processes of mining rent distribution. And third, the socio ecological dimension, where I look at the relationship between society and nature in the context of mining. So how did the institutions that shape the context of today's mining sectors in Peru and Colombia evolve? Here I will look on developments of the last 50 years. First, the political participatory dimension. Both countries started from a tradition of being illiberal democracies with episodes of military governments in the case of Peru. Here, all political and economic decisions were made by a political elite. In this context, guerrilla rebel groups formed, mainly recruited from politically marginalized groups, seeking to violently overthrow these political systems. The political elites reacted with repression, trying to end the rebellion through authoritarian state force, but continuous peace could only be reached when the political systems were democratized and included those formerly marginalized groups. This new system, although more democratic, its decision-making processes still possesses a lot of the old defects, thus upholding political exclusion to some extent. Second, the politico-economic dimension. By the mid 20th century, especially Colombia and later Peru under military president Velasco, pursued economic development through industrialization strategies and active economic management by the state, how Pedro already elaborated. This model entered a deep crisis in the 1980s and provoked a radical change of economic institutions towards a model propagated by the so-called Washington Consensus. This new model focused on promoting foreign direct investment and balanced budgets. An expansion of the mining sector offered an opportunity for both attracting foreign capital and raising state re revenue. Thus the neoliberal extractivism of today was born. In the political economic dimension, as well as in the political participatory dimension, we can observe a rapid institutional change taking place at a critical juncture after the old set of institutions had entered crisis. However, different development, a different development can be observed in the socio-ecological dimension. Here, change proceeded gradually after the first formal institutions regulating the environment were introduced in Colombia in the 1960s, and in Peru in the 1970s. After a time, more and more institutions were added following internal and external pressure. But today, although we find a comprehensive environmental protection framework in both countries, these formal regulations seem highly ineffective. Let's now proceed to the results of my actor analysis. In the political participatory dimension, we can observe a dominance of technocratic, and especially in the case of Colombia, aristocratic elites. These elites try to restrict a wider participation of the public. But this absence of formal participation does not mean that the elites can proceed how they like. Um, instead, social conflicts become a substitute for participation. People take their demands to the streets and the elites have to repress them in order to still achieve their goals. In the political economic dimension, we see that the mining rancher system creates a dependency of, for several actors. They compete for their share of the cake, so to speak. Other sectors of the economy, meanwhile, feel threatened by the contamination produced by mining activities and fear economic displacement. And these fundamentally conflicting material interests without any mitigating efforts heighten the stakes for the actors involved and are another factor that incentivize heavy resistance and thus social conflict. And then last, the socio-ecological. Sorry to interrupt, you have about two minutes left. Yeah, perfect. And at last, the socio-ecological dimension. By law, the central state in Peru, as well as in Colombia, possesses a monopoly on the ownership of nature. This constellation ignores the plurality of human nature relationships, the distinct cosmo visiones that we find in those countries. Um, these play a fundamental role in the lives of many groups, indigenous people, afrodescendientes, for example, and unregulated mining fundamentally threatens those groups, again, provoking heavy resistance, 
although in in Colombia also maybe this this is something that that Paul Cisneros is going to look in that the court has spoken some very interesting um, sentences, partly recognizing those differences, but in in reality they are being ignored furthermore. To sum up, the curse of mining causing social conflict is thus the the result of a certain institution institutional setting. Formal institutions that might prevent conflicts in Peru and Colombia are either misguided, absent, or ineffective by design. This constellation incentivizes uh, sometimes violent struggles for certain actors whose interests otherwise wouldn't be taken into account at all and provokes repression from the state dominated by elites on the other side or parastate actors like we find in Colombia. These struggles themselves turn into informal institutions in some way so that the co conflictive practices and norms are like the social conflicts become themselves common norms and practices for, for some actors. And as we learn from history, institutional settings only change rapidly after a period of crisis. So maybe with our current crisis, we're at the brink of just another critical juncture. Might be interesting to see. Thank you. Great, thank you, Quincy. Um, another excellent presentation. Thank you all to all the panelists for keeping on time. Um, that was really a great way to start our panels for the day. Five excellent presentations. Um, we can now open up two questions. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the Department of Geography, looking at the politics of resource extraction, indigenous rights and conservation in the Yasuni in Ecuador. So welcome again. And yeah, let's get started with the first presentation. It's actually a video. Um, I know that Steven is going to give a brief introduction about the video, and then we are going to share the link. And if it's possible, we can also share the screen. Um, and let's see how things unfold. How about that, Steven? Sounds good. Thanks, Danilo. Uh, just a brief introduction, then everyone can watch the video. If sharing doesn't work, you'll have the, you already see in the chat, the link to the video. So this short video lies at the intersection between two separate projects. I'm lead re a researcher on a project funded by a Shirk Explorer and American Academy of Religion International Collaboration Grants that looks at what we call ritual polyphony in Afro-Brazilian groups in the state of Minas Gerais, Brazil. The other members of the team are here. That's Cristina Borges, she's from the State University of Montes Claros, and she's the lead author on this uh, video project. And uh, Guaraci dos Santos and Alexandre Caetel, both at the Pontifical Catholic University of Minas Gerais. Ritual polyphony occurs when in the same space, the same leaders and many of the same participants conduct the rituals and follow the beliefs of distinct religions on different days. This is not mixture, it's not synchronism, syncretism, it's not hybridity, it is more like multi-religiosity. Each of the houses in which we did field work uh, belongs to or is an example of two or three of the following religions, Candomblé, Umbanda, Kimbanda, and Reinado or Congado, the second project is a series of videos produced by Christina and her team in Montes Claros on aspects of Afro-Brazilian religious cultures. The footage you'll see in our video comes from that work, and you can find additional uh, videos from that project on the site where this one is posted. The video expresses multiple themes. It is itself intentionally polyphonic. First, music is a central mode of expression and transmission of knowledge in Afro-Brazilian cultures and religions. Second, the case of Ogon, the West African Yoruba Orisha, or God of War, illustrates the productive tension between African and Brazilian traditions. This sacred entity accumulates new meanings in Brazil. The examples here expressed in music are syncretization with the Catholic Saint George, and new webs of meaning as Ogun shaped and reflected the significant participation of Afro-descendant Brazilians, most of them slaves who were freed to fight, in the Paraguayan War from 1864 to 1870. 
Third, the multi-religious, ritually polyphonic nature of all the groups that you will see in this video call on us as researchers to let go of essentializing categories. In the case of studying religions, we should reject concepts of pure or authentic religions, which then lead us to label groups like these Afro-Brazilian houses as in some ways uh, impure, syncretic, hybrid, or in general secondary and derivative. They are, in many ways, more authentic expressions of religion than elite normative Catholicism, for example. Finally, ritual polyphony and the dynamic associations of Ogun highlight the fact that not only when speaking of religions, meaning is not tied to origins, to pure transmission of traditions, or to universal cross-cultural categories. It's constructed through contextualized networks of associations, and these must be studied at a local level. So uh, enjoy the video. It's about seven minutes and 20 seconds, and we can talk in the discussion period, of course. Wonderful. So um, I have provided the link to the video in the chat, just in case the image quality is not um, optimal through the Zoom screen. Um, however, I will go ahead and play the video now for you, and I do encourage you to watch it again later on your own device. Os conceitos da religião e da tradição muitas vezes são vistas como sinônimo. A religião aponta para cima ou para além, referente a um estado sagrado, um reino transcendente. A tradição aponta de volta a um passado distante e original. Nós estamos de uma essencial nas religiões de matriz africana. Guarda tempos. Passado e presente se encerram em letras e ritmos, transmitindo visões sobre o mundo, a natureza e os brasileiros. A música é uma peça fundamental, eu diria, para um pano em torno da obra. Existe candomblé em forma de música. É a forma que o negro tinha, o negro não podia estar ali sentado na senzala batendo papo com o outro, não. Ele não podia estar na cozinha de, de brusilei com o outro, não. Então, às vezes, o negro cantava suas súplicas, seus anseios, seus revoltos, suas mágoas. E isso pegou. Não existe candomblé e não existe um banda sem música. Se o mato pegar uma folha, Tenho que cantar, eu pedir licença. É uma beleza, pô! As músicas afro-religiosas são símbolos que possibilitam encontros das tradições africanas, indígenas as cantigas, contos cantados nas umbandas e candomblés brasileiros, encantam. A magia brota da polifonia ritual. 
em si, vibrante, dinâmica e altamente responsiva às necessidades dos seus membros e às complexidades da sua cultura religiosa local. Oku, eu vou te chamar de destemido e corajoso, com suas armas, a espada, a faca, lança, ele nos defende dos inimigos. A corrente, quem quer que seja, que tente nos prejudicar. A crença em São Jorge ficou mais forte com a guerra entre o Brasil e o Paraguai. O negro escravo foi o melhor soldado dessa guerra. Graças a sua fé em Ogum, o Brasil vence o Maitá, que enfraqueceu o Paraguai. Isso é a história do negro. O negro ele vem para o Brasil trazendo fato que ninguém conhecia, né? uma força, um Deus que ninguém conhecia. Ele era escravo, não tinha vontade própria, então peraí, negro. Você não canta desse negócio aqui, não. Mas ele não, não queria deixar de praticar sua fé. Ele não queria de maneira nenhuma e não podia deixar de louvar seu Deus. pelos atos religiosos, iniciado em diferentes expressões físicas e afetivas na busca pelas diversas potencialidades oferecidas via suas identificações a seus orixás, santos e filhos, como, por exemplo, no culto ao orixá africano ou grupo. Great. Amazing video. Uh, Stephen and I were exchanging many emails actually during the development of the video and it's so nice to see how it turned out. Such an amazing production. Congratulations. And yeah, then we'll have the space for questions towards the end of the block. And now I would like to invite to the stage to Jennifer Adams from the University of Calgary. Feel free to share your screen. And just a, as a reminder, you have 10 minutes for your presentation. Please hold to it. Congrats. I am here. My name is Jennifer Adams, and I'm here from the University of Calgary. And I am in both the um, 
a joint appointment in the Department of Chemistry and in the Workland School of Education. And this here is the work that I'm going to be presented on is work that I've done when I was back in Brooklyn. And um, that's where I'm originally um, I'm from. And when I was there, I was engaged in work around place-based education. And this notion of place-based education, it was then when they were conceptualizing it as a way of connecting, especially urban youth with the places of belonging, you know, place that they felt belonging. But then knowing from my own identity and living in the Caribbean diaspora, I knew that there was this type of relationship with place that wasn't as linear as the existing place-based let um, literature was describing it. So that en enabled me to go on this um, investigation of it. So we know that whenever we think about the Caribbean, we think about this particular place, you know, that touches the Caribbean Sea. However, when other Caribbeanists talk about the Caribbean, you know, like for one, um, Benitez Rojas describes it as a meta archipelago that is, you know, neither sensory nor boundary because he relates this to like fractal or chaos theory. Um, Stuart Hall talks about this constant reproducing and reproductions. So this um, Caribbean identity has always been described in the scholarship with this notion of movement and you know dispersion of people around the globe. And we know that the Caribbean was formed largely because of diasporas, because of movement into it, you know, mostly involuntary, some of it voluntary, and movement within. Where, um, where this research, and I'm sorry, Caribbean is spelled wrong there, where this research um, is based in is where, again, where I'm from is Brooklyn. And the area that you see is red, where they're describing the Black population. Most of that Black population would be people of Caribbean descent, especially if you get, this is Prospect Park right here. If you get to this area that's south and further out east here, most of that is going to be people that have some type of connections to the Caribbean. So in thinking about place, and I started to think about land relationships more being here in um, Canada, when we talk a lot about the indigenous relationships with the land, and that's becoming more a part of the discourse in the United States as well. And thinking about how land or has, be, has been reconfigured and this notion of place as being on top of the land through this notion of um, territoriality with his um, um, this coming from this colonial ideology of the acquisition of resources, goods, bodies, and everything. So this is an, an important underlying um, concept to, to, um, to consider. I have just really started to consider that notion of land and what that means in talking about place relationships, especially for diasporic people who have African um, roots and identity when we know that we were brought over here to Turtle Island and the Caribbean involuntarily and have from here either gone, you know, emigrated to Canada, another settler colonial um, space, or to England, which is a, you know, the colonial empire. So just thinking of that, these are just some thoughts around there. I won't spend time discussing that just because of the um, time. In um, Caribbean lexicon, we like to talk about this notion of home. And that notion of home is both a physical place, so it refers just to, it, it refers to that land and that geographic space. But then there's also like an spiritual and embodied notion of that that is carried within. So for Caribbean people, land often becomes synonymous with home and that notion of land becomes synonymous with home. And in the Caribbean, we also know that there, especially in the um, Anglophone islands, there has been this history of erasure of indigenous peoples from that lands, but a lot of people that are there from, um, you know, historically will tell you that the people were not fully erased, but rather there are remnants of indigenous people there, whether they are part of what people carry within or actual groups of people that still exist on the land and claim that as their ancestral space. So the significance when I go back to this notion of place and thinking about place-based education, the place that you end that you find yourself on is very important because this is the context for your lived experiences. It's an emotional context for identity and memory, and it's also a part of um, cultural memory. So sense of place, thinking about that relationship between people and place, um, 
And again, going back to that notion of home, and it's interesting that the, um, the film that we just um, watched talked about this polyphony of religion. So some people talk about this notion of, you know, recreation of culture and recreation of space in terms of polyphonic bricolage. So I'm just gonna continue on because that's just repeating that. So the way that I went about exploring it, it was using a lot of a notion of hermeneutic ph um, phenomenology, which looked at my own relationships with place. And also I had a group of high school age students at the time who were engaged in this exploration of place. And we just had conversations. They went out and they took photographs. They brought back in and talked about those um, those um, photographs that they take they took. So this place, this notion of place became this artifact that that we all examined in this group and looked at how as Caribbean, as, as Caribbean people, we were relating to this place that we call Brooklyn. And so um, another notion was ethnic vernacular. This was from one of my colleagues at a university that I worked at before Brooklyn College. And he talked about the way that people change meanings of their places by how the places are, you know, how they're decorated, what are those physical things that people put in order to signify this as a place of particular people. So I started to look at these places and symbols along with my students. And, you know, of course, a lot of pictures came back with food because this is important to cultural um, continuity, the types of food that you avail that are available to you in the place, the types of food that you access and how you go out and get them and then bring them home in order to recreate that notion or can that um, notion of con um, sorry cultural continuity within the home. And so we talked a lot about food and how this food was very important to um, to um, that identity as being Caribbean and also shaping the places that we considered Caribbean spaces in Brooklyn. This is one place that is in a park. It's an urban space called um, Prospect Park. And this here is a group of Haitian people that gather there almost every weekend and it becomes a raw ride event too. So this came up a lot in the students, especially in this, um, the Haitian American students that were there and how this was a place, a gathering place to talk about the politics of Haiti to um, share music and also to share food because they're often- One vending. minute left, sorry. Huh? One minute left. One minute left, okay. All right, so let me just um, skip through. Um, these are just some of the places because it became more of a visual um, representation of how these places were recreated to represent Caribbean identity. These are just some quotes from the students um, talking about a bakery that she likes to go to. And as soon as she's in there, she really connects with her Caribbean or Trinidadian identity, even though she was born in, um, in the United States. Another, um, you know, person wrote about being, um, you know, from, you know, her family being from Puerto Rico, but she was born and raised in there. So this, you know, she kind of used a metaphor of being this flag wrapped, you know, wrapped around the body as a marker of identity. And that was very an interesting sight to me because then I started to think about the Caribbean parade and how these physical markers of identity became very important for people to um, make that connection with their space. And these in particular, you know, New York City, um, you know, cops, even though they're all in their uniforms, they each have their flags that represent what their, you know, their um, strong Caribbean identity. So just some concluding thoughts about sense, um, you know, sense of place is in, um, influenced by things that people value about place. Um, that yeah, identity is very important in this place relationship. Um, some of these things that form lived experiences in a place, memories by, by self and others about a place, notions of home of land. So these are all very important because a lot of people that were in a part of my research, their notion of Caribbean-ness was connected to memories and stories that their parents and elders told about the Caribbean. And even though these were not necessarily places that they grew up may have visited once or twice. These are just some of the other notions that I found that were very important into this place. And that's the end of my conversation. And I'm sorry, I had to run through it really quickly like that. Sorry for cutting you, Jennifer. Excellent presentation. Thank you very much. And now let's move to the next one. We have Akira Chiavaroli from the London School of Economics. So the space is all yours, Chiara. Welcome. 
Thank you, Danilo. I'm trying to share the screen. So, can you see all my screen or just the presentation? Yes, we can see the, only the presentation, the PDF file that we have. Okay, there. okay, just making sure. Okay, so uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. So, I'm Chiara. I'm from the London School of Economics. I'm a PhD candidate uh, in the Department of International uh, Development. And today I'm going to present some um, results from this project, which is the synoptic and participatory assessment of environmental pollution and health effects due to exposure to mercury from artisanal gold mining in the Alto Cauca Basin in uh, Colombia. So this is a project that uh, was led by Professor Irene Velez Torres from the um, Universidad del Valle in, um, in Cali and that uh, started in 2019 and is based on a collaboration with the Afro-descendant communities of Latoma and Jorombo in the Upper Cauca region close to Suarez in uh, Cauca, Colombia. So I'm only going to talk about the gender component of this project, which was my component, uh, that aimed to look at the gender aspect of mercury contamination and at the interrelation between the political, social and health impacts of contamination. So um, the context from which this project emerged is the discussion on the impacts of extractivist practices on the health of rural communities and in particular of uh, ethnic communities in Colombia. This discussion particularly focused on the expansion of the extractivist frontier, uh, looking at the conflict between uh, large scale mining companies and uh, ethnic communities. And we know that um, large scale mining has a very detrimental environmental effect. It uh, leads to environmental degradation, water pollution, some scholars also talk about the notion of solastalgia to speak about the psychological effects that environmental degradation also can have on um, uh, rural communities. And there has been a very strong uh, gender focus on these, um, in this discussion because several feminist uh, geographers, and in particular Ujoa, uh, to which I refer in this work, um, propose the notion of body territory to look at the same time at the processes of exploitation of nature and processes of exploitation of the female bodies. So in particular, she analyzed um, gender violence happening at the uh, margins of the extractivist uh, frontier, uh, understanding them as an interrelated processes of exploitation of female and uh, bodies and territory. So um, the context of this one. So um, the context of this project has been uh, not too much to look at the large uh, mining companies, but to focus on the macro dynamics of this conflict and the gender dynamics of destructivist conflict. So we didn't focus on uh, large scale mining, but on artisanal gold mining, even though the communities of Latoma and Jolombo have an history of resistance to uh, large scale mining as well, um, in particular with a Canadian company, the Gold Ashanti, and there is a strong presence of uh, movements of territorial feminists in, uh, in the region. So here the um, extractivist frontier is not so neatly defined, but uh, the conflict is very much within the community, within the households, and as a very gender um, dimension. So um, to collect data, we conducted participant observation, uh, gender focus groups with female and male uh, local miners, semi-structure interviews, uh, and also time use survey and evaluated questionnaires. And what we discover in the focus groups in particular is that, so we map all the practices, uh, the mining practices that um, are conducted within the territory of La Toma and Jolombo. And we try to understand the gender participation in these practices. So they range from uh, the very ancestral traditional mining practices to the more technified ones. Women participate across all these practices from the least technified to the more technified ones but they have very different uh, gender roles. So if in ancestral mining, they are independent miners, they have their economic um, independence. In technified mining, they support the male members of their households. So they provide um, secondary services such as preparing lunch or taking care of the children, but they lose their economic independence. And these practices are not so synchronic because um, due to the contamination of mercury in the river, women are pushed to, women are pushed to uh, go into technified mining more and more. Um, we also trace the sources of contamination and uh, people say that it arrived in the territory in the 1990s when uh, some foreign miners from other departments, so Antioquia, Choco, invaded the territory of um, La Toma, uh, in particular discharging significant amounts of mercury in the river with the backhoes. 
And um, it also arrives to the community from mining activities that are conducting in the nearby territories. And uh, today is also employed by local miners from the community. Um, the main reason is that um, it's a problem of water scarcity. So using mercury in the washing step of the artisanal gold mining process, we use the need uh, for water and reduce uh, gold loss. So miners that employ it are usually aware of the health risk of using uh, mercury, but claim that in the context of water scarcity, they have no choice and it's something that they, they have to do. And uh, manipulating mercury exposed these miners to um, to contamination because of course they manipulate it directly, but also the whole community is exposed to mercury because there are other routes of contamination. So uh, the discharges of mercury in the river get to all the households through water consumption or fish consumption. And um, lots of women are exposed to um, inhalation of mercury when the amalgama, which is the amalgama of gold and mercury is burned in the, in the households. Um, so we look with the community at the observed symptoms of mercury, among which we are skin rushes, malformations, infertility, miscarriages, and environmental impacts. So people report saying, uh, seeing floating fishes in the river, uh, the death of cows, and just generally the contamination of the local um, water sources. Um, and we propose to, to look at contamination as a gender phenomenon because uh, being mercury mostly employed by men, um, locally is very much perceived as a masculine and foreign object, or, uh, even more and more less foreigner, but still masculine. And uh, beyond being mostly employed by men, mercury has a gender dimension because uh, by transforming the river into a contaminated site, it pushed women to join, to lose their sort of uh, traditional um, livelihood strategy and to move into technified mining, losing their economic independence. So it's forcing women back into a more narrow uh, gender role. Um, and also mercury carries along a number of symbolic implications because it challenged a relational understanding of the well-being of human and human beings as interrelated and proposed a masculine understanding of nature as something that uh, can be exploited. Uh, so in particular, women uh, say that uh, in uh, ancestral women, in ancestral, sorry, mining, which is uh, mostly practiced by women, um, they work together with the river, so in collaboration with nature, to extract gold, while mercury is a violent act towards nature, and um, there is a sort of prioritization of the well-being of the single household at the expense of the whole community. So um, in this sense, Contamination can be understood as a process of uh, mirroring violence of the body territory. And an example of this interrelatedness um, comes from the description that local women give of uh, infertility. So you have some uh, interviews uh, in, uh, in the slides, some small uh, quotes from some interviews. And uh, women usually describe infertility as one of their main fears in relation to, to mercury contamination, because mercury is thought to uh, eat up and consume the um, reproductive system. And they also describe the Ovejas River as uh, becoming itself infertile, because it used to give to the community fishes, gold, material for constructed houses, and now it's contaminated, so it doesn't produce any more these sort of sources for the community. So this is just one of the examples that uh, come from the fieldwork about how women's bodies and the territory uh, undergo through a similar and um, mirroring process of exploitation in uh, this sort of contaminated uh, landscape. Also, um, the women that we, local miners that we interviewed, um, say that they feel a strong continuity between other practices of material dispossession that have been um, going on in the territory uh, before um, and contamination today as a practice of a new form of violence that is exercised um, on them. So we propose to look at contamination as a practice of immaterial dispossession because it doesn't affect, it doesn't take land away directly from people, but still it cross symbolically or also like physically the territorial border of the community. And it sort of weakens the project of anti-extractivism and territorial autonomy of the community. And also it doesn't exercise um, direct violence on, on people, bodies, but it does uh, expose them to a sort of slow death or diseases through uh, exposure to toxic contaminants. So uh, just to conclude. One minute, Kira, sorry. Yeah, okay. So um, we, what we learned from this fieldwork is that is um, 
very important to look at the not only at the micro dynamics of destructive conflicts, but also these micro and gender dynamics. So what happens also within the communities and to look at the exploitation of bodies and territories as interrelated. So to try of going beyond the biomedical uh, studies of health to sort of also take into consideration these local ontologies that see these interrelation between bodies and territory. And that's all. Thank you for listening. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chiara, for the very informative presentation. And now it's turn for Luisa Isidro. Uh, so please um, join us. Uh, she's coming, she's presenting, uh, studying at the University of Manitoba in Canada. So please, Luisa. Uh, can you see all my screen? Yes. Okay. Good. So I'm gonna be very quickly, I'm gonna talk about the frictions and challenges for gender land based resilience in Colombia. Basically, I'm gonna talk about one, I'm gonna retake some uh, topics that Jennifer were talking, was talking about on embodiment of place identity and Chara was mentioning about like um, women sexually targeted. Uh, so basically I'm gonna structure here, I'm gonna show you what is the issue, what is the approach that I'm gonna take, the context, the etiology, what the causes, um, and how I have been addressing the issue on some conclusions that I'm gonna present as gaps. Just a heads up, this is just like the first presentation that I'm doing regarding my studies. So you are the prime here, my prime spectators. So what I'm planning to uh, answer is like, how do the land-based peace building in Colombia um, that is oriented on female rural women is affected by frictions between the national development plans and peace agreement in Colombia. So what does it mean this? In Colombia right now, there are two scenarios. So on one hand, we have like these uh, incredible um, politics regarding gender and gender scenarios. But on the other hand, we have like the national development plans and these gender scenarios have been like the sub gender commission and uh, different policies are acting on regards to uh, gender based violence. But when we are talking about like mining, they are in the middle. So it means that there is like challenges for gender security and well being. So basically what I'm thinking about is like retaking and decolonize this theoretical framework that we are talking about and let's leave ahead or let's leave out like some uh, scholars that are, been are not talking about like um, this dichotomy be become, sorry, between the human and the non-human. And I'm retaking the sentient nature uh, based on false border. I'm gonna also retake some um, Escobar, uh, Arthur Escobar ideas, and I'm also gonna take some Boaventura Sosa Santos. And here I'm retaking again something that uh, Jennifer was saying, like environment, place, identity, and it's like how territory itself creates identity for women in three scenarios: in their communities, in their practices and responsibilities, and in the cultural landscapes by themselves. And finally, just like a big challenge on human security, um, basically like how the human security that Colombia is putting in practice is just predominantly masculine and is just concentrating the security of the states, but not on the citizens. So here, I'm not gonna stop here further, but this is just um, a brief context on how everything started. And it's like with the constitution, we have these three plans on, uh, how Colombia is trying to increase mining and is through the um, organization management of the territory. Uh, we also have finally in 1991, like uh, Afro-Colombian communities and indigenous have the pre and informed consent. We have this big boom of minings and Canada has a lot of influence in the administration and the management of uh, code of mines which is released in um, 2001. And here I mentioned this because um, I will briefly mention in my presentation. And here I am highlighting the law of victims because it's the first um, law who is recognizing and acknowledging the territory 
as a subject of rights and therefore it can be victims. And um, here the Subcommission on Gender, because well, they have done a lot for gender-based violence and for land rights for um, rural women. And well, there is a big challenge, which is the implementation. Now here, I'd like you to focus, well, I, I tried to improve this, but it's not very well and uh, legible, but here you can see like how the mining titles that are granted in Colombia are also coincide with the rest land restitution in Colombia. And this is obviously affecting a lot to in, uh, indigenous communities. And I want to focus here on female rural women. And here you can see how they are coincide, how they coincide between each other here and here, sorry. Oops. So as I mentioned before, um, I will focus here on the Mande Norte project, Muriel Mande Norte. And is basically, it started on 2004 through the Muriel Mining Corporation and it got 30 years of extendable, three years of um, like participation in the territory plus or 30 years to be extendable. What does it mean? There are some armed actors that are being, are being involved in natural resources that is not a secret for everybody. But uh, what is inside in this project is the participation of former combatants of the FARC, uh, the Guyatini Self-Defense Units in Colombia, and the Front Omar Gomez from the ELN. This is basically allocated in the Embera territories, and which is for the Embera, they have like three kinds of territories, the prohibited, the enchanted, and the communal. If you want, I can talk about them in our discussion later. So the effects of mining exploitation for rural women is basically on, I divided in three of these different aspects. One is a militarization and presence of the armed actors in their territories, the human, la human and land rights violations, which is coming along with displacement, sexual and reproductive violations and domestic violence, and then territory rights violations. Because on this one person in Colombia have identified that rural women are sometimes double minority or triple minority because firstly they are indigenous, there could be Afro or rural women too, and also they are women, and also sometimes they are victims. Um, and in, in some cases it can be presented sexism and race, racism when they are um, going to some facilities of the state and well, this is another discussion, but the um, officials are not not well prepared to attend them. The well-being is being affected as well because as Shiara mentioned, like um, mostly they are male minors and this means that they could be sexually targeted. Then they have less security and there is another kind of violence which is domestic violence. Then finally they have employment issues and land rights. So, so for, um, you can see the population of rural women in Colombia is 42. 47.2% of the population. And according to uh, the human rights offices of the UN and the ombudsperson, they can basically, well, the um, rate to be targeted is 50% to be targeted, like, sorry, I'm having um, big trouble here, a threat, a threat, sorry, they can be threats 50% um, more for rural women. <clears throat> so now I collected some um, narratives that are explaining this one, for example, is just explaining how the territory is being violent and, and how they feel the violence in their body. This is a conference, that, sorry, an interview that I have with Dora Tavera, and she's explaining a kind of violence that is not on the table, which is the spiritual violence. She's just saying like, when we can go closer to a territory, this is a spiritual violence and it's a, spirit, it's a violence that is not touched by the state and is not touched by the academia very much. And this is another narrative uh, that some Afro-Colombian um, women talked to the Truth Commission and told them 
what is the connection between the territory and the navel. They have a special connection with the territory because of the navel. I'm gonna give 10 seconds if you wanna read these quickly. And finally, this one is just explaining the how the displacement displacement is just creating more um, frag is fragmenting the social fabric between the communities and the identity is not letting the, com the communities to do their one minute left. I'm sorry. One minute left, please. Okay, and I'm gonna go further here. This is what Colombia has done so far, and is Colombia has acted on number thirty four against. Um, a discrimination against women. We have the subcommission on gender. We have the peace agreement finally recognize the rural women as a part and as an important role in the food sovereignty. And finally, as I mentioned in my in the beginning of my presentation, is like Law 1448, which is recognizing territory as um, subject of rights. And uh, well, there is a decree that is only for negritudes. And my big conclusions here is like, it would be very interesting if we focus all, also on masculinities. If we also bring on the table the masculinities and how we can address these toxic masculinities or militarized masculinities, which are also um, producing like new kind of femininities. And yeah, I think that's basically. Yeah. Excellent presentation, Luisa. And yeah, I agree with Jennifer that says that the notion of spiritual violence is very important. That's something I hadn't heard and it sounds quite relevant. Thank you very much for the presentation. And um, now we have uh, Camila Reis and Dr. Evangelia Tatsuls from St. Mary University in Canada. So please, Camila, join us. Yes. It's just share the screen? No yet. Uh, yeah, feel free to start making some questions in the chat. Oh, sorry. I think I'm Thank you very much for it. keeping on time. No worries, Camila. This is the first time that I'm doing this. I don't know what's my computer. Yes, sorry. No worries. Or maybe I can help you sharing your presentation. I will send an update for you now. It's I just sent to you. I don't know. Sorry. Yeah, no worries. Update one. Okay, yeah. Okay, so start sharing. Now, is it here? You go. Okay, can you see my screen now? Yes. Thank okay, you, yeah. Yeah. just let me know when you want me to change the slide. Okay, um, so I'm Camilla Reyes, and I'm first year master's student in international development studies at St. Mary's University in Halifax, and I'm presenting my research project. And the title is in Resilience and Women Survivors of Domestic and Intimate Partner Violence in Bahia, Brazil. My supervisor is Dr. Eva Tatsko. You can change. <laughs> um, I will briefly uh, bring for everyone like the introduction, the theoretical framework, the significance for international development, research motives, objectives, methodology, limitations, research implications, and the bibliography. Um, first of all, why Brazil? Um, I'm Brazilian and in Brazil I'm a psychologist, so I have the interest in researching gender issues and resilience. And in Brazil, as everyone knows, has a high number of uh, violence, including domestic violence. So some data about Brazil in 2018, um, Brazil has uh, 263,000 reports of domestic violence. In the first half of 2020, almost 2,000 homicides of women 
an increase of 2% of the same period in 2019. Of the total, 631 were femicides, murders of women committed on the grounds of gender. Specifically in Bahia, they state, between March and April of 2020, they have an increase of 54% of domestic violence reports compared to the same period in 2018, and an increase of 150% in May of 2020 in feminine size compared to 2019. It is important to remember that these numbers is in 2020 was uh, in, in the beginning of the pandemic. So from March, we started the pandemic and the numbers were higher and increasing. And the United Nations recognizes gender-based violence as a serious violation of human rights and a matter of uh, public health. The United Nations also considers this to be a crisis that has intensified even further with the COVID-19 and a social isolation, as we could see with the numbers in Brazil. GBV happens everywhere and it is underreported for many reasons fear of retaliation on the part of the aggressor, generally unknown person, fear of a trio to which the victim will be exposed after report, concern with the discrediting of institutions of justice and public security. Uh, so explain a little bit better about gender-based violence. Uh, GPV derives from patriarchal power relations it works through punishment and reinforcing inequalities in male and female gender norms and gender discrimination. It is also important to highlight that gender-based violence is not only with women, it's all violence related to gender discrimination. So it can happen with men, uh, women, uh, LGBT community, but in my work we'll be focused on women. And common examples of GBV are rape, sexual assault, physical assault, forced marriage, denial of resources, opportunities, or services, as well as psychological and emotional abuse. Um, and also uh, explain a little bit more about resilience. We start in psychological discourse about resilience. Resilience is that resilience is, is an individual strength when people face stress or diversity. However, Junger, um, he's a researcher at Dalhousie here in Maritimes in Halifax, and he conceptualizes, conceptualizes resilience as the interaction between individual and their environment, optimizing and forcing the development. In this approach, external social resources are fundamental for the individual to develop a resilience. So this concept is, is different from the psychological concept that brings as more individual um, skill. Uh, Junger IG is more ecological social concept of resilience. So he brings that there is a, um, a, a relation between navigation and negotiation, like the navigation of the resources with the personal agents that we have. So for example, it is important for this woman who suffered domestic violence, what type of support they have uh, to strengthen their resilience. Or if they have their support before and they have this, rather they have a resilience. So how they can, their personal agents can go through the resources they already have. And the significance for this, for the international development about my research. Uh, it is related that all the theoretical um, framework that I, I'm bringing, it is the post-colonial and feminist approach that focus on structural and cultural factors affecting women experiencing violence and on how gender norms and gender inequalities intersect with other social divisions and forms of inequality, nationality and transnationality. So the more economically vulnerable a woman becomes, the more vulnerable she is to all forms of violence. But then Shiva also brings that the rape of the earth and the rape of women are intimately linked. Um, in other words, like feminists, they criticize, not everyone, but it is a criticism of capitalism and the patriarchal relations uh, in our structure that develop 
devalue women and other minorities. And so in other words, removing gender-based violence as the main obstacles to women's human rights and valuing and including their participation in society is a path to development. So I, after this uh, brief um, theoretical approach, I, I have some questions in my research and that I want to answer. So I was asking like, why and how do some women overcome domestic violence and why others do not? What forms does this resilience take? How is resilience developed before, during, or after, after the violence experiences? How do women who suffer gender-based violence build in resilience? And what factors contribute to its development? So I believe that the answers to these questions will provide more clarity on the reconstruction of human resilience and whether and how resilience can be learned, learned and strengthened in people. And so in this sense, the objectives of my work will be to explore the experiences of women who have suffered domestic or intimate partner violence from their perspective, to identify the systemic institutional and cultural factors contributing to it, to access individual women's responses, to identify the support factors at work in the women's lives, to trace the development of resilience with effects on factors that foster. And the methodology is through the mediation from NGOs in Salvador Bahia. It's my hometown, so I have more connections there. The idea is to um, recruiting 15 to 20 women from diverse backgrounds. Five interviews will be conducted with the key informants as well. I will apply a social demographic background, semi structured interviews, and depending on public health regulations, the interviews may be in person or video calls. And all data will be cross referenced while the international theoretical approach will be adopted in the analysis. Uh, some of the research implications is investigating how women recognize their lives after they experience domestic violence is important to develop better empirical policies and interventions in other developing worlds. The Brazilian government and NGOs that offer support and assistance, assistance to women will benefit from the findings and further the research that are expecting to help understanding resilience of women survivors of domestic violence. And I see some limitations, it starts with COVID and how I can collect the data. So I believe that probably will be online collection, with online interviews. And it is a sensitive topic. So I am correctly discussing um, how to approach the sensitive topic in, in online, online interviews. Uh, it is also important to take in consideration the risks of the re re traumatization to talk about the topic. And it is important to have a support resources listed at hand, such as contacts of psychologists, psychiatric, social workers, and lawyers to provide the adequate support to seek to by the participants, extend to their own network if necessary. And that's all. That's some of my bibliography. And thank you, everyone. Sorry for my mistakes in English. It's my first presentation. <laughs> it was a great presentation, Camila. Thank you very much. And yeah, that's pretty much it for this. Oh, yeah. For th thank you for joining us again. Uh, this is the session about counteraction. Esta mesa va a ser en español y en inglés. Tenemos la primera presentación a cargo de Nicola y Jocelyn sobre las protestas a, a través de Latinoamérica, los espacios rurales y urbanos. The floor is yours, Nicola. Exacto, muchas gracias. Voy a presentar en inglés como las transparencias están en inglés. Uh, okay, thank, thank you for invite, for uh, presenting me. So I'm Nicola Fontorolo, assistant professor at the University of Brescia in Italy. And this uh, work is uh, made together with Jocelyn that will present another work that we made together in a lot later session. Uh, my, so I have to start saying you that my approach is a bit different from yours in the sense that I'm an economist and I tend to use quantitative methods. 
rather than qualitative analysis. Uh, and then uh, I this uh, presentation is based on a regression analysis, let's say, quantitative method, methodology. So let's start with the questions. Protest across Latin America. Are urban and rural areas different? So the, the idea that the urban and rural areas are different is coming from a lot of literature on that. So why? Why? Because social discontent, which is uh, uh, translated as political discontent, voting for populist parties in, the, in Europe, in Latin America, in the US, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Literature on these, on social discontent, uh, is uh, generally uh, linked to the fact that people uh, who are people voting for these parties are people left behind people living in left behind areas. So with high unemployment, low education, low wealth, the age play a role which is important in the sense that young people tend to vote more for against, more for populist party rather than um, old, older people. But Latin America is a, a kind of special case. Why? Because Latin America is characterized by a rising middle class, which follow the growth of commodities price and international liquidity. So this new middle class that has been created in the last 10 years with the raw, uh, raw material super cycle is characterized by two things. First, it's located in urban areas because it's migrated, the, middle class is migrating from rural areas to urban areas. And the second fact, it is fragile because generally is not well educated, is making, uh, is enrolled in jobs uh, which are uh, with low, low profile jobs, typically in uh, trade, in uh, commerce, uh, and uh, they are not enjoying good uh, uh, job, con job conditions. Then what happened that with the end of the commodity boom, with the contraction of public spending, they lost their perspectives. They lost their, their idea of future. So they, they, there has been this manifestation of fragility and then they, uh, a perspective or uncertainty of, of worsening of their economic and social conditions. So the aim of the paper is exactly this. The first one is understanding if people in rural and urban areas are protesting, are taking part to protest in a different way. And what are the drivers in the two type of areas? To do that, we employ the Latin American Public Opinion Projects uh, with the data from 2019. So first thing, the stylized fact, which is called by economists, what's the share of people living in urban areas? So we all know that uh, the sub, the, um, Latin America is the subcontinent with the, the higher share of people living in urban areas. It's the most urbanized ca continent in the world. Indeed, we see that by countries, these are the countries covered by the Latin American Public Opinion Project, uh, more than 50% in all countries, or, uh, more than 50% of people in all countries are living in urban areas, which means that there is a strong concentration. And what about the protest? How, who is taking part? Here in this graph, we see that basically with the triangle, we have the rural area, with the, uh, the circle, we have the urban areas, so this is the share on the left side of people taking part to protest in 2019. We see that only in all countries, with the exception of Peru and the Dominican Republic, we have that people in urban areas are protesting more, quite more than in rural areas. So the first question that we made is, are urban and rural areas different? Yes, they are different. People in urban areas are taking part to protest much more than in the rural areas. So this weak middle class is frustrated, is trying to tell us something. The second question was, what are the drivers? So to do that, we use what is called a regression analysis, 
based on a multi-level model. I don't uh, uh, explain you the technicism because it's not the play this. So what we have is the protest. So the protest can be yes or no. We are using micro data, so individual data from a survey, from this survey. So the question is, are you protesting? Are you, did you take part of protest in 2019? Yes, no. And we correlate these binary variable with a set of other uh, variables, which are personal characteristics, sex, age, education, having children, ethnicity, economic and social characteristics, which are income, income trend. There is a question, very interesting question where it is asked, did your income improve or uh, uh, has been worsening, was worsening in the previous, compared to the previous two years? The having internet, crime, oh, sorry, a set of variables about the ideology. In, are you interested in politics? Do you have inter, in, uh, intention of my, to migrate? migrate? Uh, are you in favor of policy against inequality? And a, a, another set of variables on trust. Trust on president, media, justice, election, parliament, and peaceful uh, demonstration. So these are all the variables that could or could not explain uh, the fact that a person takes part to protest. So these are the uh, results. So how to read this graph? On the left side, we have uh, exactly these uh, covariates. We have uh, two, two parts. Here we have, uh, we run the model for the world sample only for Euro, uh, urban areas and only for, for rural areas. If uh, these uh, uh, lines are crossing uh, the dotted line in the, in the middle, it means uh, that uh, this variable is not having an, a role in explaining uh, the fact that a person is taking part to protest. So we see immediately that the, the sex, age, education are not uh, uh, having a role as well as having children. Otherwise we have that uh, the fact that uh, your income increased uh, is having an impact where in particular in rural areas more than because we have that this uh, um, square is more on the right uh, compared to the, the rural uh, to the urban and rural sample. So it's having an impact. Having uh, um, an income that uh, decreased has an impact also. Having an interest in politics has a very strong impact, in particular in urban areas, while in rural area has an impact, but a positive impact or increase the, the likelihood of taking part to protest, but to a less extent. So basically what do we have? We have some variables that are affecting the likelihood of taking part to protests in the same way in rural and urban areas other variables, other aspects that are different between the two areas. Among the, uh, the, the variables that are different, uh, we have in particular being interested in politics, trust in president. We, have, we see that in rural areas that do not make any effect, trust in media also, while uh, trust in election and Supreme Court, they do not play a role. Interestingly, we have also that the intention of migrate has an impact, increase the chance of taking part to protest in urban areas, while not in rural areas. So people living in urban areas are frustrated and who decide to migrate is prone to take part to protests. The ethnicity also, we see that there are differences in particular having being uh, take, uh, white has no impact in rural, in rural area, while is decreasing the probability of taking part to protest in urban areas. So there is a, a different social class behind it, if we want to read in this way. Having internet also has a role only in rural. I, I see, I see, I, I, I have one minute, I'm, I'm finishing. So, to sum up, uh, let's go directly to the conclusion. So first, 
elsewhere. There is a, a higher uh, participation to protest in urban rather than in rural areas. We have some variables that have an in, um, equal extent, in, equal effect in rural and urban areas, which are rising income, in ethnicity, interest in politics, politics, crime, etc. We have some other variables which have an impact only in rural areas: education, trust in public institution, intention to migrate. Sorry, it's um, not rural but urban here. Uh, while decreasing income is the only drivers which characterize uh, only rural areas. It is a mistake here. This is urban. What to do about that? One second. Policy aimed at strengthening the middle class in urban areas. How? Improving education levels, providing better job conditions, institutional quality, fighting inequality. So we have uh, institutional capacity building needs, institutional foresight capacity in particular. Furthermore, place-based policies, policies that avoid people to migrate from rural to urban areas, increasing the size of people with uh, uh, the, the inequality in urban areas. They are last but not least is about income. What increase the likelihood of uh, uh, protest, of uh, being taking part to protest, the income dynamics. So we have to account for the role of expectation. The expectation in disease common in Europe is what drives, that drives the discontent. It's not level, it's not how much rich you are, but the, it is how much rich you were and how much rich you think you will be that drives the this content. So and thank you. I finish here because my time is ended. Thank you, Nicola. I'm sure we will have more time in the question and answers uh, part of this session. Our next presentation is Barbara Guadalupe. Barbara, uh, no sé si puedes compartirnos tu pantalla. Hola, sí, claro. Gracias. Mm. Barbara comparte la pantalla. Eh, quería comentarles que tenemos un desfase de tiempo debido a la sesión anterior. Entonces, para esta sesión les pediría que nos pongan las, pues, las preguntas en el chat y así poderlas leer y aprovechar al máximo el, el tiempo remanente que vamos a tener, un poco más corto quizás, para preguntas y, y respuestas. Gracias. Ok, bueno, buenas tardes. Me gustaría confirmar si ya pueden ver mi pantalla, por favor. Sí, ya podemos. Okay. Muy bien, voy a apagar mi cámara para no tener algún error de conexión, ¿ok? Sí, problema, gracias. Sí, muy bien, buenas tardes a todos, espero que se encuentren muy bien. Keynes en 1937 decía que la dificultad no recae en adoptar nuevas ideas, sino en adoptar las viejas. Es por ello que el día de hoy vamos a abordar una de las estrategias institucionales más radicales para poder atender la crisis de COVID, por COVID-19 en América Latina y una de las peores crisis por las que está atravesando y es la crisis de la desigualdad. Es por ello que en este trabajo vamos a abordar COVID-19 en América Latina, una condena de la desigualdad. Para ello, Vamos a tomar tres secciones. Eh, la primera de ellas, vamos a tomar un desarrollo teórico en la cual vamos a buscar abordar el contexto actual del COVID-19 y de los efectos que está teniendo en América Latina. Más adelante vamos a definir en la segunda sección el ingreso básico universal en sus consideraciones prácticas y sobre todo vamos a desarrollar una estimación para poder desarrollarla. En la última sección vamos a desarrollar una discusión en la cual vamos a explorar la viabilidad de este ingreso y sobre todo vamos a emitir una recomendación sobre los elementos que deben acompañar a este mecanismo para que sea efectivo en América Latina. Para ello vamos a entender primero algunos de los elementos claves que muestran el declive para América Latina. Al menos a nivel económico podemos hablar de una caída del 9.1% del PIB de 2020. Esto quiere decir que 
América Latina mmm, presentaba anteriormente un crecimiento del 0.1% del PIB y esta combinación entre caídas y un crecimiento muy endeble le ha brindado a América Latina una estructura bastante frágil para poder desarrollar mecanismos de carácter económico, entre los que pueden implicar ayudas monetarias a la, a la población en general o el poder establecer otros mecanismos monetarios e institucionales para poder recuperarse más fácilmente. Es por ello que ante este espacio reducido, tanto económico como, para, como de otro aspecto, se era una recuperación de al menos 10 años para América Latina. Estas estimaciones son bastante preocupantes si nosotros ligamos las cifras que presentamos en materia de desigualdad en América Latina. Pues nuestra región ha sido caracterizada principalmente por ser de inequidades profundas. Esto quiere decir que una gran población está en pisos diferentes cuando llega la crisis y todas las personas están en una condición bastante complicada, unas más que otras. Y esto se puede expresar con la caída del 9.9% del PIB per cápita. Entonces, este nivel de las personas económico se reduce. Esa es una condición de vulnerabilidad. En segundo, vamos a tener una tasa de pobreza de 37.3% aproximadamente y una alza de hasta 8% en el coeficiente de Gini. Esto quiere decir que la pobreza y la desigualdad serán determinantes en la condición de recuperación para América Latina. De tal manera que la desigualdad va a adoptar y está adoptando ya actualmente de diferentes rostros y estas representatividades le han costado a América Latina ser una de las regiones más afectadas. Entre algunas de estas representaciones podemos hablar de la desigualdad de género, con más de un 70% de ocupación de las mujeres en sectores económicos vulnerables. Además, un 60% de la población o más está ocupada en sectores informales. Además, la población Actualmente que se encuentra en calidad de indígenas, también no ha sido, hasta este momento no ha sido abordada en ninguna de las políticas que se han planteado a nivel regional o dentro de las naciones. Este conjunto de vulnerabilidades y de dolores cometidos causados por la desigualdad nos ha llevado a afirmar que la pandemia llegó a, a, llegó como un amplificador de las desigualdades, pero las desigualdades también ha traído una amplificación de la pandemia, ya que al tener diferentes eslabones que tratar, las necesidades no se pueden cubrir adecuadamente, como ha ocurrido en la actualidad, ya que muchas de las políticas se han implementado de forma sesgada. Bajo este contexto en el cual hay una aversión a la participación social y hay una baja credibilidad en el gobierno, la necesidad de, de, para atender este desastre global se ha desencadenado directamente del curso de desarrollo como se ha establecido actualmente, pues ha sido caracterizado principalmente por un desarrollo de crecimiento secuencial en el que se ha seguido un argumento de primero crezco, reparo después, pero América Latina dadas a sus condiciones de desigualdad, ha visto no solamente sesgado el crecimiento, sino también la recuperación. Y que ahora en materia de la crisis por COVID-19 se vuelve uno de los elementos más preocupantes. Es por eso que actualmente el cambio del de, de curso de desarrollo ha ido orientado principalmente hacia la cooperación multilateral y la solidaridad a nivel regional. Esto quiere decir que las propuestas actualmente tienen un carácter radical en cuanto a lo que se ha establecido actualmente. El ingreso básico universal ha sido definido como una transferencia económica que satisface las necesidades básicas de las personas. Sin embargo, en esta investigación estamos centrados en abordarlo no solamente como un ingreso, sino también como una oportunidad de mejora de la calidad de vida. Y esto es porque la pobreza y la desigualdad ha traído para las personas que viven en Latinoamérica una desapropiación de sus decisiones y en muchos sentidos de sus derechos, ya que hay una gran cantidad de personas que durante toda la pandemia no han tenido la capacidad 
de trabajar desde sus hogares o no han tenido la oportunidad de poder tener un seguro médico u otras atenciones que deberían de ser vistas por las instituciones gubernamentales. Esta combinación entre vulnerabilidad institucional y social se ha convertido en una condena para América Latina. Es por ello que instituciones como la CEPAL han implementado propuestas como el ingreso de emergencia que se provee que cueste alrededor de un punto 52% del PIB regional. Esto es en sobremedida una cantidad muy adecuada en comparación con el 1.9% del PIB regional que se destina a otros programas asistencialistas o sociales que hay en la actualidad. Con esto es importante resaltar que no estamos buscando eliminar aquellos programas sociales que ya están en la actualidad, pues el ingreso se plantea como una propuesta directamente complementaria y sobre todo en relación directa con otras políticas implementadas, ya que en la actualidad muchos de los programas sociales que se han implementado para atender la pandemia se han desarrollado de forma aislada y esto ha causado una gran problemática pues no ha resuelto las necesidades de las personas en su totalidad. Para esto diversas instituciones se han, in, des, han desarrollado diferentes estimaciones. En este caso nosotros nos vamos a centrar la que está directamente enfocada en el registro poblacional si nosotros consideramos el salario mínimo vigente para 2020, tenemos un aproximado de 273 dólares con 47 centavos, lo que supone que con 117.33 dólares, de acuerdo con la CEPAL, una familia puede eh, vivir adecuadamente satisfaciendo las necesidades básicas. Si nosotros consideramos 629 millones de personas que viven actualmente en el territorio latinoamericano y lo dividimos por los 117 dólares, tenemos un aproximado del 2.01% del Producto Interno Bruto Regional. Y si lo comparamos con la cifra de 3.5% del PIB que aporta el, la recaudación fiscal, Llegamos a la conclusión de que la recaudación debe incrementarse para que se pueda alcanzar a cubrir el ingreso básico universal. Si nos damos cuenta, es un cálculo que nos habla de la viabilidad de su aplicación, pero también debemos de tomar en consideración que este, este, este mecanismo plantea una cooperación institucional y un acuerdo social en el cual las políticas no solamente nos comprometan a todos, sino que también nos beneficien a todos. Uno de los principales cuestionamientos que nosotros buscamos demostrar es que estamos en el momento adecuado para cambiar el rumbo de desarrollo que llevamos actualmente, que no nos ha traído los mejores resultados y de esta manera poder hacer un acuerdo institucional en el cual los mecanismos no se den de forma aislada y vayan acompañados de una capacidad de desarrollo social y sobre todo de construcción de un estado de bienestar y la buena gobernanza. Así que para concluir, nuestro, y nuestra investigación surge como un llamado a la cooperación global institucional en la que no solo el fin último no sea un, una mayor equidad, sino que el desarrollo se dé desde el inicio, desde origen, y así podamos alcanzar los objetivos esenciales de nuestro sistema y guiarnos hacia una recuperación sin precedentes como lo ha sido esta crisis. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Bárbara, y también gracias por estar dentro del tiempo. Uh, this was an interesting presentation about inequality and, uh, and the income of the families that I think has been exposed during the COVID crisis in Latin America. So thank you so much. A nuestra siguiente presentadora es Carla Rivera de la Universidad Católica de Chile. Eh, Carla, no sé si puedes compartirnos tu pantalla. ¿Está Carla? Eh, bueno, en ese caso iremos a la presentación de Héctor y Alberto. Al, um, Hector and Alberto, they're going to present about the enemy of foe, war or foe, Carl Smith's concepts of enemy, enmity in Amerindian revenge warfare, Tupinama and the Yanomami cases. Um, Alberto.
Carla or Alberto? Here? For Genisset? Sí, yo estoy aquí. Genesí estoy aquí, pero no sé, estaba esperando que me hicieran la, la entrada porque creo que en ese orden seguiría yo. ¿Me corrigen si estoy mal? Sí, tienes razón, Genesí, perdón. Hubo una... Sí, tranquila, ya, ya te iba a interrumpir para aclararlo. No hay ningún problema. Estoy aquí muy, muy atenta. Bueno, un saludo para todos. Un saludo, saludo caluroso, muy caluroso saludo desde, desde Medellín, donde me encuentro, en Colombia. Eh, arreglón seguido, me voy a permitir de menos unos segundos para compartir la pantalla. ¿Listo? Gracias, Genesis. Genesis is going to present about the COVID-19 and, and human rights in, um, in Colombia. ¿Me pueden confirmar, por favor, que estén viendo la pantalla? Sí, sí lo estamos viendo. Gracias, Genesis. Perfecto. Bueno, pues una presentación muy rápida sobre mí. Pues yo soy doctora en Derechos Humanos de la Universidad Pablo Olavide de Sevilla y pues en estos momentos soy docente investigadora acá en Medellín en el Tecnológico de Antioquia. Como ustedes pueden observar, mi presentación lleva por nombre la protección de los derechos humanos para personas afrodescendientes en el contexto del COVID-19. Ya de pronto eh, la que me antecedió con la palabra, eh, Bárbara, si mal no recuerdo, pues hizo una contextualización bastante importante y se acercó a cifras que pues evidentemente nos permiten evidenciar un poco pues todo este fenómeno, todo lo que está pasando con la pandemia desde algunos indicadores económicos y demás en el contexto de América Latina y el Caribe. Solo decir que mi ponencia muy puntualmente, aunque se refiere al COVID, pues no voy a puntualizar algunas cosas que yo creo que por cultura general pues, son obvias eh, en el sentido de que pues creo que es de conocimiento común y obvio lo que está sucediendo en el mundo en, en términos de esta pandemia, hay cosas que yo creo que son muy desconocidas aún cuando nosotros nos preguntamos qué ha pasado, quién generó el COVID, incluso surgen muchas teorías de la conspiración pues, que a veces genera pues, mucha confusión y pues yo diría que finalmente pues, no hay una única respuesta en general pues, a qué generó esta pandemia. Lo claro, lo que sí sabemos, digamos, como una noticia o información oficial que evidentemente la Organización Mundial de la Salud pues declaró todo esto que ha pasado como una emergencia sanitaria, sí, de orden global, de orden mundial, evidentemente. Pero en este contexto, y ahí es donde llama la atención mi presentación, es que históricamente hay grupos en el continente americano y en particular grupos étnicos, creo que Bárbara también hacía mención algo de, en este sentido, Grupos étnicos muy, muy particularmente, eh, y hablo de afrodescendientes y, e incluso no solamente los afrodescendientes, sino pueblos indígenas y tribales, pues que históricamente y de manera pues muy desafortunada y de la manera en que ha sido, digamos, eh, se ha desarrollado, extendido eh, cultural y políticamente América Latina y el Caribe desde la época de la conquista hasta nuestros días, pues no es ajeno saber que, pues, las comunidades étnicas, afrodescendientes, pueblos indígenas y tribales, pues hasta el día de hoy gozan de unos índices representativos en la región de pobreza y pobreza extrema. Si a esto le agregamos las consecuencias pues, derivadas del COVID, pues, este es el llamado principalmente eh, de estas reflexiones que quiero hacer con esta presentación. Entonces, tendría que empezar diciendo, por un lado, que el COVID está visibilizando problemas estructurales que están cobrando la vida de miles de personas. Tengo que aclarar que los efectos del COVID no es específico solamente para los grupos étnicos minoritarios que han sido tradicionalmente excluidos del poder hegemónico. Pues realmente es un efecto rebote que yo creo que ha tenido, creo no, ha tenido que ver con todos, con la vida de todos y cada uno de nosotros, en nuestros hogares, en nuestros trabajos, de cierta manera pues ha cambiado nuestra forma de ver el mundo en cierto sentido, sí, hemos tenido que reinventarnos, que finalmente ha terminado ser un poco como la palabra de moda en este, en este contexto. Pero hay que resaltar que el COVID ha servido para visibilizar o desentrañar pues, eh, estructuralmente muchas circunstancias que a veces quedan silenciadas y ocultadas, y es pensar, por ejemplo, cómo esos estándares mínimos de bienestar cuando hablamos de educación, salud, vivienda y, y pleno empleo, pues efectivamente no son garantizados. 
Cuando uno estudia, por ejemplo, dónde están localizadas geográficamente las comunidades afrodescendientes e incluso los pueblos indígenas y tribales, pues muy comúnmente pueden estar ubicados en las zonas costeras ¿sí? eh, de Latinoamérica y en algunas de estas zonas puede ocurrir que sean de las zonas más precarias en los diferentes países y en las ciudades y regiones que los conforman, ¿cierto? Acá en Colombia, por ejemplo, eh, la zona del Pacífico, para poner, eh, la región del Pacífico, para poner un ejemplo, eh, el departamento de La Guajira, que son dos, digamos, y dentro del Pacífico, el departamento del Chocó y el departamento de La Guajira, son dos departamentos que tienen una población muy importante de comunidades afrodescendientes y de pueblos indígenas y tribales. Ahora, son departamentos donde necesidades básicas tan vitales como, por ejemplo, el agua potable, el saneamiento básico, pues en época de normalidad, hablando de no COVID, pues ni siquiera se satisfacen, ¿sí? Pensar que hay comunidades, hay territorios donde ni siquiera algo tan elemental como las recomendaciones que normalmente hace eh, la Organización Mundial de la Salud, la, lavarse las manos constantemente con agua y jabón, tener alcohol, que son cosas tan básicas, pues evidentemente eh, no se tienen, porque pues, hay una ausencia, podríamos decir, parcialmente del Estado, a un Estado parcialmente inoperante que pues, en estado de normalidad ni siquiera ha podido llegar a, estas, a estos territorios, a estas comunidades y a estos pueblos. Entonces tendríamos que decir que el COVID pues, agrava realmente estas situaciones que pues, han sido visibilizadas muchas veces, pero en otras, digamos, un poco silenciadas, y, y entre ellas tendríamos que decir entonces que en este contexto, los grupos étnicos minoritarios padecen paralelamente también la discriminación racial como fenómeno estructural, la pobreza derivada de la exclusión social y los múltiples problemas derivados. ¿sí? Así pues, es un hecho comprobado que la pandemia genera impactos diferenciados e interseccionales sobre la realización efectiva de los DESCA. Y cuando me refiero a los DESCA, precisamente, son los derechos económicos, sociales, culturales y ambientales. En alguna oportunidad hace dos años, yo tuve la posibilidad de, de trabajar en un corto tiempo como consultora para la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos y la tarea puntual que se me encomendó era, digamos, hacer un rastreo sobre la situación de los DESCA, ¿sí? de los derechos económicos, sociales y culturales y ambientales para personas afrodescendientes en toda la región. Y evidentemente no solo porque lo digan los órganos interamericanos en el ámbito de la OEA, sino pues diferentes organismos internacionales, grupos de activistas, movimientos sociales, es un hecho cierto, y lo tengo que decir con toda certeza, que tenemos todavía, o estamos viviendo todavía en una época que tendríamos que decir, es postcolonial, ¿sí? Realmente todavía estos estudios neocoloniales nos están diciendo que hay muchas formas en las cuales el poder hegemónico, digamos, todavía está, está impuesto, y la, info, y la forma, digamos, de imponerse, es cuando nosotros nos preguntamos y por qué todavía las comunidades afrodescendientes y los pueblos indígenas y tribales siguen sobresaliendo entre los índices de pobreza y pobreza extrema. Digamos que un poco la respuesta estaría relacionada en este sentido. Podríamos decir entonces que el acceso y la protección a la salud junto con el saneamiento básico y el agua potable como derechos humanos de carácter esencial no se realizan plenamente con independencia de la aparición del COVID-19 y lo estoy diciendo muy particularmente en estos grupos poblacionales donde yo les digo que incluso investigaciones desde la CEPAL está suficientemente documentado de que realmente en, en la región ¿sí? viven en unas situaciones que pueden llegar a ser tan precarias que como yo les digo, estándares mínimos de bienestar tan básicos pues están carentes incluso cuando no estamos en una época, en una, en una época de pandemia. Así entonces, las dificultades visibilizadas en el acceso a los DESCAS, como la preexistencia de problemas con la infraestructura y la falta de personal de salud para atender las necesidades de la población agravadas por el COVID, destacan, entre otras cosas, los graves problemas no resueltos de las personas afrodescendientes, enmarcados principalmente en la pobreza o pobreza extrema, como en un inicio les decía, que perviven desafortunadamente gracias a la desigualdad social. Dicho esto, eh, tendríamos que decir eh, que no ha sido lo suficientemente contundente ¿sí? eh, los esfuerzos que se han tomado desde los diferentes ámbitos gubernamentales 
con políticas públicas entendidas estas como acciones, estrategias, planes y demás en, en sentido, digamos, amplio, que tenga a diferenciar, y cuando hablo de diferenciar desde, digamos, acciones afirmativas, acciones afirmativas, perdón, o medidas de discriminación positiva, ¿sí?, que tienda a realmente tratar estos grupos poblacionales de un modo diferente, pero introyectando realmente de manera efectiva rubros ¿sí? que se materialicen efectivamente en el avance de unos estándares mínimos de bienestar, que pues, desafortunadamente hoy nosotros podemos decir que pues, no, no son tal. Hay, hay una inoperancia entre lo que jurídicamente podríamos decir la teoría y la praxis del derecho entre el ser y el deber ser. Hay muchas buenas intenciones, ojo con lo que quiero decir, no digo que existan avances en la materia porque hay muchísimos avances, de hecho que existan unos amplios estándares internacionales, por ejemplo, el principio de igualdad y no discriminación que reconoce esta problemática y prohíbe a los estados y exige a los estados desarrollar medida en pro de solucionar esto. Eh, el hecho de que exista, pues digamos, son avances importantes y los distintos gobiernos pues han tomado medidas. No obstante, el llamado con esta ponencia es decir que todavía, digamos, faltan muchísimas, pero muchísimas cosas por hacer, ¿sí? Digamos que a lo anterior se suma la obligación de garantizar los derechos de, de comunidades étnicas, no, no solo, digamos, eh, yo en este momento, mi contexto en el que yo me muevo es Colombia, pero casi que los estándares internacionales, como lo decía también en un, en un comienzo, órganos y organismos internacionales, en esta materia son coincidentes en decir que es un fenómeno realmente que está arraigado eh, pues en gran parte de América Latina y el Caribe, ¿sí? Entonces, podríamos decir que falta todavía la adopción e implementación de políticas de salubridad, eh, la destinación de rubros económicos específicos para cubrir las necesidades básicas insatisfechas de los integrantes de diversos grupos étnicos y pues ahora... Con el COVID-19, eh, el llamado sería a intentar eh, desde los diferentes eh, entes gubernamentales, esferas donde nosotros de pronto tenemos cierta influencia eh, desde el ámbito académico, desde, la, desde el ámbito, no sé, llamémoslo desde los movimientos sociales, desde el activismo, entendiendo los derechos humanos desde abajo, desde esas teorías epistemológicas que autores, por ejemplo, como Aventura de Sousa, Aventura Escobar, Colombiano, no sé, entender esas epistemologías del sur, que evidentemente por eso es que estamos aquí debatiendo todas estas particularidades, ¿sí? intentar reivindicar todas estas situaciones y hacer unas exigencias que ojalá terminen en un futuro no muy lejano en la construcción, la adopción e implementación de políticas públicas de inclusión social que garanticen efectivamente la defensa y, salvo, y salvaguardia de esos derechos en unos grupos que han sido histórica y tradicionalmente excluido y que pese a la realidad pues encontramos todavía un poder hegemónico eh, que controla y domina y que pues los mismos grupos históricamente eh, subyugados pues siguen siendo digamos estando en el mismo terreno digamos que estas eran las reflexiones que les quería compartir eh, muchas gracias no sé si hay de pronto alguna observación comentario Muchas gracias, Genesis. Vamos a tener los comentarios al final de todas las presentaciones. Por favor, pon, si pueden ir posteando sus preguntas en el chat. Veo que ya hay algunas y que Nicola ya, ya está contestando, pero de todas maneras las vamos a revisar en conjunto al final de la sesión. Nuestra Perfecto, gracias. Gracias, Genesis. Uh, nuestra siguiente presentadora es Carla. Carla, no te escuchamos. ¿Ahora? Sí, ahora sí. Perdón, la lamento. Hola a todas y a todos. ¿Comparto la pantalla? Sí, por favor, Carla. ¿Ahí se ve bien? Sí, perfecto. Perfecto. Por favor. Bueno, eh, muchas gracias por la invitación. Eh, mi nombre es Carla Rivera, eh, soy uruguaya y les quería comentar sobre las evidencias de cambios institucionales articuladas por la Organización Estudiantil de Posgrado, la cual lideré durante 2018, 2019 y 2020 como 
presidenta del, de un, del gremio de estudiantes de posgrado, en la universidad donde estoy haciendo mi doctorado, que es la Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. Entonces, contarles brevemente cómo es que nace esta organización, incluso antes que yo fuera estudiante, eh, que se llama CADEPUC, que es el Consejo Académico de Estudiantes de Posgrado, y surge bajo la necesidad de que exista una voz plural, unitaria y representativa de los estudiantes de posgrado, no solo ante la institución educativa, que sería la católica, sino que también ante otras instituciones, como por ejemplo las que financian eh, las becas, que son instituciones del Estado. Eh, ¿Qué es CADEPUC? ¿Qué es este, esta organización gremial universitaria? Es un espacio de acción participativo abierto, plural y democrático que lo que tiene como objetivo es promover justamente la, la organización para construir una comunidad, eh, una comunidad de posgrado en la Universidad Católica. La manera que tiene CADEPUC de, de trabajar es levantar información, diagnosticarla, sistematizarla a través de, de catastros y encuestas, y de esa manera eh, trabajar en conjunto con, con las autoridades eh, de, de los posgrados para poder eh, tomar decisiones basadas en evidencia. Por ejemplo, el año pasado, en 2020, en el primer semestre se realizó un catastro para conocer la situación de los estudiantes eh, dada la, la pandemia. También se han hecho catastros no solamente para situaciones coyunturales, eh, sino que también catastros para levantar información en general. En, como un proceso de sistematización justamente. Hay, han habido catastros o encuestas de relación estudiante y tutor, o sobre la situación de las de poblaciones más vulnerables, como pueden ser los, las madres y los padres, o eh, los estudiantes internacionales. Particularmente, a partir ya del año de octubre de 2019, eh, Chile viene viviendo un, un periodo bastante complejo, eh, con el estallido social que ocurrió justamente a partir de, que, de un descontento eh, por parte de la sociedad, dado que existe mucha desigualdad social, ambiental, y eh, en octubre ocurre este estallido, y ahí se, hasta el día de hoy está este descontento, este estallido, y en marzo aparece la pandemia, en la cual ambas, ambos contextos empiezan a generar un montón de consecuencias en el desarrollo, por decirlo así, normal de, de un programa de doctorado. Estas consecuencias, eh, a, a grandes rasgos, eh, son, por ejemplo, afectaron el acceso a las instalaciones eh, durante el estallido social. Eh, ya desde octubre del 2019, eh, varios campus donde está la, la universidad eran lugares epicentro de, de las movilizaciones, de las marchas. Entonces la universidad cerraba sus puertas, no se podía acceder a las oficinas, a los laboratorios, a las bibliotecas. Entonces ya el acceso se empezó a restringir incluso previo a, a, a la pandemia. Eh, eso generó atrasos en el desarrollo de las tesis, eh, porque la gente, los estudiantes no podían ir a, a hacer sus, sus experimentos, por ejemplo, o analizar sus datos. Eh, incluso ya en, en periodo de estallido social, y ni que hablar en la, durante la pandemia, eh, también se limitó, hubieron limitaciones para viajar dentro de Chile, y bueno, la pandemia también fue fuera de Chile, eh, lo que impidió, por ejemplo, el realizar pasantías, que es un requisito de graduación que tiene la universidad en los programas de doctorado. En, también afectó eh, la carga académica. Durante el estallido hubo un paro que duró un mes en, a nivel de posgrado, entonces se tuvieron que recalendarizar cursos eh, y eso generó cargas, mayores cargas académicas. En, entonces, con poca flexibilización, lo cual, por ejemplo, puede, o sea, perjudicó a, por ejemplo, a las, que, a las personas que son madres y padres, que a su vez tenían que cuidar a sus hijos porque los tenían en casa, dado que las escuelas y los jardines ya habían cerrado durante el estallido, incluso previo a la pandemia. Entonces, todo eso generó, generaron problemas en, en el desarrollo normal y de, regular de, de, las, de los programas, eh, los extranjeros también tuvieron problemas eh, a nivel de, por ejemplo, sus eh, visados, retrasos, lo cual les traía problemas en, también asociados a estar pendiente de eso y, y no generar eh, 
no quedar como ilegales. Eh, bueno, y durante obviamente la, el estallido social, el, la relación con, entre estudiantes y tutores también se vio afectada porque hubo que rela empezar a relacionarse a distancia, lo cual se prolongó durante la pandemia. Eh, y eso muchas veces perjudicaba al estudiante porque los empezaron a ver como ausencias por parte de los tutores de manera virtual. Eh, y ni que hablar de a nivel económico que ya desde el estallido eh, muchos estudiantes se vieron perjudicados en, en la, poder acceder a, a becas o, o sus trabajos. Eh, eso se, se vio más agravado durante, durante la pandemia también. Eh, por ejemplo, acá les quería mostrar en, esa, en ese catastro que se realizó en primer semestre de 2020 sobre las distintas dimensiones que los estudiantes se sintieron más afectados en relación a, a la situación eh, pandemia, estallido social, y las principales dimensiones es la parte académica, pero también la parte emocional eh, se estaba viendo muy afectada. Eso obviamente tiene varias repercusiones, por ejemplo, en la parte salud mental, o en la parte del desarrollo regular de la tesis. Entonces, ¿cómo, cómo CADEPUC, este, esta organización, logró gestionar en parte esta cris, estas crisis que se venían ya desde el año 2019? Bueno, lo hizo en dos niveles. Uno interno, a nivel de la institución, de la católica, y otro a nivel nacional. Entonces, a nivel interno, eh, fuimos eh, voceros de propuestas y necesidades que, que recabamos a partir de los catastros y de, de asambleas eh, y de cabildos, este, que se hicieron con los estudiantes. Y a nivel nacional, lo que se creó fue un, una red de centros de estudiantes de posgrado de las distintas universidades que hay en Chile. Por ejemplo, la Universidad de Chile, la Universidad Católica, la Universidad de Santiago, la Universidad de Austral. Entonces, los distintos representantes estudiantiles de las distintas universidades nos agrupamos de manera colectiva para llevar soluciones, eh, propuestas y también levantar datos a distintas agencias, en este caso de, relacionadas con el financiamiento eh, a nivel de posgrado y también con la toma de decisión a nivel de más de educación. Entonces íbamos a, a la Agencia Nacional de Investigación y Desarrollo, que es, son los que financian las becas, y al Ministerio de Ciencia y Tecnología, que son los que toman las decisiones, los planes de, eh, de educación, por ejemplo. Entonces, a nivel interno, a nivel de la institución, de la UC, eh, se lograron flexibilizar requisitos de graduación. Como les contaba, por ejemplo, un requisito que se tenía, que se tiene en realidad, es el realizar una pasantía en el exterior, pero el año pasado eso fue casi, fue muy, muy poco posible, fueron muy pocos los estudiantes que pudieron hacerlo, entonces al final lo que se logró fue con, justificándola debidamente, se, ese requisito se, se elimina se quita. Eh, también eh, se logró eh, que hubiese un reajuste en, el, en las tesis y por lo tanto rever, junto con los tutores y los comités de evaluadores, los objetivos planteados, a ver si se podían cambiar o achicar, etc. Y también eh, logramos eh, generar un apoyo económico no solo a nivel de, de becas para estudiantes que, que se quedaron sin recursos, sino que también apoyo económico en, con, con este, en, a través de computadoras o de bolsas de datos de, de internet. Porque como pasó a ser todo virtual, en, muchos estudiantes no tenían necesariamente internet en sus casas. Entonces se logró también generar ese tipo de, de apoyos. Un minuto. También, sí, gracias. Por par, a nivel nacional, como les contaba, se crea este Centro de Estudiantes e Investigadores de posgrado Y bueno, el, logramos llevar eh, propuestas en, sobre, a nivel nacional sobre la situación que estaban teniendo los estudiantes, no solo a nivel finan, financiamiento, sino de, también emocional, afectivo y académico. Entonces, un poco como para reflexión, es que la organización estaría generando estos espacios de encuentro comunes eh, de manera, a través de la participación activa, 
y logra articular actores, no solo los estudiantes, la institución propia de la universidad, sino que también externos, como los, los entes financiadores. Entonces, esta, esta vocería que nosotros llevamos con propuestas y necesidades sirve para orientar políticas basadas en evidencia y también proponer gestión a largo plazo. Y me gustaría cerrar con esta, esta reflexión sobre que las instancias de representación eh, no se limitan a demandas puntuales en tiempos de contingencia, sino que deben constituirse como espacios permanentes que permitan articular una identidad colectiva por el bienestar común. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Carla. Eh, pasamos brevemente a nuestra última presentación, Alberto. Gracias, Alberto. Hola. ¿Podrías compartir tu pantalla, por favor? Sí. ¿Listo? Listo. Okay. Well, my name is uh, Alberto Montoya. I am a researcher from Sao Paulo State University, but doing my postdoctoral research here at the University of Calgary under supervision of Professor Pablo Polixer here at the university, but back in Brazil under supervision of Professor Hector Luis St. Pierre. And I am presenting here part of our research held by our group, uh, GEDIS, the Group for Studies on Defense and Security from our university and it's part as well of my research during my PhD. So it, it's a contrast between Carl Schmitt's concepts on enmity and warfare and by contrasting with the Tupinamba case. So by uh, the abstract that we have submit, we also put the Yanomami population, but considering the time here from the presentation and for the sake of not being Uh, too long on the exposition, we just are focusing on the Tupinamba case. So the presentation will bring about four different uh, topics. So first, why to study Amerindian warfare from an uh, international relations perspective, because my formation is uh, on IR and my uh, department and uh, NASP is also on IR. Second, to highlight some Carl Schmitt's ideas on enmity and politics, because they are quite influential in mainstream Uh, theories of international relations, some uh, highlights on the Tupinamba case and possible inputs from this case to rethink political science and particularly international relations uh, on, when it comes to study warfare and conflicts. So the first thing is uh, why study Amerindian warfare uh, from a IR perspective? And this is, will shift how do you frame international relations main subject. So from my department approach, uh, rather than be only the interstate warfare, uh, interstate relations and warfare, we rather consider IR as the science of war and peace. Therefore, we are able to study warfare and cultural manifestations of, war, of warfare uh, without being uh, hostages to political morphologies such as the state. So for us, international relations do not begin with the uh, a uh, piece of Westphalia and like the arise of the nation states. We can study warfare into medieval times or even ancient Greece, because uh, this is the main approach towards IR as we understand. So to study Amerindian warfare, it's also important because it helps us to shed light into some colonial warfares and they are pretty much within uh, the birth of the modern state in Europe. And usually in IR, people are studying uh, intra-European warfare, sometimes disregarding how those states expanded themselves within Americans uh, by dissolving international systems or rather being said uh, intertribal systems from the native populations here in, uh, in our continent. And in this particular case, as would highlight the, the Tupinamba case, it's important because they shift some alliances. So for instance, a Tupiniquin group were allied with the Portuguese, while the Tupinamba allied themselves with the French. So they are entangled as well in the set of alliances and geopolitics of the colonial powers. And this is uh, quite important to understand what happened uh, in history. So, and the last point is to Uh, understand different cultural forms and functions of enmity and warfare as the scholars from the New Wars debate have pointed out since the beginning of the 90s from the area on strategic studies and international relations. 
So the importance of Carl Schmitt's remark on enmity and politics is uh, quite strong within IR and strategic studies, precisely within the tradition of uh, realism or neo-realist analysis of international affairs. And the main point from this is that, as Schmitt pointed out, uh, the main node of further political relation in institutions uh, departs from a duality between the group of friends and the group of enemies. So in international relations, to understand who is your enemy and who are your friends and how you should engage in relation towards these different groups is quite important, is the crucial uh, aspect from the dilemma of security, so to speak. So Carl Schmitt bring about the necessity when dealing with enmities to differentiate among different types of enmity, not only from an international approach, but also from a domestic approach as well. So he brings uh, from Greco-Roman uh, contexts uh, a division of two kinds of enmity. One, it's the private enemy uh, called as well as inimicus. And this inimicus is different from what we would call in international relations, the external public enemy or the hostess. So what is the difference between those two types of enemy? Well, they do share the same uh, trait because they are enemies, they are not our friends, but the inimicus is a domestic enemy. So it's an enemy within our society. And at least theoretically, we should combat those enemies by law and by police. Whereas we are talking about enmity in international relations, we are talking about hostess, uh, the concept of hostess, and those enemies are not combated by law, but rather they are combated by warfare. So uh, the hostess is a public enemy that is bestowed as such by a sovereign authority. They are not our personal private enemies. So we stand into a, a different ground with this form of enmity and therefore the possibilities to conflict and reconciliation. So let's shift now to taking those ideas from Carl Schmitt and contrast with the Tupinamba case. And why the Tupinamba case? Well, first, because when considering uh, Amerindian populations and societies in South America lowlands, uh, the Tupinamba case is very much a paramount case of warfare being driven by revenge, uh, ideals rather than by geopolitical causes. So from the sake of this presentation, I'm taking the Tupinamba case very much as a Weberian ideal type because it will help to highlight the main aspects of this different kind of warfare when compared to modern state uh, kinds of warfare. So the Tupinamba society were the inhabitants of the Brazilian shores when the Europeans arrived here in the 16th century, particularly Portuguese, Spanish, and French as well. And they were members of the, in the broader speaking, from the Tupi-Guarani cultural and linguistical matrices. So they are two uh, interrelated cultural matrices. They share like very much the same uh, language and a lot of religion and mythological beliefs as well. So usually scholars would refer to them as a, 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 in a broader sense as the same group, but in fact, they are quite different when examined in a more detailed aspect. So Tupi Guarani culture or tribes are spread across nine different South American countries. They are present in uh, Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Peru, Paraguay, Uruguay, and in French, Guyana and Suriname as well although in a lesser extent. So it's a hugely influential uh, cultural Amerindian matrix and the Tupinamba, it's a member of this uh, culture. So regarding its warfare and revenge, it's important to understand that when the Europeans came to this <laughs> continent, I'm sorry, my dog is just barking. Uh, they are already enemies of the Tupinambi, uh, the Tupini kings, another uh, tribe and society within the Tupi-Guarani uh, Tupi culture, but they allies themselves with the Portuguese. And the Tupinamba, when they knew about it, they allied themselves with the French. So those colonial powers are using as well the intertribal local system and set of alliances and enmities to try to bring about their geopolitical interests in Americas. And in particular case from the French approach, 
they attempted at least two times to occupy lands that nowadays are um, but, uh, Brazil and within two different projects. So the first would be the France Antarctic. They, they try to conquer, which nowadays is the city of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil and the Guanabara base. And later on, they try to occupy, they occupy by trying to uh, became uh, like permanent occupation on now, uh, where nowadays is the state of Maranhão in north part of Brazil as a part of the France Equinoctial uh, project. So from the Tupinambi, uh, the Tupinikins, the Tupinamba warfare was very much a seasonal activity. So they have specific periods of time during the year and uh, during the year and seasons to uh, engage into warfare. So it was not like all year long. And the weaponry were quite specific. They, they did not have any kind of metal work. So they usually uh, use wooden bows and clubs as instruments of warfare. The objective of warfare was pretty much an act of revenge on other groups caused by insults or more particularly by homicides committed by enemies. So uh, the aim of those warfares to enact revenge was to capture a few prisoners that later on would be sacrificed in rituals, okay, religious rites. One minute, Andrew. Okay, so this state of warfare endured like from uh, almost 200 years, but one major point was the Tamoyos Confederation where the Tupinamba, backed by the French, built a alliance of other tribes and went pretty much into a total war against the Portuguese, but unfortunately they were uh, defeated and later on, diseases like smallpox also tall the population of the Tupinamba. And therefore, by the end of the 17th century, the tribe were virtually terminated, except by a few remaining remnants where nowadays is the south parts of the Bahia state. So by examining the Tupinamba warfare, we could uh, rethink some of the canon ideas uh, in place in political science and by particularly our IR as well. So the main point was for us that warfare it appears not to be a continuation of politics, but rather a continuation of religion, because the aim was to capture a few prisoners to be sacrificed when, uh, within uh, religious rights rather than a political objective. So the Shemitian kinds of enmities like the private and the public enmities are completely misplaced and inaccurate to analyze those warfare because from the Tupinamba, the enemy for different rights, it's at the same time private, but also public. So it seems to be a blurred uh, border between these two concepts. And finally, geopolitics uh, seems not to be like uh, the main driver of warfare, but rather an outcome of the revenging sick uh, forms of warfare from this population. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alberto. Um, so Solo tenemos 10 minutos desafortunadamente para las preguntas y respuestas, así es que voy a, a tomar dos. Este bloque es, eh, ha sido titulado Knowledge Mobilization, Movilización del Conocimiento. Eh, y bueno, contamos con cinco presentaciones. Eh, inicialmente eso es lo que estaba planificado, lamentablemente Verónica eh, no podrá juntarse en este momento, es muy probable que se junte después debido a problemas de salud. Y también eh, lamentamos que Cielo Gordillo tampoco pueda presentar también por cuestiones familiares. Entonces, bueno, empecemos. Eh, en este caso iniciaríamos con el grupo de Mónica Clavijo Romero. Y lo que haré en este caso es eh, compartir el video que prepararon de su presentación. Entonces, nuevamente, bienvenidas y bienvenidos. ¿Pueden ver mi pantalla? En esta presentación compartimos nuestras experiencias como un grupo de estudiantes de posgrado de diversas disciplinas que incluyen ciencias sociales y naturales, con quienes estamos investigando sobre gobernanza ambiental y servicios ecosistémicos en el marco de nuestro proyecto, que se centra en la incorporación de conocimiento local y tradicional con perspectiva transdisciplinaria. Somos un equipo de colegas geográficamente disperso. 
por lo cual cada uno ha contribuido con entendimientos únicos y diversos en este proyecto colaborativo con el que venimos documentando tres casos de estudio en América del Sur, más concreta en, concretamente en Colombia, Chile y Uruguay, contando con la participación también de actores y colegas de Estados Unidos, Canadá y Nueva Zelanda. Nuestras actividades incluyen toma de datos en campo, recopilación y revisión de literatura y análisis en coordinación con supervisores de diferentes instituciones y disciplinas en los países participantes. En nuestros casos de estudio trabajamos con actores y comunidades locales con el propósito de identificar la, con, la constelación de condiciones y procesos participativos a través de los cuales emergen distintas modalidades de gobernanza, facilitando la incorporación de conocimientos locales y tradicionales que permiten navegar en intereses divergentes y en diversos sistemas de valores. Los tres estudios de caso abordan iniciativas de gobernanza ambiental y conservación de la biodiversidad que operan a nivel de cuenca hidrográfica con grandes diferencias entre sí a nivel de escalas espaciales y poblacionales, así como también en contextos culturales y políticos diferentes. Sin embargo, los tres casos comparten y presentan desafíos muy similares en relación con la integridad de la, eh, la integración perdón, de pluralidad de valores, el manejo de conflictos y la, reso la resolución de asimetrías de poder entre los actores involucrados. En este proyecto trabajamos desde el enfoque de ciencias de la sostenibilidad, que explora las relaciones dinámicas entre la naturaleza y la sociedad, para gestionar las causas de la crisis socioecológica actual y promover nuevos caminos para la transición hacia la sostenibilidad. Desde esta perspectiva, nos centramos en el concepto de gobernanza ambiental como el conjunto de mecanismos, sistemas y procesos mediante los cuales los actores políticos ejercen influencia en las acciones y resultados ambientales. La gobernanza es dinámica e incluye una gran variedad y diversidad de instituciones y actores sociales que interactúan entre sí en diferentes contextos y escalas espaciales. La toma de decisiones es función de cómo los individuos humanos, las organizaciones, las tradiciones o las reglas interactúan en un sistema socioecológico. Además, las iniciativas políticas y científicas que promueven la colaboración transdisciplinaria y las interacciones sinérgicas entre científicos y otros productores y usuarios de conocimiento dan cuenta de mejores resultados en las políticas y la práctica para las ciencias de la sostenibilidad. La coproducción de conocimientos en este enfoque se basa en la acción, la experiencia y la reflexión conjunta de los, de los participantes involucrados. Ahora bien, en el contexto de la transdisciplina, las comunidades de práctica son sistemas dinámicos de relaciones en las que un grupo de personas interactúa, experimenta, discute y aprende en torno a un interés común. Las comunidades de práctica no solo son adecuadas para la producción de conocimiento, sino que ofrecen una oportunidad para el aprendizaje conjunto, mediante la participación sostenida de sus integrantes. Esta producción de conocimiento en la ciencia de la sostenibilidad está cada vez más orientada a generar impactos más amplios, que traduzcan los resultados de la investigación en políticas y prácticas para lograr fines particulares. Para esto buscamos generar, promover lo que Tumi y colaboradores llaman espacios de investigación e implementación. Este concepto implica trascender el modelo mental que tenemos internalizado, representado en la figura A del esquema, donde la ciencia se concibe como un actor externo a la sociedad, que recibe de ella el planteo de problemas y ofrece soluciones para que los actores y los tomadores de decisión los implementen de acuerdo a sus posibilidades y conocimientos. En contraste, el modelo de espacios de investigación e implementación, presentado en la figura B, plantea la coexistencia y la interacción entre la investigación y la acción en conservación, concibiendo a la ciencia como un actor más dentro de la sociedad, que coexiste y dialoga con otro tipo de actores y otro tipo de conocimientos para construir conjuntamente los problemas y las soluciones, así como también la experiencia de llevarlas a cabo. Bueno, en sintonía con esta perspectiva, nuestro y colaboradores proponen cuatro principios generales que contribuyen a una coproducción de calidad de conocimiento para abordar asuntos complejos de sostenibilidad. Queremos hoy compartir con ustedes algunas reflexiones que hemos eh, hecho sobre nuestro trabajo a la luz de estos cuatro conceptos que propone Nordstrom, analizando principalmente los desafíos que identificamos en relación a la experiencia que tenemos transitada hasta el momento, señalando principalmente las limitaciones que encontramos y las estrategias que empleamos para superarlas. En primer lugar, los autores plantean que la coproducción de conocimiento tiene que basarse en el contexto, es decir, considerarse y ubicarse dentro de los contextos sociales, económicos y ecológicos particulares en los que se inserta el proyecto y adecuarse a estas características. 
Durante nuestro trabajo nosotros observamos en este sentido diferencias culturales, lingüísticas, conceptuales, así como algunas barreras tecnológicas para la comunicación, y para intentar superar estas limitaciones utilizamos diferentes plataformas digitales, mantuvimos permanentemente el bilingüismo, incorporamos marcos disciplinares y diferentes aproximaciones transdisciplinarias en las zonas de estudio. En segundo lugar, los autores plantean que la coproducción de conocimiento tiene que ser pluralista, lo cual implica eh, reconocer explícitamente las múltiples formas que hay de conocer y de hacer. Y en ese sentido nosotros observamos como limitaciones para la coproducción de conocimiento eh, todo el complejo de relaciones de poder que se dan dentro de los trabajos de investigación de cada caso y entre los casos de estudio de nuestro proyecto también. Así como también la necesidad de construir confianza entre los integrantes de la comunidad de práctica y para poder superar estas limitaciones eh, nos organizamos de una forma descentralizada, menos jerarquizada, en forma de red y buscamos estimular de forma permanente la autonomía y la creatividad de todos los integrantes de la comunidad de práctica. En tercer lugar, los autores plantean que la coproducción de conocimiento tiene que estar orientada a objetivos. En nuestro trabajo observamos como limitación la existencia de una gran diversidad de enfoques y de temas de investigación, con muchas alternativas para el abordaje, encontrando dificultades para poder definir y delimitar bien los temas que íbamos a tratar. Para superar estas limitaciones, bueno, nos enfocamos en los objetivos y los temas que ya identificamos como transversales y comunes a todos los casos, los cuales sabemos que son significativos porque fueron definidos de forma colectiva y conjunta. Para esto trabajamos conjuntamente con las comunidades de los casos de estudio y mantuvimos un feedback permanente entre los investigadores y estudiantes integrantes de la comunidad de práctica. Este, por último, los autores postulan que la coproducción de conocimiento de calidad tiene que ser interactiva. Y bueno, en ese sentido, en nuestro trabajo encontramos limitaciones más que nada asociadas a, a los tiempos, sobre todo la diferencia de tiempo entre el cronograma del proyecto y el ritmo de aprendizaje que va teniendo la comunidad de práctica, porque pudimos constatar que las negociaciones, los procesos que se dan dentro de una comunidad de práctica requieren un poco más de tiempo que en los proyectos tradicionales. Eh, esto eh, ocurre, por ejemplo, asociado a la construcción de intereses y definiciones compartidos y comunes, así como también el tener que incluir perspectivas o intereses que no son inherentes a las disciplinas individuales o intereses que provienen de otros actores involucrados. Y para superar estas limitaciones, lo que hicimos fue desarrollar un proceso iterativo con los investigadores expertos, así como también discusiones abiertas entre los estudiantes y el resto del equipo para poder resolver estos desvíos en el cronograma que se daban y reenfocarnos en los objetivos y los asuntos importantes y comunes, transversales, este, a, a todo el proyecto. Este, constatamos también que las discusiones nutridas entre diferentes epistemologías y experiencias de vida, permiten atender mucho mejor la complejidad propia de los problemas de gobernanza que tratamos en los diferentes casos de estudio. Bueno, por último, como consideraciones finales, queremos mencionar que la estrategia de organizarnos como comunidad de práctica nos permite actuar como una bisagra para la coproducción y la movilización de conocimiento con las comunidades en cada caso de estudio. Sin embargo, consideramos que tenemos que explorar estrategias para reconocer la autoría de las investigaciones, especialmente eh, respecto a los aportes de las comunidades de las zonas de estudio. Y para finalizar, queremos mencionar que como comunidad de práctica hemos podido explorar y abordar limitaciones y fortalezas también de los diferentes marcos teóricos que empleamos, lo que nos permitió acercar visiones provenientes de diversas áreas de las ciencias naturales y de las ciencias sociales, como puede ser la educación, la economía, la geografía, entre otras, trascendiendo de esta manera las barreras disciplinares, pero más importante aún creemos que fue la posibilidad de generar articulaciones y nuevos conocimientos incorporando los saberes y las experiencias locales. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Danilo, 
unmute. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias, Chelsea, también. Excelente presentación, clarísimo. Y ahora podemos tal vez pasar a David. Sí. Eh, si estamos presentes, si sí, David Labástida, por favor, de la Universidad de Toronto. No sé si puedes compartir tú mi... Sí, ahorita comparto. Sí. Casi se me va. No hay ahora, problema. Déjame tener a listo, abierto aquí, Carl. Ok. Yo te voy indicando. Por favor. Quitar esto. Esta es, ¿verdad? Esa es, así es. Muy bien. Te voy a poner a bit more. ¿Es así? Sí. Excelente. Ok, muchas gracias. Bienvenidos. Muchas gracias. Bueno, eh, este es el título de mi presentación, La ciencia de Karl Martius en Brasil. Concepción de naturalistas, imperialismo informal y pensamiento de archivos. Si quieres, puedes pasar a la otra. Este, y bueno, prácticamente mi presentación es un estudio histórico del, del quehacer botánico de, de, de este alemán, Karl von Martius y sus paradigmas científicos de reproducción de conocimiento que se mostraron durante su expedición al Brasil en 1817. Eh, bueno, en mi opinión, la mejor idea que resume el pensamiento científico de Martius, eh, creo yo, es la siguiente, y voy a citar directamente. Eh, abro comillas para comprender lo general, lo eterno, la suma de todo lo que une todas las particularidades. El erudito tendría que entregarse a lo que considera eterno dentro de sí mismo, es decir, confiar en su natura que o lo que se conoce como sentimiento de la naturaleza en español. Y bueno, esto es un extracto de, de su correspondencia con otro naturalista, eh, von Spix, eh, en mayo de 1825. Entonces, bueno, eh, inspirado por el movimiento de la natura filosofía o la filosofía de la naturaleza, eh, creo yo que, bueno, Martius desarrolló una visión organicista del, del cosmos y en la cual el hombre y la naturaleza se encontraban en una relación mutuamente constitutiva, tanto en el plano material como espiritual. Y bueno, para Martius la naturaleza solo podía estudiarse por medio de métodos holísticos y por medio de un empirismo que implicara el empleo de, de todos los cinco sentidos, incluyendo los sentimientos y el espíritu. Y bueno, creo que es de notar que sus conocimientos botánicos adquiridos en Brasil dependieron eh, de dos modos de reproducción de conocimiento. Por un lado, la palabra escrita, y por otro lado, las representaciones visuales. Pero en sí esto equivaldría a un pensamiento de archivo o archivístico. Y bueno, mi argumento recalca que estas tecnologías eh, epistemológicas no solo fungieron como objetos de transmisión de conocimiento o eran un mero reflejo del pensamiento de Martius, sino que actuaron como um, sujetos históricos que generaban múltiples realidades, pero que eran contradictorias, múltiples realidades sobre la, natu la naturaleza en Brasil. Y bueno, por un lado había una realidad cosificadora e imperialista, por otro lado, una reali realidad reivindicadora de la naturaleza. Sin embargo, eh, es precisamente este mismo pensamiento archivístico el que fijó límites al quehacer científico imperialista de Martius, quien buscaba representar la realidad en su conjunto y una realidad pues, que está en constante movimiento. Si quieres pasar a la otra, por favor. Este... Bueno, y bueno, cabe destacar que Martius viajó a Brasil como como un enviado del reino de Bavaria, pero el carácter imperialista de su actividad uh, creo yo se debe más a las narrativas de sus escritos que a su calidad o su estatus como agente estatal o imperial. Sus textos y representaciones visuales, vaya, ciertamente sí intentaron construir una realidad dinámica, exótica y atractiva de la naturaleza en Brasil, pero estos tendían a presentar a los grupos indígenas de Brasil, por ejemplo, y a la biosfera brasileña como parte de una misma unidad natural y esencialista. Y estos archivos hasta incluso tendían a demarcar una geografía mundial racial, diferenciada entre lo que él denominaba Natua Fulca, o los pueblos salvajes, y Cultua Fulca, los pueblos civilizados que bueno, era una narrativa común de la clase científica de los territorios alemanes. Como se observa en la imagen, Martius recrea un panorama fantástico y utópico de la naturaleza brasileña, en la cual dos observadores europeos 
se aproximan a su objeto de estudio. Eh, y bueno, se puede ver que tanto la fauna exacerbada, eh, los árboles fantásticos y los grupos indígenas uh, que los presentaban como infantilizados de Brasil, pues representaban toda una unidad de objetos naturales, eran eh, una cosa misma, parte de la naturaleza. Por otra parte, tal como se muestra en la cita, a los textos de Martius tendían a crear una realidad utilitarista y mercantilista de la naturaleza al servicio y dependiente del ser humano. Y aquí rápidamente un extracto de la cita, bueno, vemos en ella refiriéndose a la naturaleza, él refiriéndose al hombre o al ser humano, eh, representó la obra más maravillosa de su creación en la tierra como norma y ley. Se destaca por encima de todo y de todo y hacia él como el modelo más noble todas las figuras se abren paso. Entonces, bueno, este extracto uh, construye un carácter funcional de la, de la naturaleza y bueno, pues el propósito de esta naturaleza uh, aparece supeditada a un orden natural jerárquico en el cual el hombre... Um, pues domina sobre la tierra, lo cual pues corresponde hasta cierto punto con, con su ideolo ideología cristiana que él, que él poseía. Si puedes pasar a la siguiente diapositiva, por favor. Um, entonces, en contraste, estos archivos también configuraron realidades que atribuían voluntad y autonomía a la naturaleza brasileña. Uh, son numerosos los textos en los que la naturaleza aparece como un ente autorregenerador y autocreador. Estos textos le otorgan a las plantas brasileñas eh, una memoria tanto eh, histórica, intrínseca e insertada en la genética de cada espécimen vegetal. Una memoria que uh, adquiere peso e influencia sobre las culturas humanas en un marco transnacional y transtemporal. Entonces, bueno, en otras palabras, eh, estos textos historizan a la naturaleza brasileña como actor de una historia global desde el principio de los tiempos en el, y en la cita que, que aparece ahí pues se puede ver, la voy a citar, la tierra donde nuestros archivos más antiguos albergan a la humanidad, Siria es la tierra de este útil árbol y me, a la palmera datilera, me voy a saltar, ahí vemos a las primeras personas rodeadas de palmeras, cuyos abundantes frutos alimentaron a sus antepasados agra agradecidos a los dioses. La palma se convierte en el símbolo de la eterna juventud, esa ingeniosa doctrina del sexo y el amor en Brasil. Uh, en las flores ya estaba relacionada con la palma en la antigüedad. Entonces, pues es muy evidente la influencia de la filosofía de la naturaleza eh, en, en estos textos de Martius, incluso en otro texto que él eh, escribió, Frey a Apolonio, él este, tiene una referencia similar, aquí la tengo de hecho, aquí la naturaleza tan exuberante se superpone a la historia, no le, a la historia humana, no le permite reclamar sus derechos y el hombre se encuentra despojado de su dignidad y relevancia histórica. Entonces, pues vemos que también estos archivos eh, presentan una visión un poco contraria a, a, la, a lo que había expuesto anteriormente y también le designan a la naturaleza pues eh, cierta emancipación de los intereses humanos. Ah, y si puedes pasar a la siguiente, por favor. Como tercer punto, es imprescindible uh, mencionar los límites que se presentaron hacia la labor botánica de Martius, quien seguía los lineamientos epistemológicos europeos para conquistar la naturaleza. Por un lado, eh, se puede observar en la imagen la representación de una planta de flor eh, llamada la Fridericia, y, lo, y en la otra, este, un tipo de palmera que se llamaba Manica, Manicaria uh, sacifera. Y Aquí se muestran representaciones botánicas arte, arquetípicas, es decir, tipos ideales, producto de la comparación y observación eh, de varios ejemplares del mismo espécimen botánico. Pero el problema con esta técnica de representación era que no capturaba las particularidades o malformaciones de los distintos ejemplares de la misma especie, sino que uh, se usaban prototipos de plantas cuyas características eran estandarizadas para el estudio y teorización botánica. Y bueno, por esto surge mi pregunta. Bueno, ¿cómo podía estudiarse con precisión por medio de una um, representación de estandarizada a cada planta que solo podía comprenderse en su comunión con una biosfera constantemente cambiante? 
y esta técnica pues solo se limitaba a una gramática visual, ignorando el conocimiento que solo podía adquirirse con la experiencia vivida y el contacto con la naturaleza de Brasil. Ahora, en segundo lugar, el sistema de clasificación escrito y de descripción de, eh, tan particularista de los elementos de cada planta de Martius no lograban capturar en su totalidad el conocimiento que las emociones humanas solo podían eh, obtener por medio de un lenguaje afectivo, según Martius. Entonces, en la siguiente cita, por ejemplo, se puede ver a una planta que está, está siendo estudiada eh, por Martius y se aprecia la limitación de una descripción que si bien era exhaustiva de las propiedades naturales de esa planta, creo que estaba acotada por el lenguaje textual. Por ende, creo que las técnicas de producción y clasificación de, de conocimiento de Martius se regían bajo parámetros archivísticos que limitaban las, los alcances de su labor imperialista de domesticación del conocimiento botánico. Eh, el conocimiento vaya um, adquirido por medio de una experiencia vivida con la naturaleza se diluía al traducirse en un archivo botánico cuya forma de producción de conocimiento dependía de un sistema de significadores que no lograban bueno, expresar fielmente el lenguaje de las emociones, las, las sensaciones o el espíritu, dimensiones de conocimiento que el mismo Martius planteó, eh, planteó como importantes. Entonces, la ciencia botánica de Martius enfrentaba una contradicción de principios epistemológicos, ya que consideraba que la naturaleza poseía una... Un minuto más. Espiritual. Sí, ya voy a acabar. O, o invisible, que solo se podía velocidad por medio del contacto con el espíritu humano, pero... ¿Cómo Martius se podía aproximar a una naturaleza que es contingente, cambiante, evolutiva, irrepetible y dinámica? Esa es la, la, la pregunta. Entonces, eh, bueno, aquí prácticamente vemos que el, estos textos presentaban dos realidades contradictorias y pues además se, estaban muy limitados para poder comprender la naturaleza como, como Martius mismo la, 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 la contemplaba como cambiante y holística. Gracias. Excelente, David. Muchísimas gracias. Um, ok. Gracias. Ahí tengo algún, un par de preguntas para ti, David. Felicitaciones. Eh, ahora podemos pasar eh, a, a Carla Rivera, Carlita. Qué gusto tenerte acá nuevamente. Y um, el espacio es totalmente tuyo. Muchas gracias, Danilo. Voy a compartir la pantalla. Por favor. Eh, bueno, en esta presentación les quería mostrar una experiencia de actividad académica transformadora, lo que fue el primer seminario interdisciplinar crítico latinoamericano que organizamos con un grupo de ocho estudiantes de doctorado de la Pontificia Universidad Católica en octubre de 2020. En, para contarle un poco cómo es que surge esta idea de este seminario, les, los quería contextualizar un poco, o sea, a nivel regional en Latinoamérica, las últimas décadas se han venido experimentando periodos de conflictividad socioambiental, que ha desencadenado en diversos estallidos sociales, particularmente los últimos como el de Ecuador, el de Chile, eh, eran producto de estos descontentos sociales eh, por la desigualdad que había, la inestabilidad política y económica o la crisis de confianza en las instituciones y tomadores de decisión. Eh, en este contexto de estallido social, particularmente en Chile, lo que les mostré anteriormente, CADEPUC, esta organización de estudiantes de posgrado, eh, fue un espacio de encuentro donde los estudiantes eh, pudieron eh, de diversas maneras eh, manifestarse en este descontento social. Justamente porque CADEPUC es, es un espacio de encuentro que la idea es promover la organización gremial para construir esta, esta comunidad eh, y también para formar identidad en intereses comunes y objetivos colectivos. Entonces, a partir de, de asambleas, de cabildos, de reuniones, eh, se trató de visibilizar eh, las necesidades, las demandas eh, de los estudiantes hacia la institución por parte de eh, los voceros de CADEPU. Eh, y de esta manera, eh, en, en esas asambleas, en esas discusiones, eh, 
surge la idea de crear eh, el CICLA, este seminario, en, a, porque a través de la interpelación, la discusión y la problematización de distintos aspectos, eh, los estudiantes nos dimos cuenta de que existe una hiperespecialización académica, aparte de un academicismo gremial apolítico y una cultura del papercentrismo. Entonces, eh, lo que surge es esta pregunta de, estas preguntas de cómo, dónde y para qué hacer ciencia en América Latina, que esa fue el, como decirlo así, el mantra de, eh, del, del CICLA. Entonces, les quería mostrar lo que había sido el resultado, los resultados de este seminario, que como les contaba, eran tres días. Eh, acá están algunos de los afiches que eran para recibir los resúmenes. Eh, estas son las, metas, las mesas temáticas que se propusieron eh, para poder abordar las distintas problemáticas que encontramos a través de la discusión, la problematización y la interpelación. Eh, y previo al ciclo, lo que realizamos es justamente en un contexto de pandemia, donde pasamos de pensar al, al seminario como, de pensarlo en, de manera de organización como algo presencial, algo virtual, en, y lo veníamos organizando ya desde marzo, dijimos, bueno, hagamos un ciclo de conversatorios para promover justamente la, la participación en, de las personas que se animen a enviar resúmenes, que, que quieran formar parte de esta discusión. Hicimos cuatro conversatorios que también estaban relacionados con las temáticas de, del CICLA, en las cuales tuvieron muy buena aceptación, por ejemplo, conflicto eh, científico perdón, conocimiento científico técnico en los ambientales, o el tema de las emociones, o los pueblos originarios y academia, el caso Mapuche, o el conocimiento experto lo y local. Eh, entonces, eh, estas, estos conversatorios ayudaron en, a que la gente pudiera, se animara a participar y enviar sus resúmenes, teniendo más de 2.500 reproducciones en algunos de ellos. Y bueno, y el CICLA eh, empezó en octubre, fueron tres días, en las distintas mesas temáticas se pueden ver, en, están en el canal de YouTube que, del propio seminario. Este, en, y bueno, estos son algunos de los resultados. Se, recibimos 63 ponencias con 73 autores y coautores. Eh, cada mesa tenía un, un académico o académica invitado para generar y, discusión. En acá lo que muestro son en una nube de palabras, de las palabras claves de los resúmenes que recibimos, donde se puede apreciar que está ciencia, academia, derechos, en como grandes tópicos. En, luego, este, este gráfico muestra cómo las distintas mesas temáticas tenían, o sea, tenían distintas disciplinas. Por ejemplo, en la ciencia desde abajo tenía disciplinas como antropología, historia, economía, biología, geografía, derecho, comunicación. Entonces, abordar, llegaron resúmenes que abordan 15 disciplinas de distintos países latinoamericanos, de México, Colombia, Perú, Brasil, Uruguay, Chile, Argentina. Y llegamos a un otro objetivo que tenía el ciclo, que era la, la paridad de género. Este, entonces, como como desafíos que encontramos a, en este seminario, de, desde la organización hasta la realización y luego de que terminamos, eh, primero que nada eh, nos enfrentamos a un desafío digital en el que cuando empezamos a pensarlo, eh, está, no estábamos en un contexto de pandemia, entonces lo pensábamos de manera presencial. Eh, y luego se nos vino el tema de hacerlo, tener que hacerlo eh, digital, virtual, entonces, ¿cómo convocar a distancia? ¿No? El desafío de convocar a distancia para que la gente se anime a presentar en sus reflexiones. Además de que era un proyecto nuevo, esto es que era la primera vez que se hacía, que surge desde un, una pequeña burbuja, que es, son estudiantes de una universidad en Chile, entonces era un gran desafío también llegar a toda Latinoamérica. También teníamos el desafío, como les dice, jerarquía de género, que lo conseguimos, el cual eso eh, requirió eh, buscar de manera eh, puntual eh, las, a las personas para que se animaran a, a, a presentar. 
eh, no teníamos necesariamente un apoyo institucional, no había apoyo especial en la, en la católica lo, lo, de la universidad, perdón, eh, lo conseguimos a medida que se fue armando, por lo tanto eso también fue un, un desafío, mostrar el interés eh, de hacer este tipo de proyectos. Eh, bueno, llegar a, a toda Latinoamérica, eh, y además se llegó a otros países porque eran, en este caso, chilenos que estaban haciendo sus posgrados fuera de Chile. Entonces estaban en Alemania, o en España, o en Estados Unidos, eh, o en Reino Unido. Entonces también llegamos a otros países, pero eran siempre eh, personas latinoamericanas. Y también un, un gran desafío que, que no, capaz que no se consiguió del todo porque en algunas mesas no se logró generar esta interdisciplina fue justamente llegar este, a un diálogo común en, entre todos los participantes. Eh, porque a veces los, las ponencias eran, eran muy diversas o muy distintas y claro, eh, no sé, a veces no, sé, no fluía tan bien el, el diálogo entre los participantes. Entonces, como reflexiones sobre la construcción de conocimiento, eh, que era lo que quería promover un poco el cuestionar cómo construimos conocimiento en América Latina, este, este seminario. Eh, bueno, la necesidad que existan este tipo de, de encuentros, nosotros realizamos un, un catastro, al final una encuesta de satisfacción, eh, y le preguntamos distintos aspectos a las personas, y varios decían que, que, está, que les había gustado que existiera este tipo de encuentros, como el que estamos, en el que estamos ahora. Este, eh, también el, el tema de la interdisciplinariedad, ¿no? el de que capaz que la manera de abordarlo, abordarlo no es a través de tópicos puntuales como nosotros planteamos las, las mesas temáticas, sino de grandes preguntas generales, para así, de esa manera poder desarrollar más el diálogo interdisciplinar y romper con la barrera de a veces los lenguajes que hay entre, no sé, la biología y la historia. En, que también sea crítico, entonces, eh, pudo, el, el CICLA logró problematizar la manera en que nosotros hacemos ciencia, ¿no? nuestras propias prácticas y métodos de investigación. En no pensar en, en, por ejemplo, tener que ir a estudiar necesariamente afuera porque no está lo que nosotros consideramos que deberíamos aprender, sino que darle más relevancia e importancia eh, a, a la academia en, en nuestros países. Y también... Eh, que es eh, desarrollar también la, las, la ciencia en, en la región de manera colaborativa. Entonces, eh, simplemente quería dejarles una, como una pregunta, eh, como para la discusión de cómo, cómo hacer para poder construir una comunidad académica interdisciplinar y transformadora en, en América Latina. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias a ti, Carlita. Excelente presentación. Eh, tenemos varias preguntas en el chat. Déjenme confirmar si tal vez llegará Verónica. Bueno, podríamos empezar tomando algunas preguntas y si Verónica se suma, le damos espacio. ¿Les parece? Entonces, eh, eh, ven mi pantalla al momento. ¿Se ve la pantalla, sí? Sí, muy bien. Eh, y entonces yo eh, puedo ir dándole eh, para la siguiente página sin tener que, que pedírtelo, Danilo. Sí, me pedirías y yo voy cambiando con todo. Okay. Bueno, uh -huh. eh, buenas tardes. Eh, muchas gracias por su atención. Yo les voy a compartir un poco sobre la crianza maya de las abejas sin aguijón y el megaproyecto del Tren Maya en la península de Yucatán, en México. La siguiente, Danilo, gracias. Um, bueno, esta es una abeja melipona bechey, o como la llaman los, los, los mayas, es una abeja shunanka. Esta abeja ha sido eh, sagrada de manera milenaria en la cultura maya. México eh, reporta la existencia de al menos 46 especies de abejas nativas agrupadas en, en 16 géneros, de los cuales el mayor índice se encuentra en, los, en la parte sureste del país de México y en la península de Yucatán. 
La crianza amaya de las abejas sin aguijón es una práctica antigua que persiste en la actualidad y está intrínsecamente vinculada a las viviendas mayas, a la diversidad de sus cultivos y el bosque tropical nativo de la península de Yucatán. Este legado eh, representa bueno, un equilibrio vital interdependiente entre las normas culturales y la biodiversidad local que ha definido la configuración del paisaje en esta región durante al menos 2.500 años. En, en la siguiente, gracias. Eh, y bueno, sí hay fuentes históricas y arqueológicas que, que nos hablan eh, sobre esta relación ancestral de las abejas con el pueblo maya. Eh, el Códice de Madrid y los libros proféticos del Chilán Balán registran descripciones de esta práctica sagrada y de esta importancia que, que ha sido religiosa, administrativa, sanadora, comercial, incluso las abejas nativas están asociadas en la cosmovisión maya al origen del universo y, y son descritas como guardianes de la vida junto con hombres de árboles, de flores, de animales, de fuerzas naturales y de plantas. Asimismo, bueno, existe constancia eh, de algunas eh, bajo relieves o alto relieves en las fachadas de los templos, por ejemplo, en Tulum, en Cozumel, en Cobán, en, las, en los monumentos arqueológicos, en las pirámides de, de la civilización maya, donde se pueden ver representaciones de, como de seres alados en forma descendente que se les ha atribuido, bueno, pues, eh, eh, seres alados o las abejas, ¿no? Aquí en la parte superior derecha podemos ver un colmenar que, que bueno, esto tiene aproximadamente unos 100 años en, en Chetumal y, y, bueno, antes había colmenares verdaderamente eh, extensos, eh, con muchos jobones. Los jobones son estos troncos ahuecados en la parte interior, guardan las colmenas de las abejas donde han sido domesticadas pues, por, por las comunidades malas. La siguiente. Eh, en esta crianza eh, ha sido relacionada bueno, pues, con la agricultura y con la configuración de las ciudades, como les comentaba. Eh, los colmenares fueron integrados a los patrones de asentamiento de las ciudades eh, por medio de eh, unas eh, conformaciones de, de albarradas que son como muros bajos de piedras que fueron conformando solares y espacios de este, jardines eh, y de cultivo. Los, estos sistemas fueron tecnologías que se usaron como para delimitar diversas zonas cultivables y recintos de, de reservorio de especies importantes en, en, en la selva. Y, eh, eh, y bueno, los antiguos mayas construyeron ciudades utilizando este tipo de agrourbanismo como una estrategia para brindar seguridad alimentaria desde sus hogares. El diseño de las ciudades mayas son eh, con huertos en sus solares, que son sus traspatios. Eh, fueron realmente ciudades verdes en las que eh, a, había una gran actividad agrícola y había una intensificación de los cultivos eh, gracias a la domesticación y la crianza de sus abejas nativas, ¿no? Un segundito, Verónica, por favor, parece que está un micrófono encendido, si nos pueden ayudar eh, apagándolo, sería buenísimo. La, la siguiente. Gracias, Osvaldo. Gracias, eh, Bueno, sí, eh, eh, en, en esta imagen, bueno, podemos ver cómo es el habitar tradicional eh, contemporáneo maya. O sea, todavía tienen grandes es, es, espacios, grandes extensiones de zonas rurales en la península de Yucatán, en donde se conserva la, la ancestral eh, eh, casa maya, que este, encierra un cúmulo de saberes porque pues están... Eh, construidas con plantas nativas de la región y en donde eh, tiene lugar la crianza de estas abejas, eh, que, que no puede ser entendida como una práctica productiva únicamente separada, es un, es un sistema 
junto con su milpa y estrategias agrícolas que representan pues una forma de vida, una forma de habitar sus territorios en distintas escalas, ¿no? Los, los, las, tradiciones, las, tradicionales, perdón, las tradicionales casas mayas, así como las casas de las abejas, que son también, tienen un espacio importante dentro del, del solar, tienen eh, también su, su, sus techos de guano, de palma, eh, se les llama ágil cap, eh, pues también es, es un sistema que está orientado hacia los los puntos cardinales de una forma escalar en, en, su, en su propia cosmovisión, ¿no? Y, y bueno, eh, lo conjugaron con sus sistemas agrícolas, que, que fue la siembra del maíz y, y de la triada, que es con el frijol y la calabaza, eh, en una técnica que, 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 se llamó, que se llama rosa tumba y quema, que ayuda a regenerar las áreas de tierra provocando una etapa sucesional en la flora, que es clave como fuente de alimento para las abejas sin aguijón en diferentes estaciones, a pesar de las sequías en la península de Yucatán, el, eh, la siembra de la milpa del maíz, que también es sagrado porque los mayas son seres de maíz. Eh, eh, de alguna manera, bueno, también el polen de la milpa eh, en tiempos de sequía eh, apoya a la alimentación de las abejas nativas, ¿no? Entonces es un sistema eh, completamente interdependiente y, y pues recíproco, ¿no? Siguiente, gracias, Danilo. Eh, la crianza, ah, ah, y bueno, en, en, este, en este marco, en este panorama, en este contexto, en la península de Yucatán, actual no me encanta, ya tenemos vastas extensiones eh, eh, de poblaciones rurales ¿no? que todavía eh, guardan una identidad en su territorio y que hablan su lengua maya, es una población altamente indígena. Eh, pues bueno, el, el actual gobierno mexicano ha suscitado pues, un fuerte debate en la opinión nacional y también internacional al impulsar el megaproyecto de un tren eh, pues con el discurso de fortalecer la industria turística y de beneficiar a las comunidades de la región, la construcción de este proyecto ferroviario implicaría una reorganización territorial que incluye la creación de nuevas ciudades e innumerables megaproyectos de infraestructura pues para darle soporte, ¿no? En desacuerdo, las comunidades mayas, hay diversos grupos este, de la sociedad civil, de la academia, científicos, que oponen resistencia a este megaproyecto. Y, y pues la promesa es el progreso, es el bienestar, son eh, los miles de empleos que supone eh, eh, el proyecto, este megaproyecto junto con otros megaproyectos que le van a dar soporte eh, en una, pues eh, eh, con, con, con sueldos y, y pues con jornales que finalmente pues no es lo que quieren todas la, las comunidades, ¿verdad? Este, este Tren Maya está dividido en tres tramos, que es el Golfo, el Caribe y la Selva, y es como una soga que, que va a rodear toda la península de Yucatán. De acuerdo con la página oficial del proyecto, eh, la ruta del tren va a recorrer cinco estados del sureste de México y contempla 19 estaciones y 12 paraderos. En estas estaciones se establecerán 19 polos, de desarrollo, así lo llama Fonatur, que es el Fondo Nacional de Turismo, y también eh, haciendo equipo con ONU Habitat, para sorpresa de, de nosotros aquí en México, ¿no? Este, ONU Habitat también está participando en la organización de las comunidades para imponer este proyecto, porque no es un proyecto que responde a las necesidades de las comunidades de abajo hacia arriba, sino que pues es un proyecto que, que está gestionado de manera, eh, pues con muchas empresas y con muchos intereses transnacionales, ¿no? Estas nueve, en, en la imagen de la derecha pueden ver eh, la, la zona de influencia que va a tener cada una de las estaciones eh, circundando pues toda la península de Yucatán, atravesando... Eh, áreas de, este, naturales protegidas, eh, pasos de corredores, este, el corredor mesoamericano con infinidad de especies que están en peligro de extinción y que, bueno, finalmente van a cambiar rotundamente la forma de vida 
que actualmente tienen no nada más las comunidades mayas que, que, que pues hablan su lengua y que están viviendo en una ruralidad, este, sino que, que también eh, todas las personas que están ahí eh, pues eh, van a cambiar su forma de vida, la naturaleza se va a ver completamente mermada y este, por supuesto que, que va a, a, a tener un impacto muy fuerte eh, porque también pretende, es un proyecto geoestratégico en el que pretende ser como una retención a la migración que viene de eh, Latinoamérica hacia Estados Unidos y Canadá. Entonces, pues... Eh, los impactos de este proyecto es que pues finalmente no nace de las comunidades, económicamente viene a destruir un sistema de trabajo comunitario porque va a impactar rotundamente la forma de organización comunitaria y social de las comunidades mayas. Va un minuto a... más, Verónica. ¿Perdón? Nos queda un minuto, por favor. Oh, Dios, lo voy a decir más rápido. Eh, sí, entonces la siguiente. Eh, y bueno, quiero mostrarles aquí en, en esta imagen pues que... Eh, el, la, la ruta del tren, la vía del tren en la imagen de la derecha eh, va a atravesar casi 1500 eh, centros arqueológicos que, que muchos de ellos no están este, realmente estudiados ¿no? y va a haber una deforestación eh, muy impactante eh, con estos polos de desarrollo la siguiente eh, no nada más eso sino que ya en la península hay otros proyectos que han eh, impactado eh, como la soya transgénica que ha matado eh, con el uso del glifosato una cantidad eh, de colmenas y de abejas en la península de Yucatán, el crecimiento urbano desmedido en algunas de las ciudades como es en Mérida también ha venido a cambiar eh, la forma de vida rural y el eh, impactado en la naturaleza eh, en la región. La siguiente. Eh, este... Este, esta forma de cultivar de agronegocios y de agricultura industrial, pues ha impactado no nada más en la península de Yucatán, bueno, también globalmente hay un declive en las especies, en la biodiversidad de las abejas, por alteraciones al glifosato junto con una infinidad de agroquímicos pesticidas que están dañando el comportamiento de las abejas y obviamente su crianza se ve mermada. La siguiente. Eh, este es, eh, en la parte norte de la península de Yucatán hay proyectos de granjas porcícolas que envenenan los mantos de aguas dulces eh, de la zona, eh, los proyectos de gobierno están tratando de modificar debajo de sus programas, en sus programas de gobierno distintas lógicas eh, de reforestación que no van junto con las necesidades y ni con las regiones de los, de los pueblos. ¿no? La siguiente. Y bueno, esto también implica, eh, hay muchas organizaciones que están tratando de hacer un, un papel de, de conservación, sin embargo, hay muchas organizaciones que se han aprovechado y han realizado biopiratería también a la, a la crianza de las abejas nativas, han, le han dado un enfoque completamente comercial a, a la crianza que ha eh, cambiado de manera sustancial pues la, la esencia de lo que es la crianza de las abejas nativas. La siguiente. Sin embargo, bueno, pues hay este, distintos eh, creadores de abejas que tratan de guardar sus costumbres, que tratan de luchar por eh, su identidad, por una autonomía, por una autodeterminación también de su identidad y por supuesto que quieren conservar su territorio no quieren vender sus tierras y quieren eh, pues, eh, ir en contra, están completamente en contra de este cambio, de esta imposición, de este megaproyecto. Por último, este, pues, preocupa el retroceso hacia prácticas autoritarias y discursos pues, que invisibilizan las voces de las comunidades del pueblo maya y un racismo que es un problema estructural que no permite aceptar otras formas de habitar y de entender eh, las formas de vida la grave emergencia que tenemos ahora con el COVID-19 nos muestra la vulnerabilidad humana y el contexto de esta pandemia pues acentúa los desafíos y nos, nos señala también pues prioridades, aunque para muchos parecen invisibles, eh, eh, que si no ponemos al centro la biodiversidad y, y, y un sistema que sea distinto al paradigma capitalista, ecocida, eh, eh, 
deberíamos adoptar una producción social de nuestro hábitat de una manera verdaderamente sustentable y en democracia participativa, retomando pues valores de respeto y reciprocidad como los valores que nos ha mostrado el pueblo maya y sus sagradas abejas en su resistencia. Muchas gracias. Me fui muy rápido, perdón. Muchísimas gracias, Verónica. Entonces, ¿cómo estamos de tiempo? Creo que tenemos un espacio para una pregunta para Verónica. Y con el... And, um, just to start out, this section is block five. Uh, it's named Sociopolitical Dynamics. Um, and then I'll start out by briefly introducing myself and then going over some of the ground rules. It's going to be very much the same way as the previous session. So for those who have been here a bit longer, um, they already know the procedure, but just in case anybody has just joined, um, I'll go over it uh, anyways. So my name is Ricardo Barbosa. I'm a master's student at the Department of Geography um, at the University of Calgary. Um, I thank the organizers for inviting me to moderate this session. Um, I'm very happy to see this event put together, especially with these high quality papers and to keep um, you know, Latin American thought and study alive at the University of Calgary um, is very important to me. Um, especially since it's an event uh, that is not only bilingual, but trilingual, so that's also uh, very good to see. Um, as I've been speaking in English, I will continue to do so throughout this uh, session, and I am uh, native from Brazil, so I speak uh, Portuguese, not Spanish, but I'll try to pronounce the names um, as best as possible. Um, so to briefly go over the ground rules, each presenter will have 10 minutes, uh, one minute before their time is up, so at the nine minute mark, I'll send a message at the chat. And then uh, once the 10 minutes is up, I will um, intervene audibly so that uh, they know that they'll have to stop. Um, and I will try to enforce this uh, as best as possible. We have a very tight um, time frame, and it's also the last session. So we want to see if we can stick to this um, as best as we can. Um, before each presentation, I will re read out the speaker's name and also their affiliation. Um, and this will also give the time for the next person um, to, to prepare their slides and to project them. Um, at the end of the presentations, we'll have a Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions, please send them in the chat and I'll try to organize that as best as possible within the time frame. Um, I also have some questions prepared here if, uh, if I have a chance to ask them um, and that will be it. We are a few minutes ahead, should I um, present the first speaker or shall we wait for the 30 minute mark? I think we can get started. I see Jocelyn here, so I think it would be great. Yeah, very good. Uh, so the first presenter is Jocelyn uh, Segovia um, the, from the University of Cuenca in Ecuador, uh, Nicola Pantoroyo uh, from the University of Verisca in Italy, and Mercy Orlana from the University of Cuenca in Ecuador. Uh, their paper is titled Discontent with Democracy in Latin America. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'll start. Should I already start or are we going to wait? I didn't. Please do. Start. Okay. okay. So thank you, Ricardo, for the introduction. Um, I am Jocelyn Segovia, and I'll be presenting presenting this work titled Discontent with Democracy in Latin America. This is a joint work with Nicola Pontarolo and Mercy Orellana. We all work at the Regional Economics Research Group at the University of Cuenca. Um, so a few, well, one remark I want to make before starting is that our focus on this research is a very general one. We are approaching Latin America as a whole despite its, its many um, heterogeneous characteristics. And we are going to talk about um, discontent with democracy, all right? So um, what is the motivation for our work? Um, I would say the source of inspiration is 2019. Why 2019? Um, in this virtual uh, recess, I was listening, you were talking about uh, this protest and all the social movements that there were happening in Chile. But we know that around the whole, the whole world, there were many social protests. So um, 2019 was appointed as a year horrible for, the, for democracy. Um, many scholars and institutions said that democracy was going through a democratic, through a recession, I'm sorry, through a crisis. So um, we are going to try to see this 
um, in Latin America. Latin America was the region among the whole world that was mostly um, impacted by protests uh, from countries with really thriving economies to those countries that are not so thriving economically or politically. Um, so it really had a regional character. Um, to try to know what really is happening in terms of democracy, we looked at two indicators of democracy. The first one is, um, in particular, satisfaction with democracy. Um, and what we see when we look at this indicator is that satisfaction with democracy in Latin America is the lowest uh, in the world. We also looked at the second indicator that is developed by the Economist Intelligence Unit. And this indicator of democracy as well, um, it compiles many variables and it evaluates many dimensions. Well, not many, but five. And this indicator also tells us that democracy is uh, at its worst state in Latin America during 2019. So, we definitely are seeing that something is going on with democracy. We are seeing that people are not satisfied. We are seeing people in the streets and we want to know why from a very general point of view. Um, so a general explanation for this is that there is growing social discontent with, with the political status and with the political class in general and also with the status quo. Um, so one of the first aims that we have in this research is to try to look for um, what were authors and institutions saying about what was happening. After looking for that, we also wanted to gather all of that information and then evaluate it um, with uh, quantitative methods. Um, so we identified at least three narratives. The first two are, we categorize them as the major uh, categories of why um, this content is being experienced across the region. The first is political and institutional factors. I will later detail what type of factors are in this category. Um, we also see that another major category is when we talk about inequalities. And I say it in plural because um, we are talking not only about income inequality, but also other type of inequalities, such as inequality of opportunity, that is very, very high in Latin America. And uh, on the third point, what we have is a category that is, um, I think it's a little more scattered, but it, um, it includes stuff like expectations. And when we talk about expectations, we talk about um, a larger middle class in Latin America that is uh, expecting better, better, better situations, um, better behavior from their political class and so on. Also, there is the economic outlook, which is always important for, for people, especially if we are talking about a region where 30% where of people are, uh, are below the poverty line. So economic outlook is definitely important. And then another important element is public safety. What we see here in this first figure is um, satisfaction with democracy for a period of eight of 10 years, I'm sorry. What we see is that in 2008, six out of 10 people were not satisfied with democracy. And this has grown um, in that period to 70% of people not being satisfied with how democracy is working and with its outcomes. Um, what is the methodology we are going to follow? So we will base uh, our strategy as I said, on a quantitative method, we will do with, with it um, a regression approach where we have the dependent variable, which says there is content, and this content will be represented by satisfaction with democracy. As we see, this is an interesting and important variable of what is happening in the region. Um, this variable has four values. Basically, four says not at all satisfied with democracy, and one says I am very satisfied with democracy. In this regression analysis, we will have two types of variables um, as regressors, 
um, we see in, in the X vector individual variables, and we have a Z vector with national or contextual variables. Um, we identify four main categories of potential drivers or factors that affect this content. Um, social demographic variables, socioeconomic variables, institutional variables, and contextual variables. This definition is, of course, based on our that literature review, and as I mentioned previously, on all these narratives, minor or major. Um, our data at the individual level is taken from Latino Barometer for the year of 2008, and we also have some data from the World Bank as well as the World Inequality Lab. Um, jumping right into our results, I'll show our results by each of these categories I just defined. Um, here we have social demographic variables, here we have socioeconomic, institutional, and contextual variables. So, what is the way to read these results? We will see that um, we have four columns, and um, this is just for a matter of robustness checks. We are going to base our analysis on the fourth column. Um, we have several social demographic variables. How are we going to read this? We can see it has different signs. Um, a positive sign on the value means that it increases this content with democracy and a negative, the contrary, right? Um, also, we need to see all the variables where there is an asterisk, which means that it is a, a statistically significant variable, with, which take us to say that that variable is important for this content with democracy. So, looking at this first table, we can say we have no many um, important list from a statistical point of view, and uh, not many important variables that determine the social discontent. However, when we look at these social economic variables, we, said, we see that most of them, if not almost all of them, have uh, statistical significance, right? Um, the, um, so, what a first conclusion that we can say here is that, of course, economic uh, variables, economic factors determine that people are not satisfied with how is uh, everything working. And it's, of course, one of the reasons why white people were taken to the streets in 2019. Um, giving it a little bit of interpretation, we can see that when people identify them themselves, as being part of a low social class, this increases this content, right? We see a positive sign in here. We can also see that being unemployed also increases this content, and as well as um, expecting that the economic situation will be worse in the future, which is, I think, very, um, ex we, we expected actually these results. Um, on the contrary, we can see that being employed, being part of or identifying as a higher social class can decrease this discontent. All right. Um, if we go to analyze a little bit of our institutional variables, we can also see some important um, stuff here that actually uh, confirms that statement saying that people is um, that people are uh, increasingly aware of this um, of this discontent with the social class and with and with their political representatives. Uh, what we see here is that trust in governments, um, of course, it's really important. But this says that if people would trust governments, this would decrease discontent. In the same line, the support for government, if people were, would support government or even trust media, this would also decrease um, this content with democracy. What will increase this content? Um, the belief that people have that the country is governed by only a few people, only in their own benefit, that increases this content as well as public safety. Okay. Um, also, the um, belief that corruption. I'm sorry to uh, disrupt you. It's just that your time is up. I thought you were working your way towards the end, so I give you a few extra seconds there. But um, okay. perhaps one okay. last sentence to close it, if you'd like. Okay. So corruption also increases this content, and um, 
also what we have here is that at the contextual level, um, inequality of transpa transparency of inequality, I'm sorry, also uh, increases this content. Okay. Right. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so if the ne next presenters would like to um, open up their slides, I will read out their names and also the title of their presentation. Um, so next talk will be given by uh, Yanesid Palacios Valencia from Universidad Lib in Colombia, uh, Leoni Leonidas Andres Palacios Valencia de la Corporación uh, Universitaria de Remington. And the title of their paper is Biodiversidad um, um, Amenazada por Fenómenos Extractivos. El caso del Choco en Pacífico Colombiano. And you will have... Sí, un momento mientras proyecto. Un segundo, por favor. Very good. We see your presentation now. Um, I'll start your time and then I'll let you know a minute before it's up. Thank you. Bueno, buenas eh, tardes, noches ya para, para Colombia. En este momento ya ha oscurecido un poco eh, por este lado. Eh, gracias por la presentación. Pues como pueden observar, eh, Genesis Palacios Valencia, quien les habla. Y Leonidas Andrés Palacios Valencia, eh, seremos las personas encargadas de desarrollar esta presentación que lleva por nombre Biodiversidad amenazada por fenómenos extractivos, el caso del Chocó en el Pacífico colombiano. Para hacer un poco honor a la presentación, como ustedes pueden ver en la introducción, hay algo eh, que de pronto puede resultar un poco incoherente y es el tema de la riqueza en el Pacífico en medio de la pobreza y el riesgo de su de su ecosistema o el riesgo parcial de destrucción de su ecosistema y esto por varias razones. Como ustedes muy bien pueden ver en la presentación, eh, el Pacífico en Colombia es realmente una región rica, rica en diversidad, en biodiversidad y no solamente en recursos naturales, y me refiero a la fauna, a la flora, sino que también eh, conserva una pluralidad, digámoslo en, en términos de culturalidad también, porque alberga, eh, y esto digamos por contenidos históricos, si se le puede llamar así desde la época de la conquista, pues en el Pacífico realmente se asentaron desde esta época eh, comunidades afrodescendientes y pueblos indígenas y tribales, digamos que hasta el día de hoy pues esto se conserva. Si bien es cierto que yo les estoy diciendo que el Pacífico es una región riquísima realmente en biodiversidad y en recursos naturales, pues a contrario censo, digamos en un contrasentido, eh, la región del Pacífico es una de las más pobres a nivel de país y el contraste al mismo tiempo eh, cobra sentido en que muchas multinacionales, en ocasiones el mismo Estado, y por la dinámica de país que muy posiblemente para muchos de ustedes es ajena, en el sentido que Colombia pues, ha tenido un conflicto armado de muy larga data, conflicto armado que ha involucrado actores armados como las guerrillas, los paramilitares, el mismo Estado y bandas emergentes hoy denominadas BACRIM, que desafortunadamente aprovechan también estos recursos naturales para usufructar, explotar, y es en este contexto donde se generan, digamos, procesos extractivos que exacerban, destruyen y en muchas circunstancias eh, permiten también el desplazamiento o posibilitan el desplazamiento forzado eh, de comunidades afrodescendientes de pueblos indígenas y tribales. ¿sí? Hay que decir también que el Pacífico y en general muy puntualmente el departamento de Chocó ubicado en esta, en esta región, eh, tiene una posición muy estratégica, digamos que es el único departamento que tiene, digamos, eh, ambos océanos, sí, digamos, tiene una, una posición geográfica eh, específica, en tanto es el único que tiene límites fronterizos con Panamá, que antiguamente pues también formó parte de Colombia, y digamos teniendo en cuenta que eh, una característica básica de, del Pacífico es su contexto ecológico de selvático, pues eso también ha posibilitado de que pues, grupos al margen de la ley se asienten y pues eh, estas particularidades generan, digámoslo así, un cierto con, contrasentido. Pero digamos también que en el Pacífico hay muchas otras características, por ejemplo, 
eh, podemos encontrar que el mar es un punto de referencia. Podríamos decir que hay una suerte de idiosincrasia. Los ríos son, digamos, lugar de encuentro, lugar de paso, lugar de salida. La cultura del Pacífico en sí misma, digamos, eh, la riosincrasia juega un papel vital. Y es por eso que precis precisamente pues, sus habitantes, sus comunidades, eh, se han visto afectados por diferentes fenómenos extractivos que puntualmente, para, que lo, para lo que vamos a explicar, eh, tienen que ver eh, con la minería y también tienen que ver con la deforestación. Digamos que estos fenómenos ayudan, arraigado también a nuestro conflicto armado, que pues ya es de muy larga data, eh, ayuda a que estas comunidades y los pueblos indígenas y tribales pues tengan una vulnerabilidad bastante marcada, bastante acentuada, y esto es una característica que puede diferenciar, digámoslo así, eh, o que se diferencia de otras, de otras regiones a nivel de país. Nuestra hipótesis central de, de trabajo para la ponencia, para que sea, digamos, más focalizado lo que queremos decir, ¿sí? es que hay que identificar unos aspectos sustanciales que permiten identificar en el Pacífico y muy puntualmente en el Chocó, ¿sí? una dicotomía que representa el conflicto y la resistencia, la biodiversidad y la degradación, la cultura y la extinción, por la consecución precisamente de prácticas extractivas, entre ellas la minería, como les mencionaba, que despojan y desplazan a comunidades centrales del seno de sus territorios, lo cual ha generado, digamos, de manera muy reivindicativa o contrahegemónica, estrategias organizativas que, por ejemplo, hoy en día se reflejan en lo que se conoce como consejos comunitarios, que son, digamos, unas prerrogativas básicas que han sido otorgadas muy puntualmente para las comunidades negras en el Pacífico, y en tanto fórmula de resistencia, digamos que son las eh, estrategias y, y de base a partir también de movimientos sociales que se han organizado para, para resistir al conflicto y al mismo tiempo para resistir al extractivismo que se va generando en la región del Pacífico. Eh, dicho esto, tendríamos que decir también que empieza a surgir una tendencia bastante importante y que ya no solo organizaciones internacionales, sino que muchos teóricos empiezan, digamos, a fundamentar. Y es el tema del racismo ambiental, ¿sí? Este racismo ambiental, entendiendo que se puede generar la muerte lenta y el despojo del territorio étnico ancestral, digamos que este capitalismo se expande, reproduciendo una serie de injusticias ambientales, y al producir y moverse mediante relaciones de severa desigualdad entre grupos humanos, pues termina afectando eh, de manera paradójica precisamente a grupos que han sido eh, tradicional e históricamente excluidos. También tenemos que decir que este racismo ambiental puede producir al mismo tiempo desplazamiento forzado de los grupos étnicos cuando son atropellados por injusticias evidentemente ambientales, junto con el desarrollo de políticas que de base validan este tipo de comportamiento. ¿Cuál sería entonces el origen del problema? En esta parte entonces se va a concentrar Leonidas para eh, profundizar un poco en este sentido. Muy buenas tardes, muchas gracias. Eh, históricamente Colombia eh, ha sido un país eh, tradicionalmente minero desde la colonia. Es de destacar que por la ubicación geográfica que mencionaba eh, Genesit, eh, Colombia y en especial el departamento del Chocó al cual haremos énfasis dentro del Pacífico colombiano eh, tiene una riqueza mineral dentro de toda su fauna y flora tiene una riqueza mineral muy apetecida en especial Colombia hablamos de Colombia en general tiene una riqueza mineral dentro de toda esa riqueza vamos a encontrar eh, la minería del oro dentro de esa minería del oro eh, Colombia eh, ha sido eh, un país muy atractivo para extraer todos esos minerales. Lastimosamente, esa, ese, ese atractivo o todo ese potencial minero que tiene el país no ha sido en beneficio de muchas, de muchas de las comunidades, en particular las comunidades del Pacífico, en especial el departamento del Chocó. En un principio se utilizó la maniobra indígena en las minas, en las minas pero por... Eh, la, la capacidad física de resistencia por la mismo, los mismos africanos que, que venían de África, eh, afrodescendientes que identificaron que tenían gran 
cual, grandes cualidades frente al trabajo duro y pesado, en este caso para la minería, lo utilizaron para ese trabajo de extractivismo. Desafortunadamente, aunque, Colombia es, aunque en Colombia es, es posible encontrar eh, una incipiente eh, política minera para la extracción de diferentes tipos de minerales, todo este tipo de potencial no ha sido aprovechado de manera sostenible. Por el contrario, la evidencia empírica demuestra que en algunos lugares se ha visto, deteriorado, se ha visto un deterioro social y ambiental con el desarrollo de la actividad minera. Así ha ocurrido en el Pacífico colombiano, puntualmente en el departamento del Chocó, el cual no solo ha sufrido extractivismo minero de forma exacerbada, sino también eh, forestal. En esta imagen podemos apreciar eh, al departamento del Chocó. Se identifica los, eh, la zona donde ha sido explotada la minería. Adicional, nos muestra eh, una imagen, uno de los afluentes de uno de los principales ríos que tiene el departamento, que es el río Atrato. El afluente que estamos viendo en la imagen es el río Quito. Ese afluente se, en el afluente se evidencia la contaminación producto de ese extractivismo y de esa minería. Y también se evidencia nuestra cultura, nuestra población de los diferentes municipios. Uh, Paul, thank you. thank you. Your time is up. Perhaps you have some final words to conclude. Yes, eh, acelero. Bueno, eh, eh, muy rápidamente, si quieres, Leo, yo te interrumpo para, para vale. llegar a las, a las conclusiones. Sí. Eh, las conclusiones eh, puntuales o, o más relevantes de, de nuestra presentación serían las siguientes. ¿sí? Estas reflexiones evidencian pues, el necesario estudio del impacto de la minería desde lo social, lo cultural, lo medioambiental, y no solo como proyección económica de la región pues este fenómeno debe ser estudiado con un enfoque técnico obligado, ¿sí? Aún el well, grado de um, los Thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt you. It's just that we are a bit over already the time. Um, but, but thank okay. you very much. And again, very okay. interesting okay. research. I'm, I'm very okay. sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I will read the next presenter's uh, names and title and uh, university affiliation. Um, so the next presentation will be given by uh, Viviania Butiron Cañadas, um, Carlos Realpe, Jacqueline Andrea Logroño Car Cardenas, um, and they are from the Frente Ecologico Natura Insurrecta de Ecuador. And the title of their presentation is Los Huertos Comunitarios como Espacios Políticos Populares en Tiempos de COVID-19 en Quito. Uh, thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this evening. We are part of Natura Insurrecta and Contra Pique. We would like to thank the organizing committee for this first of many congresses, I hope. Our contribution is a collective effort of many people, and it will show you the agricultural and political work we do in the peri-urban areas of Quito. I would like to continue speaking in Spanish as we presented our proposal in that language. Eh, queremos agradecer también a todas las personas que nos ayudaron a hacer este video, especialmente a las personas que van a aparecer en el, en el mismo como entrevistados, entrevistadas, a las personas del soporte técnico, eh, Andrea por la edición sobre todo, y un agradecimiento especial a Luisana Córdoba, quien se encargó de la parte de los subtítulos al inglés que van a ver en el video a continuación. Así que si nos ayudan proyectando el video, por favor. Claro, claro. ahorita lo proyectamos y bienvenida. Dame un segundo. I have it up and ready if you'd like. Oh, you have it too? Awesome, Danilo. Go for it. But actually, I didn't activate the audio, so I have to do it again. <laughs> Share audio, films. Sure. The, the one. And let's move for the screen and enjoy. Um, 
como se sabe, en la pandemia muchas personas tuvimos, en general la mayoría tuvimos que quedarnos en casa, recluidos y muchos trabajos se perdieron. En Ecuador es un país que vive de la venta ambulante, en general del subempleo, entonces muchas familias se quedaron sin su sustento. 2020 termina con más de 1.6 millones de muertos por COVID-19, según los datos de la Universidad Johns Hopkins. El impacto de la pandemia ha sido diferenciado, golpeando a unos países más que a otros por factores estructurales y de coyuntura que condicionaron la respuesta a la emergencia. Para finales del año anterior, Ecuador se ubicó en el segundo lugar de los países del mundo más afectados, en comparación con su tamaño de población, después de Perú, sí se consideran las muertes en exceso. No Tal vez para evitar esos problemas para... podemos, eh, puedo intentar yo eh, proyectar el video. Perhaps there was a problem with the needle's connection? Eh, sí, eh, tal vez puedo intentar yo desde mi computadora. Ricardo, ¿es um, posible? Sure, we, we have five minutes left. Uh, solo okay. tenemos cinco okay. minutos, it's, pero it's si okay. quieres empezar. Uh -huh. Sí, sí. aquí una semana más trabajando en la comuna de Soria Loma, eh, sobre todo porque, como se sabe, en la pandemia muchas personas tuvimos, en general la mayoría tuvimos que quedarnos en casa recluidos y muchos trabajos se perdieron. Eh, Ecuador es un país que vive de la venta ambulante, en general del subempleo, entonces muchas familias se quedaron sin su sustento. 2020 termina con más de 1.6 millones de muertos por COVID-19, según los datos de la Universidad Johns Hopkins. El impacto de la pandemia ha sido diferenciado, golpeando a unos países más que a otros por factores estructurales y de coyuntura que condicionaron la respuesta a la emergencia. Para finales del año anterior, Ecuador se ubicó en el segundo lugar de los países del mundo más afectados. En comparación con su tamaño de población, después de Perú, sí se consideran las muertes en exceso. No sabía para qué era, pero hoy preguntando me dijeron de que eso es para meter los cadáveres. Todo lo que hay en el hospital y creo que también están trayendo de otros lugares porque está copado, dice el hospital del Guasmo. En Ecuador, el desempleo a nivel nacional alcanzó el 13.3% de la población económicamente activa entre mayo y junio de 2020, comparado con un 3.8% a diciembre del año pasado, según el Instituto Ecuatoriano de Estadísticas y Censos. Quiero protestar porque cada vez eh, eh, molestan y siempre no nos dejan trabajar, porque la verdad es de que so todas somos personas que necesitamos. No que yo, por ejemplo, soy una mujer del pueblo, yo no quiero ser carga para el gobierno. 
el principal riesgo en el corto plazo es no poder garantizar el acceso a los alimentos de la población que en muchos casos ha perdido su principal fuente de ingresos. El nivel de consumo y la calidad de los alimentos para la población sufrirían efectos negativos en países con alto grado de desigualdad como el Ecuador. Hay como una organización popular que se gesta a través de la comida, que es una necesidad que el Estado no, no cubre, que hay un abandono por parte del Estado, hay una doble moral también por parte del Estado porque te dice que tienes que trabajar, que tienes que salir adelante por tu propio esfuerzo, pero en la práctica te quita la educación, te quita la salud, te criminaliza si trabajas. Nosotros somos Natura Insurrecta, somos un frente ecológico autogestionado, libre de partidos políticos, libre de ONGs. Eh, luchamos por la organización popular, la organización de los campesinos para la liberación en general de las tierras que son acaparadas por, por grupos económicos, por los terratenientes. En general, nuestro proceso es organizativo, político, con una fuerte consigna anticapitalista, antiimperialista, que dominan en nuestro país actualmente y que justamente son quienes mantienen estos estándares, mantienen el semiproletariado, mantienen eh, las relaciones semifeudales que se viven aquí. Los y las militantes de Natura Insurrecta, junto con la población local y otros voluntarios, juntamos nuestros conocimientos entre tradicionales y técnicos para poner a producir la tierra en los huertos. Somos estudiantes, obreros, artistas, investigadores, docentes que ponemos al servicio nuestros saberes y nuestras manos para el trabajo agrícola y político necesario en estos tiempos. Los huertos son una muestra de que la brecha entre el trabajo intelectual y el manual se puede acortar cuando hay objetivos comunes y planificados. Además, representan uno de los espacios más importantes en la transmisión y generación de conocimientos. El, pienso que el trabajo que hemos hecho aquí en Natura y con los compas desde hace unos 5 o 6 meses atrás en, en el Auki de Monjas, Gracias a la acogida de Bachita ha sido muy importante. Pienso que el hecho de compartir nuevos saberes, nuevos momentos con la tierra, adentrarnos un poquito más en la vida de, de la naturaleza para poder nosotros de eso generar frutos y compartir con otras personas ha sido fundamental. Individualmente. Eh, aquí con los jóvenes de Natura y con todos los jóvenes que aquí han venido, yo sí les digo jóvenes, muchas gracias, ustedes son muy valientes. Aquí han venido al campo a aprender la agricultura orgánica, a sembrar sin químicos, a hacer el estiércol, a hacer el homus. Han venido aquí a hacer los violes, hemos aprendido y más que todo a trabajar en la tierra. Los jóvenes que aquí vienen y gracias también han venido personas adultas, jóvenes, niños también. Hemos aprendido muchas um, cosas. Apologies for interrupting, but I think perhaps we should stop here just not the lady at the presentation. Las ollas comunitarias se han convertido en una iniciativa desde la solidaridad de clase que brinda ayuda a las poblaciones olvidadas por el Estado para acceder a la alimentación. Desde la organización popular y barrial, alrededor de las ollas populares, podemos acercarnos a las realidades de cientos de personas y accionar y contribuir a su vez a su transformación. La de los huertos nació a conjunto eh, a lo de las ollas populares. Primero para proveerlas de los um, productos que nosotros I apologize, but perhaps you can stop the presentation. Um, we've already gone over the time limit and we need to go on to the next one. Pasos de desatención y olvido estatal con soluciones alimenticias. En los países periféricos, especialmente entre la clase trabajadora, la agricultura urbana...
So while you close that up and the next presenters um, can start preparing their slides, I will read out their uh, names and the title of their presentation as well. Um, and just for uh, everybody who's watching, who would like myself like to watch the rest of the video, uh, a few of the links have been shared and you can access it um, through the links provided in the chat. So uh, the next talk will be given by Alem um, Cherinet uh, from the University of Calgary and the title is Violent Social Mechanisms and Mexico's General Law on Disappearance. Thank you. Thanks Ricardo. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Alam. Thanks for being here today. Uh, today I'd like to talk a little bit about the emergence of Mexico's general law on forced disappearance. Now this law is intended to help combat the current phenomenon of missing persons in Mexico. The general law was enacted in October of 2017. And this is the first comprehensive legal measure of its kind within a climate of rising insecurity and violence produced by the drug war. At the time of the law's passing, more than 35,000 people were considered officially disappeared, though it was suspected the true figure was at least double that even at the time. In the lead up to the law's passage, the Ayotzinapa case was frequently discussed in tandem with enacting this legislation. Many of you are going to remember this case as that of the 43 disappeared student teachers in September, 2014. Ayotzinapa was sensational. Um, it was a huge moment, not only for the fact that the students were abducted and the way that that occurred, but also because their remains were never found. And actors involved included political figures, uh, local police, military personnel, and even the Guerrero Unidos drug cartel. This case became emblematic of Mexico's phenomenon of forced disappearance and for the way that it exposed the state crime nexus so blatantly. Protests erupted throughout Mexico as well as abroad, uh, even with calls for Pinionito's resignation. And so the purpose of my project was to look at a, a causal relationship between Ayotzinapa and the law's passage. I wanted to know if there was one or at least what was the effect of the Ayotzinapa event. And so the argument that I make is that Ayotzinapa is really a proximate factor in the law's creation. And the ultimate factor is the unrelenting work of civil society and its allies. So what I thought I would do for you today is build out a bit of a timeline. And so we're gonna look at some key factors along the causal chain. And to start out, we're gonna look at what happened immediately in the wake of Ayotzinapa, because this is where we see a great deal of attention toward a general law and this is the part that is perhaps most visible. So to begin with, the GA, uh, a group of international experts was convened through an agreement between the Mexican government and the IACHR. And this group was responsible not only for assisting in uh, the investigation and for clarifying the facts, but also to work alongside other agencies and lend international weight uh, to this process. And so here we see pressures that are coming from above, and these are sustained throughout the creation of the law, and we're gonna see that they were taking place beforehand as well. Right on the heels of this, the GA was followed by Enrique Peña Nieto's very famous Decalogue for Peace. And so he called for the strengthening of institutions among a host of other security improvements, but very importantly, he promised the issuance of a general law and politically committed his regime to that kind of reform. Civil society though had already been applying pressure toward improved legal frameworks. The movement for our missing and disappeared partnered with policy leaders to include the demands of families in the drafting of this law. Now, MNDM is a massive commission of civil society collectives and family members who work to advance the rights of victims of disappearance. They also accompany cases and search efforts and they work to advance legal change. And while MNDM formally became known under that name on the heels of Ayotzinapa, it's actually the continuation um, and a revival of an important prior movement as we're gonna just see in a minute. So representatives from MNDM went on to work directly in the participatory process that built this law. With pressures from above and below, throughout 2015, proposals were put forward for the law's content. Now, Mexico's, Mexico's main political parties, excuse me, 
advanced drafts, and there were a total of five put forward for opinion. In the end, the two most comprehensive laws under consideration were those developed by Senator Angelica de la Peña and by the pre-executive, Andre Enrique Peña Nieto. MNDM was part of Senator de la Peña's team, along with uh, other international agencies and civil society representatives. Following that, we had a couple of years of debates until finally the law is enacted late 2017. But so what we see here is an acceleration toward legal remedy immediately following Ayotzinapa. And so this might make it appear that Ayotzinapa's impact represented a kind of direct causal link. However, if we abstract uh, for Ayotzinapa and look at what was happening beforehand, we're gonna see that the disappearance law is part of a much bigger process uh, with the trajectory toward general law already in place. One of the first major background factors in creating the disappearance law was a visit of the UN Working Group on Forced Disappearance. Now, this was in March of 2011. A delegation of experts was invited to analyze the problem of disappearance within the Mexican context, and they looked at two main periods. The first was the dirty war, and the second was the drug war. After meeting with a variety of stakeholders, they issued a report, and they called for 32 uh, recommendations in order to stem the tide of an epidemic. And the chief thing among those suggestions was that a general law be created in order to harmonize limitations within the federalist system. Here's the other movement that I was alluding to. So at the same time, uh, a major movement erupted in response to drug war violence. Javier Cecilia, who is a famed writer and poet, uh, his son was murdered in Morelos and he went on to found the movement for peace with justice and dignity. And so, MPJD became one of the earliest, strongest, and most visible collections of those affected by violence. It amassed a victim's lobby made up of thousands who demanded action from the Mexican government against widespread violence. And Cecilia's organization went on to win an audience with Felipe Calderón. Their demands became the foundation for the later general victim's law of 2013. That piece of legislation was focused on victims' rights to assistance, justice, due diligence, and reparations. And many of its principles would go on to be included in the general law. But that piece of legislation was actually possible thanks to constitutional amendments in 2011 that signaled a formal commitment to human rights frameworks. The HRA's opened Mexican courts to international standards to strengthen mandates for public institutions, and it made human rights constitutional guarantees. This was a legislative pivot toward greater laws that would be implemented in the years to come. And for the first time, Mexican courts had the power to apply international standards in cases where human rights violations were concerned. As part of that pivot, the anti-trafficking law came into effect in June 2012 in the face of immense social pressure again. Its passage marked the recognition of thousands of criminally trafficked persons, 85% of whom were suspected to be girls and women. So really the general law on human trafficking, which was adapted to suit domestic context, was the first in a parcel of three human rights laws. So that's the anti-trafficking, the uh, victim's law, and then the disappearance law. By February of 2014, Senator Angelica de la Peña had actually introduced the first bill to establish a federal law on forced disappearance. Now this initiative was put forward uh, following early consultation in civil society. It acknowledged the crime of disappearance and it reiterated recommendations from the working group, but it was a federal, sorry, federal proposal. So it wouldn't yet be any kind of general law. And what that meant is that it would only apply to crimes that were committed by state authorities and not private actors. So the problem here was that there wasn't yet enough political will for a broader and more comprehensive type of legislation. So it was a start. And among those who wanted a more homologous protocol, there was an understanding that a general law was gonna be the only way to achieve it. When Ayotzinapa happened just seven months later, it detonates a political crisis that the government had to answer to. And so what it does is create the force necessary for an expedited response. So it was no longer possible to deny the issue of forced disappearance or the types of victims that it produced. 
and the 43 came to represent tens of thousands more. So what we see here is that even before Ayotzinapa, uh, civil institutional processes were shaping a trajectory towards strengthened human rights frameworks. And what they were doing is conditioning the social and the legal space for the disappearance law to be developed. So it's likely that with even, sorry, without Ayotzinapa, legislation still would have been advanced, uh, especially because the anti-trafficking and victims reforms had already been passed. But on its own, in the absence of all of those precursory conditions, it's unlikely that Ayotzinapa could have resulted in any kind of general law. It still would have had a sensitizing effect for the profile of victims and for the political impact of the case. But without those processes already underway, there's no way that a legal remedy would have been possible, at any rate, not for years to come. So ultimately, civil society, policy leaders, and international partners have been at work in a more than decade-long process of advancing human rights and legal reform. So Ayotzinapa's influence is really a cognitive mechanism. It drew broad attention to the phenomenon, and it helped create an accelerated legal response. But the ultimate factor here is the longstanding commitment of civil society to advancing human rights and holding the state accountable for citizen security. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Alain. Merci. Um, so the next presentation will be given by Ricardo Vernet from the University of Calgary, and it's called uh, The Rise and Fall of De La Valla's Government. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me the, opp uh, the opportunity to share some, uh, some thoughts with you. Um, I opted, uh, I guess, to, to not uh, give you a, um, uh, some slides. I was going back and forth. I thought it would be, it would eat away at some of the time that I, that I have. I, I don't have a lot of time, but I have a lot, to, a, a lot of things that I wanted to share. Um, the... <sighs> Um, let me start by saying that uh, Haiti missed a, a crucial opportunity to um, to institutionalize uh, democracy in the in the in the 1990s, um, and uh, but to understand the the this process, we need to go back um, to the late 1970s. And if you recall, in the in the 1970s, the Carter administration. Uh, had be, uh, began to um, to put pressure on Latin American governments to uh, implement human rights uh, and to clean up uh, uh, their image in some way. Uh, and Duvalier uh, understood this, and he knew that he needed to um, to uh, at least uh, gain the support. Of, of the Americans in order for him to survive. So what he did is began a process of liberalization uh, in the 19, late 1970s uh, and you know, loosen up uh, the, the regime, uh, release uh, political prisoners and providing some basic, uh, basic freedoms to, uh, to people. But uh, you know, not surprisingly, this this process of liberalization uh, led uh, or created a nascent op uh, opposition in Haiti, which had not been which had had been suppressed by the Duvaliers since the 1950s. Uh, and as a result, you start seeing some uh, opposition against uh, the Duvalier regime. And, uh, and uh, the opposition really didn't take off, uh, serious uh, opposition really di didn't uh, um, begin, begin to put pressure on Zivali until the mid 1980s. Um, and so um, uh, we had 1985, for example, there was massive protests against Zivali in Northern Haiti. And you start seeing uh, the regime again, uh, resorted into repression again. Uh, and start cracking down on on the mass uh, on the mass uh, opposition, and um, the we but we also start seeing some problems. Uh, you know, we we also start seeing that you know you know that opposition really didn't, in some way, institutionalize or structure 
uh, um, uh, itself in order to take power after Diwali. They were simply concerned, uh, the opposition was simply concerned with uh, getting rid of Diwali, but not preparing itself to take power after Diwali. And uh, Diwali, uh, you know, um, was uh, overthrown eventually uh, in, 1980, in February 1986. He was overthrown and went to exile in Southern France. Um, as I said, the opposition was weak. It wasn't really able to, uh, to take control. So Duvalier uh, was allowed to pick uh, some close associates from the army to take charge when he left. Uh, the problem is the army, you know, in some way was, was not necessarily inclined to, to, to implement uh, you know, the, the movement's demands. And what, what it did essentially is frustrated, uh, the, the army frustrated the process of democratization and uh, uh, repressed the population. Um, and uh, you start seeing the authoritarian reflex of the army the moment Zvalier left. Uh, they, uh, they repressed and killed several people. They, uh, they uh, went back on their promises to implement uh, democratic reforms. The brutality of the army uh, led to the remobilization of, the, of, of a mass movement, uh, again, this time to overthrow the military regime. Um, and so this time, what was different was that this broad uh, opposition movement was aided by uh, what we call a movement that came to be known as Lavalas. Uh, Lavalas was a movement that was led by a Tile Eglise, uh, we call it Tile Eglise. Tile Eglise essentially is a cre creole word that is, that is meant little church. Uh, Tile Eglise uh, populist priest called Jean Bertrand Aristide. Uh, and Aristide in the 19, mid 1980s um, uh, emerged as, as this powerful leader uh, who had been criticizing Duvalier, who had survived several assassination attempts by the military regime. And he had become this popular leader and he uh, um, and, and pushed and pushed against the Israeli regime uh, with pressure uh, from Washington and from the, this broad uh, democratic movement. Uh, the army uh, ended up ceding power to a, um, a uh, provisional government to who was mandated who was mandated to organize elections after after uh, the, uh, the um, uh, army uh, gave up power. Again, we saw right then, we start seeing the contradictions of this democratic movement. Uh, again, it was in some way, the opposition movement was too weak to take power. Uh, it ended up uh, choosing a Supreme Court justice to uh, come in and to be uh, president uh, until election can be organized. Uh, it wasn't strong. It wasn't. It wasn't strong enough. Wasn't organized enough to take power. So you know, it had. It had to make a deal uh, with the uh, Supreme Court justice in order to to do this. Um, but then again, uh, there was all kinds of confusion, and 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 the Supreme. It turns out that the Supreme Court justice. Uh, you know, ended up frustrating the process, but eventually with pressure from the United States, uh, elections was, were, uh, were organized in December of 1990. And Aristide, uh, who had joined the, the uh, a coalition of leftist political parties, uh, ended up winning an overwhelming uh, 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 victory uh, uh, during that election. Unfortunately, though, for Aristide, uh, he was overthrown uh, just barely seven months after uh, he had uh, taken power. Now, uh, why might you know why was this the case? Um, the, the one of the uh, the things that Aristide one of one of the the uh, um, um, uh, problem uh, that Aristide uh, that that emerged with Aristide once he takes power was. Uh, he, rather than working with, with, uh, with the opposition that was uh, the democratic opposition that he faced during the election, he antagonized them. 
Uh, he sidelined uh, even the coalition that, uh, that supported him. He threatened the bourgeoisie. Uh, he um, uh, sought to eliminate most of his opponents in order to impose his agenda. And so uh, this, um, um, uh, even the leftist coalition that he joined when he uh, ran for the presidency, uh, he, he had uh, criticized them and he had uh, 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 in some way sidelined side them from, from, his, uh, from his government. Uh, for example, he was, uh, when he joined the coalition, he was um, uh, the, the consent, the um, agreement for him to run for the, that coalition was that he was supposed to nominate a member of uh, the other parties that he joined to run as his prime minister. Uh, but once he took power, instead of choosing a member of that coalition, he chose one of his, uh, uh, of his, uh, of his supporters from the Lavalas movement to, uh, to be his uh, prime minister. And so uh, when he came into power, he had uh, virtually no uh, support, uh, um, especially in the, in, the, in, the, in the powerful Haitian legislature. He had no support uh, in, in the middle class or the bourgeoisie uh, or the uh, democratic opposition within the, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the country. Uh, he had no support in the army either because he retired virtually the entire military high command. Now, the question I ask is, is why was this uh, democratically elected government overthrown so violently after, uh, after this, uh, this transition? And why did this transition fail to materialize into a democracy? Why has Haiti failed to institutionalize uh, uh, democracy after the fall of the Duvalier regime? So that's uh, the fundamental question that, that I wrestled with uh, when, I, when I did this. Uh, the first thing I think you need to look at is the, the fact that the preconditions for uh, democracy simply didn't exist in Haiti. Uh, first of all, the um, Lavalas movement that Aristide belonged to had failed to institutionalize a mass party uh, to uh, um, pursue or to channel the interests of the mass movement within the, uh, within, uh, the country, uh, to channel the interest of the left within the country. But more importantly, that lack of institutionalization also uh, failed to create certain constraints on the behavior of Aristide. Aristide didn't see himself as, a, as, as, as belonging to any party. He saw himself as representative of a mass movement um, that had no political representation in the legislature whatsoever. Uh, and that had very little constraints on the behavior of Aristide. So Aristide in some way was untethered. He did what he was free in some way to impose his will um, uh, of uh, on on the opposition as he as he chose. Uh, so that movement was the other element. I think you need to look at when you discuss this is the fact that you know. Um, I'm sorry, Ricardo. Your time is up. I don't mean to interrupt oh. you. It's just that I thought you were concluding. Uh, perhaps oh. we can continue in the. Oh, I in in discussion. Okay. Sure. Sure. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't realize I, I ran over uh, the 10 minutes already. Um, great, so this would be the Q&A section. I have selected a few questions here. Um, okay, so um, just to start us off, uh, myself, Danilo and Anna will all say just a few brief words to close out. Um, we're again, we're extremely grateful for this opportunity to and be affiliates of the Rethinking Latin American Studies Working Group with the Calgary Institute for the Humanities. Um, this was our first year um, being established as our last. And so the fact that we had over 185 registrants and 26 presentations from across Latin America and in um, Canada and Europe as well presenting today is a, a feat of accomplishment. And we definitely consider this event a success because of all of your participation. Um, and thank you to all of the presenters, the keynote address, Elder Goodstriker, as well as Dr. Noreen Humble for uh, leading us in a good way with uh, opening prayer and remarks. 
Um, thank you to Danilo and Anna for all of your participation and help since September uh, organizing this event. And I will be sending a follow-up thank you email um, to everybody right now that will include an anonymous feedback survey link uh, for SurveyMonkey so that we can continue improving uh, our, our last symposium for the following year uh, from your input. Uh, in that email, I'll also include uh, relevant links from the symposium that I've included today, such as the program, the abstract booklet, um, links to the CIH and RLAS, as well as both videos that we watched today. And uh, the Zoom recording will be made available on the CIH YouTube channel within the next week or two. And uh, remember that the, the graphic rendition of the keynote address by Maria del Carmen will also be made available on our website. And so I'm going to hand the mic over to Anna and you should have received the email now. Anna, are you muted? Oh, ahora sí me escuchan, perdón, gracias. Les estaba comentando que como parte de este evento no tenemos fiesta, pero de todas maneras queríamos celebrar y compartir el esfuerzo de todos los ponentes y por eso hemos podido adoptar 26 árboles, uno por cada ponencia, en una en un área de conservación privada que es manejada por comunidades locales que no reciben apoyo del Estado y que están tratando de hacer caminos diferentes de desarrollo que no sean extractivos o ilegales en sus territorios en Perú. Entonces, hemos, vamos a enviarles a cada presentador, por cada ponencia, un certificado como este, en donde van a poder ver la foto del árbol que representa su ponencia y las coordenadas geográficas, porque además, bueno, Danilo y yo somos geógrafos, y si algún día viajan a Perú y sobrepasamos el COVID, pues poder, podrán ir y abrazar su propio árbol y recordar este evento con mucho cariño como nosotros también lo tenemos en nuestro corazón y lo estamos compartiendo con las comunidades locales en Perú. Pues muchísimas gracias. Sí. <risa> bueno, voy a dar unas pequeñas palabras. Primero quiero empezar agradeciendo a Gabriela, Ben y a Pablo por haber creado este espacio que es Arlas y obviamente de ahí nace este espacio donde que hemos eh, compartido hoy día. De ahí también quiero decir que ha sido maravilloso compartir este, este espacio, estas conversaciones con grandes amigos. Ha estado Verónica, Chelsea, Ana, vino Carlita, Ricardo, eh, Viviana también estuvo aquí, entonces fue espectacular, perdón si me olvido algún nombre por ahí. Y eso ha sido maravilloso, ha sido tal vez una forma también de visitar muchos lugares que ahora no podemos ir eh, y, tampoco, y también ver las realidades. Me encantaría ir a Brasil, me encantaría ir a, a Perú, a todos los lugares que hemos visitado de cierta manera y también tratar de contribuir de alguna manera. Hemos también tocado en muchos problemas, pero también eh, han habido ponencias que muestran que hay esperanza, ¿no? Y eso es lo que tenemos que mantener en estos, en estos meses tan complicados. También quiero agradecer a los asistentes por su participación tan activa. Muchas preguntas de Denise, por ejemplo, Sara también con, dándonos muchos, mucho saber, también conocimiento. Entonces ha sido en realidad espectacular. Les agradecemos un montón y, y gracias. Estamos en contacto. Eh, un gran abrazo desde Quito. Muchas gracias. Un gran abrazo. Bueno, desde... sí, me... Si me permiten, si me permiten, me gustaría también eh, agradecerles a ustedes, eh, a Danilo, Ana y Chelsea, por el brillante trabajo que ustedes han hecho en organizar esto. Yo creo que se merecen un tremendo aplauso y reconocimiento de todos nosotros. Ha sido eh, un, un grato gusto y honor el, el, el trabajar eh, eh, con ustedes, bueno, realmente ustedes han hecho todo el trabajo en, en este caso y yo creo que debiéramos eh, por lo menos considerar eh, cambiarle el nombre al grupo a Rethinking Latin American Studies eh, a través de 
estudiantes graduados brillantes, ¿sí? que ha sido un excelente ejemplo eh, de esto. Así que, no, bravo, muchísimas gracias, ha sido un excelente evento. Muchas gracias, Pablo. Muchas gracias, y los que quieran quedarse todavía tenemos un... Bueno, no tenemos fiesta ni piñata, pero tenemos todavía una, sí. unos momentos más. Okay, I'm going to officially stop the recording now.